Book One, Chapter One of The Bridal Wreath. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Carol Pelster. The Bridal Wreath by Sigrid Unset. Translated by Charles Archer and J. Scott. Book One, Jorengard. Chapter One. When the lands and goods of Ivar Yesling the Younger, of Sunbu, were divided after his death in 1306, his lands in seal of Gudbrandsdal fell to his daughter Ronfried and her husband Lavrens Bjorgelsen. Up to then they had lived on Lavrens Manor of Skog at Folo, near Oslo, but now they moved up to Jorengard, at the top of the open lands of seal lavrens was of the stock that was known in this country as the logmansons it had come here from sweden with that laurentius logmand of east gotland who took the belbo jorl's sister the lady benta out of vreta convent and carried her off to norway sir laurentius lived at the court of king horkon the old and won great favour with the king who gave him the skulk manor but when he had been in the country about eight years he died in his bed and his widow who belonged to the folkunga kindred and had the name of a king's daughter among the norwegians went home and made matters up with her relations afterwards she made a rich marriage in another land she and sir laurentius had no children so the heritage of skulk fell to laurentius brother Schettel he was father's father to lavrens bjorgelsen lavrens was married very young he was three years younger than his wife and was only twenty-eight when he came to seal as a youth he had been in the king's bodyguard and had enjoyed a good upbringing but after his marriage he lived a quiet life on his estate for ronfrey was something strange and heavy of mood and seemed not at home among the people of the south after she had had the ill hap to lose three little sons one after the other in the cradle she grew yet more shy of people thus it was in part to bring his wife nearer to her kinsfolk and old acquaintance that lavrens moved to goodbrunstallen when they came there they brought with them the one child that was left a little maid called Kristen but when they had settled at jorngar they lived for the most part just as quietly there keeping very much to themselves it seemed as though ronfried did not care much for her kindred for she saw them no oftener than seemly use and wont required this was in part because lavrens and ronfried were more than commonly pious and god-fearing folk diligent in church-going and always pleased to give harbour to god's servants to messengers sent on the church errands or to pilgrims on their way up the valley to nideros and showed the greatest honour to their parish priest who was also their nearest neighbour living at ramengard other folk in the valley were rather given to think that the church cost them quite dear enough in tithes and in goods and money and that there was no need to fast and pray so hard besides or to bring priests and monks into their houses unless at times when they were really needed otherwise the urengor folk were much looked up to and well liked too most of all lavrens for he was known as a strong man and a bold but peace-loving quiet and upright plain in his living but courteous and seemly in his ways a rarely good husbandman and a mighty hunter twas wolves and bears and all kinds of harmful beasts he hunted most keenly in a few years he had gotten much land into his hands but he was a good and helpful landlord to his tenants folk saw so little of ronfried that they soon gave up talking much about her in the first time after she came back to the valley many people had wondered for they remembered her as she had been at her home at sunbu in her youth beautiful she had never been but she had looked kind and happy 
now she had fallen off so that you might well believe she was ten years older than her husband and not only three most folk deemed she took the loss of her children harder than was reason for but for this she was better off in every way than most wives she lived in great plenty and in high esteem and things were well between her and her husband so far as people could see laverns did not go after other women he took counsel with her in all affairs and sober or drunk he never said a harsh word to her besides she was not so old but she might yet bear many children if it were god's pleasure it was somewhat hard for them to get young folks to take service at urengard the mistress being thus heavy of mood and all the fasts so strictly kept otherwise it was a good house to serve in hard words and punishments were little in use and both lavrens and ronfrid took the lead in all the work the master indeed was glad of mood in his own way and would join in a dance or lead the singing when the young folk held their games on the church green on vigil nights but still it was mostly older folks who came and took service at urengard these liked the place well and stayed there long when the child christen was seven years old it so fell out one time that she got leave to go with her father up to their mountain cedar it was a fine morning a little way on in the summer christen was in the loft room where they were sleeping now summer had come she saw the sun shining outside and heard her father and his men talking in the courtyard below and she was so joyful that she could not stand still while her mother put on her clothes but hopped and jumped about as each piece of clothing was put on her she had never been up in the mountains before only across the pass to vorga when she was taken to visit her mother's kinfolk at sunbu and sometimes to the woods near by the manor with her mother and the housefolk when they went out to pluck berries for ronfried to mix with the small beer or to make into sour paste of cranberries and cowberries that she ate on her bread in lent instead of butter the mother twisted up christen's long yellow hair and tied it into her old blue cap then kissed her daughter on the cheek and christen sprang away and down to her father laverns was in the saddle already he lifted her up behind him and seated her on his cloak which he had folded up and placed on the horse's loins for a pillion christen had to sit there astride and hold on to his belt they called out good-bye to ronfried but she came running down from the balcony with christen's hooded cape she handed it to laverns and bade him look well to the child the sun shone but it had rained much in the night so that everywhere the becks came rushing and singing down the grassy slopes and wreaths of mist clung and drifted under the mountain sides but over the hill crest white fair weather clouds were swelling up in the blue air and laverns and his men said among themselves that it was like to be hot as the day went on laverns had four men with him and they were all well armed for at this time there were many kinds of outlandish people lying up among the mountains though a strong party like this going but a short way in was not like to see or hear aught of such folk christen was fond of all the men three of them were men past youth but the fourth orna gertsen from finsbrecken was a half-grown boy and he was christen's best friend he rode next after lavrens and her for it was he that was to tell her about all they saw on their road they passed between the romantgard houses and changed greetings with eirik priest he was standing outside chiding with his daughter she kept house for him about a web of new dyed cloth that she had hung out and forgotten the day before it was all spoiled now with the night's rain on the hill behind the parsonage lay the church it was not large but fair and pleasant well kept and newly tarred by the cross outside the churchyard gate laverns and his men took off their hats and bowed their heads then the father turned in the saddle and he and christen 
waved to Ranfried, whom they could see down below at home, standing out on the sward by the houses. She waved back to them with the full of her linen headdress. Up here on the church green, and in the churchyard, Kristen was used to come and play nearly every day but today, when she was setting out to go so far. The sight she knew so well, home and all the parish round it, seemed new and strange to the child. The clusters of houses at Jorengard looked, as it were, smaller and grayer, lying down there on the flats, courtyard and farmyard. The river wound shining on its way, the valley spread far with broad green meadows and marshes in its bottom, and farms with plowland and pasture stretched up the hillsides under the gray and headlong mountain walls. Far below, where the mountains came together and closed the valley, Kristen knew that Lopsgard lay. There lived Sigurd and Johan, two old men with white beards, they were always for playing and making merry with her when they came to Jorngard. She was fond of Jon, for he would carve out the fairest beasts in wood for her, and once she had had a gold finger ring of him. Nay, the last time he came to them at Whitsuntide, he had brought her a knight, so sweetly carved and colored so fairly, that Kristen thought she had never had so fine a gift." She must needs take the knight to bed with her every single night. But when she woke in the morning, he was always standing on the step in front of the bed she lay in with her father and mother. Her father said the knight jumped up at the first cock crow. But Kristen knew well enough that, after she had fallen asleep, her mother took him away, for she heard her say that he was so hard and hurt so if he got underneath them in the night. Sigurd of Lopsgard, Kristen was afraid of, and she did not like him to take her on his knees, for he used to say that when she grew up he meant to sleep in her arms. He had outlived two wives, and he said himself he was sure to outlive the third, and then Kristen could be the fourth. But when she began to cry at this, Lavrens laughed and said, he had no fear that Morgit would give up the ghost so speedily. But if the worst came to pass, and Sigurd should come a-wooing, let Kristen have no fear. He should have no for his answer. A bow-shot or so north of the church, there lay by the roadside a great block of stone, and around it a thick small grove of birch and aspen. Here the children were wont to play at church, and Thomas, the youngest son of Eirik Priest's daughter, stood up in the person of his grandfather and said mass, sprinkled holy water and even baptized, when there was rainwater in the hollows of the rock. But once, the autumn before, this game had fallen out but sadly for them, for first Thomas had married Kristen and Arne. Arne was not so old, but he would go off and play with the children when he saw a chance. Then Arne caught a baby pig that was going by, and they brought it into church to be baptized. Tomas anointed it with mud, dipped it into a pool of water, and copying his grandfather, said mass in Latin, and chid them for the smallness of their offerings. And at this the children laughed, for they had heard their elders talk of Eirik's exceeding greed of money. But the more they laughed, the worse Thomas got in the things he hit on, for next he said that this child had been gotten in Lent, and they must pay penalty for their sin to the priest and the church. The great boys shouted with laughter at this, but Kristen was so ashamed that she was all but weeping as she stood there with the little pig in her arms. And just as this was going on, who must chance to come that way, but Eirik himself, riding home from a sick visit. When he understood what the young folks were about, he sprang from his horse and handed the holy vessels to Bentain, his eldest grandson, who was with him, so suddenly that Bentain nearly dropped a silver dove with God's body in it on the hillside, while the priest rushed in among the children, belaboring all he could reach. Kristen let slip the little pig, and it rushed shrieking down the road with the christening robe trailing after it, while Eirik's horses reared and plunged with terror. 
the priest pushed her too so that she fell down and he knocked against her with his foot so hard that she felt the pain in her hip for many days after lavrens had thought when he heard this that iric had been too hard with Kristen, seeing she was but a little child he said he would speak to the priest of it but ranfried begged him not to do so for the child had gotten but what she deserved for joining in such a blasphemous game so lavrens said no more of the matter but he gave arna the worst beating the boy had ever had so now as they rode by the stone arna plucked Kristen by the sleeve he dared not say aught for fear of lavrens but he made a face then smiled and clapped his hand to his back but Kristen bowed her head shamefacedly their way led on into thick woods they rode along under hammer hill the valley grew narrow and dark here and the roar of the river sounded louder and more harsh when they caught a glimpse of the lorgan it ran ice green and white with foam between walls of rock the mountains on either side of the valley were black with forest it was dark and narrow and ugly in the gorge and there came cold gusts of wind they rode across the rostar stream by the log bridge and soon could see the bridge over the great river down the valley a little below the bridge was a pool where a kelpie lived arna began to tell Kristen about it but lavrin sternly told the boy to hold his peace in the woods about such things and when they came to the bridge he leaped off his horse and led it across by the bridle while he held the child round the waist with his other arm on the other side of the river was a bridle path leading steeply up the hillside so the men got off their horses and went on foot but her father lifted Kristen forward into the saddle so that she could hold on to the saddle bow and let her ride goldsvein and all alone now grey stone peaks and blue domes flecked with snow rose above the mountain ridges as they climbed higher up and now Kristen saw through the trees glimpses of the parish north of the gorge and orna pointed and told her the names of the farms that they could make out down there high up the mountainside they came to a little croft they stopped by the stick fence Lavrens shouted, and his voice came back again and again from the mountains round. Two men came running down between the small tilled patches. These were both sons of the house. They were good men at the tar burning, and Lavrens was for hiring them to burn some tar for him. Their mother came after them with a great bowl of cooled milk, for the day was now grown hot, as the men had foretold. I saw you had your daughter with you she said when she had greeted them and methought i must needs have a sight of her but you must take the cap from her head they say she hath such bonny hair lavrens did as the woman asked him and Kristen's hair fell over her shoulders and hung down right to the saddle it was thick and yellow like ripe wheat the woman isrid took some of it in her hand and said hi now i see the word that has gone about concerning this little maid of yours was no wise too great a lily rose she is and looks as should the child of a knightly man mild eyes hath she too she favours you and not the yeslings god grant you joy of her lavrens bjorgelson and your riding on guldsvinen as stiff and straight as a courtier she said laughingly as she held the bowl for Kristen to drink the child grew red with pleasure for she knew well that her father was held to be the comeliest man far around he looked like a knight standing there among his men though his dress was much of the farmer fashion such as he wore at home for daily use he wore a coat of green dyed wadmal somewhat wide and short open at the throat so that the shirt showed beneath for the rest his hose and shoes were of undyed leather and on his head he had a broad-brimmed woolen hat of the ancient fashion for ornaments he had only a smooth silver buckle to his belt and a little silver brooch in his shirt-band 
but some links of a golden neck chain showed against his neck lavrens always wore this chain and on it there hung a golden cross set with great rock crystals it was made to open and inside there were shreds of the hair and the shroud of the holy lady ellen of shovda for the logmansons counted their descent from one of that blessed lady's daughters but when lavrens was in the woods or out at his work he was used to thrust the cross in next his bare breast so that he might not lose it yet did he look in his coarse homely clothing more high-born than many a knight of the king's household in his finest banqueting attire he was stalwart of growth tall broad-shouldered and small-waisted his head was small and sat fairly on his neck and he had comely features somewhat long cheeks of a seemly fullness chin fairly rounded and mouth well shaped his skin was light and his face fresh of hue he had gray eyes and thick smooth silky yellow hair he stood there and talked with isrid of her affairs and asked about tordis too a kinswoman of isrid's that was tending the urengard satyr this summer tordis had just had a child isrid was only waiting for the chance of a safe escort through the woods before taking the boy down to have him christened lavrin said that she had best come with them up to the cedar he was coming down again the next evening and twould be safer and better for her to have many men to go along with her and the heathen child isrid thanked him to say truth twas even this i was waiting for we know well we poor folk under the uplands here that you will ever do us a kind turn if you can when you come hither she ran up to the hut to fetch a bundle and a cloak it was indeed so that lavrens liked well to come among these small folk who lived on clearings and lease holdings high up on the outskirts of the parish amongst them he was always glad and merry he talked with them of the ways of the forest beasts and the reindeer of the upland wastes and of all the uncanny things that are stirring in such places and he stood by them and helped them with word and deed saw to their sick cattle helped them with their errands to the smith or to the carpenter nay would sometimes take hold himself and bend his great strength to the work when the worst stones or roots were to be broken out of the earth therefore were these people ever glad to greet lavrens bjorgolfsen and goldsvinen the great red stallion that he rode upon twas a comely beast with a shining skin white mane and tail and light eyes strong and fiery so that his fame was spread through all the country round but with his master he was gentle as a lamb and lavrens used to say that the horse was dear to him as a younger brother lavrens first errand was to see to the beacon of heimhaugen for in the hard and troubled times a hundred years or more gone by the yeomen of the dales had built beacons here and there high up on the fells above them like the sea marks in the roadsteads upon the coast but these beacons in the uplands were not in the ward of the king's levies but were cared for by the yeomen guilds and the guild brothers took turns at their tending when they were come to the first setter lavrens took out all but the pack-horse to graze there and now they took a steep footpath upwards before long the trees grew thin and scattered great firs stood dead and white as bones upon the marshy grounds and now christen saw bare grey stone peaks rising to the sky on all hands they climbed long stretches amid loose stones and at times the becks ran in the track so that her father must carry her the wind blew strong and fresh up here and the ground was black with berries amidst the heather but lavrin said they could not stop now to gather them orna sprang now in front and now behind plucked berries for her and told her whose the setters were that they saw below them in the forest for there was forest over the whole of Hörvringsvangen in those days and now they were close below the highest round bare top and saw the great pile of timber against the sky with the watch-house under the lee of a crag 
as they came up over the brow the wind rushed against them and buffeted their clothing it seemed to christen as though something living that dwelt up here met and greeted them it blew gustily around her and arna as they went forward over the mosses till they set them down far out on a jutting point and christen gazed with great eyes never before had she dreamed that the world was so big and wide forest shagged ranges lay below her on all sides the valley was but a cleft betwixt the huge fells and the side glens still lesser clefts there were many such yet there was little of dale and much of fell all around gray peaks flaming with golden lichen rose above the sea of forest and far off on the very brink of heaven stood blue crests flashing here and there with snow and melting before their eyes into the gray blue and pure white summer clouds but northeastwards nearer by just beyond the cedar woods lay a cluster of mighty slate-colored domes with streaks of new-fallen snow down their slopes these christen guessed to be the boar fells she had heard tell of for they were indeed like naught but a herd of heavy boar wending inland that had just turned their backs upon the parish yet arne told her twas a half day's ride to get even so far christen had ever thought that could she but win over the top of the home fells she would look down upon another parish like their own with tilled farms and dwellings and twas great wonder to her now to see how far it was betwixt the places where folks dwelt she saw the small yellow and green flecks down below in the dale bottom and the tiny clearings with their gray dots of houses amid the hill forests she began to take tale of them but when she had reckoned three times twelve she could keep count of them no longer yet the human dwelling places were as nothing in that waste she knew that in the wild woods wolves and bears lorded it and that under every stone there dwelt trolls and goblins and elfin folk and she was afraid for no one knew the number of them but there must be many times more of them than of christian men and women then she called aloud on her father but he could not hear for the blowing of the wind he and his men were busy rolling heavy stones up the bare mountain top to pile round the timbers of the beacon End of chapter one part one Chapter One, Part Two of *The Bridal Wreath* by Sigrid Unset. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter One, Part Two. But Isrid came to the children and showed Kristen where the fell west of Varga lay, and Orna pointed out the gray fell where folk from the parish took reindeer in pits, and where the king's falcon catchers lay in stone huts that was a trade arna thought to take some day but if he did he would learn as well to train the birds for the chase and he held his arms aloft as though to cast a hawk isrid shook her head tis a hard and evil life that arna gerdsen twould be a heavy sorrow for your mother boy should you ever come to be a falcon catcher none may earn his bread in those wild hills except he join in fellowship with the worst of men ay and with them that are worse still lavrens had come toward them and heard this last word ay says he there's more than one hide of land in there that pays neither tax nor tithe yes many a thing you must have seen said isrid coaxingly you who fare so far afield ay ay said lavrens slowly maybe but methinks tis well not to speak of such things overmuch one should not i say grudge folks who have lost their peace in the parish whatever peace they can find among the fells yet 
have i seen yellow fields and brave meadows where few folk know that such things be and herds have i seen of cattle and small stock but of these i know not whether they belonged to mankind or to other folk oh ay says isrid bears and wolves get the blame for the beasts that are missed from the satyrs here but there are worse thieves among the fells than they do you call them worse asked lavrens thoughtfully stroking his daughter's cap in the hills to the south under the boar fells i once saw three little lads and the greatest was even as christen here yellow hair they had and coats of skin they gnashed their teeth at me like wolf cubs before they ran to hide twere little wonder if the poor man who owned them were fain to lift a cow or two oh both wolves and bears have young says isrid testily and you spare not them lavrens neither them nor their young yet they have no lore of law nor of christendom as have these evil doers you wish so well to think you i wish them too well because i wish them a little better than the worst said lavrens smiling a little but come now let us see what cheer ranfried has sent with us to-day he took Kristen by the hand and led her with him, and as they went he bent and said softly, I thought of your three small brothers, little Kristen. They peeped into the watch-house, but it was close in there and smelt of mould. Kristen took a look around, but there were only some earthen benches about the walls, a hearthstone in the middle of the floor, and some barrels of tar and faggots of pine roots and birch bark lavrens thought twould be best they should eat without doors and a little way down among the birches they found a fine piece of greensward the pack-horse was unloaded and they stretched themselves upon the grass in the wallets ranfried had given them was plenty food of the best soft bread and bannocks butter and cheese pork and wind-dried reindeer meat lard boiled brisket of beef two kegs with german beer and of mead a little jar the carving of the meat and portioning it round went quickly while halfdan the oldest of the men struck fire and made a blaze it was safer to have a good fire out here in the woods isrid and orna gathered heather and dwarf birch and cast it on the blaze it crackled as the fire tore the fresh green from the twigs and small white flakes flew high upon the wisps of red flame the smoke whirled thick and black toward the clear sky kristen sat and watched it seemed to her the fire was glad that it was out there and free and could play and frisk twas otherwise than when at home it sat upon the hearth and must work at cooking food and giving light to the folks in the room she sat nestled by her father with one arm upon his knee he gave her all she would have of the best and bade her drink her fill of the beer and taste well of the mead she will be so tipsy she'll never get down to the setter on her feet said halfdan laughing but lavrens stroked her round cheeks then here are folk enough who can bear her it will do her good drink you too arna god's gifts do good not harm to you that are yet growing make sweet red blood and give deep sleep and rouse not madness and folly the men too drank often and deep neither was isrid backward and soon their voices and the roar and crackle of the fire were but a far-off hubbub in kristen's ears and she began to grow heavy of head she was still aware how they questioned lavrans and would have him tell of the strange things he had met with when out a-hunting but much he would not say and this seemed to her so good and so safe and then she had eaten so well her father had a slice of soft barley bread in his hands he pinched small bits of it between his fingers into the shapes of horses and cutting shreds of meat he set these astride the steeds and made them ride over his thigh and into kristen's mouth 
but soon she was so weary she could neither open her mouth nor chew and so she sank back upon the ground and slept when she came to herself again she was lying in a warm darkness within her father's arm he had wrapped his cloak about them both Kristen sat up wiped the moisture from her face and unloosed her cap that the air might dry her damp locks the day was surely far spent for the sunlight was golden and the shadows had lengthened and fell now toward the southeast no breath of wind was stirring and gnats and flies buzzed and swarmed about the group of sleeping men Kristen sat stock still scratched her gnat-bitten hands and gazed about her the mountain top above them shone white with moss and golden with lichen in the sunshine and the pile of weather-beaten timber stood against the sky like the skeleton of some wondrous beast she grew ill at ease it was so strange to see them all sleeping there in the naked daylight at home if by hap she woke at night she lay snug in the dark with her mother on the one side and on the other the tapestry stretched upon the wall and then she knew that the chamber with its smoke vent was shut and barred against the night and the weather without and sounds of slumber came from the folk who lay soft and safe on the pillows twixt the skins but all these bodies lying twisted and bent on the hillside about the little heap of black and white ashes might well be dead some lay upon their faces some upon their backs with knees updrawn and the noises that came from them scared her her father snored deeply but when halvdan drew a breath it piped and whistled in his nose and orna lay upon his side his face hidden on his arm and his glossy light brown hair spread out amongst the heather he lay so still Kristen grew afraid lest he be dead she had to bend forward and touch him and on this he turned a little in his sleep Kristen suddenly bethought her maybe they had slept through the night and this was the next day and this frightened her so that she shook her father but he only grunted and slept on Kristen herself was still heavy of head but she dared not lie down to sleep again and so she crept forward to the fire and raked in it with a stick there were still some embers aglow beneath she threw upon it heather and small twigs which she broke off round about her she dared not pass the ring of sleepers to find bigger branches there came a rattling and crashing in the woods near by and Kristen's heart sank and she went cold with fear but then she spied a red shape amidst the trees and Gultsweinen broke out of the thicket he stood there and gazed upon her with his clear bright eyes she was so glad to see him she leaped to her feet and ran to the stallion and there too was the brown horse arna had ridden and the pack-horse as well now she felt safe and happy again she went and patted them all three upon their flanks but Gultsweinen bent his head so that she could reach up to fondle his cheeks and pull his yellow-white forelock while he nosed round her hands with his soft muzzle the horses wandered feeding down the birch-grown slope and Kristen went with them she felt there was naught to fear so long as she kept close to Gultsweinen he had driven off a bear before now she knew and the bilberries grew so thick in here and the child was thirsty now with a bad taste in her mouth the beer was not to her liking any more but the sweet juicy berries were good as wine away on a scree she saw raspberries growing too so she grasped Gultsweinen by the mane and sweetly bade him go there with her and the stallion followed willingly with the little maid thus as she wandered further and further down the hillside he followed her when she called and the other two horses followed Gultsweinen. somewhere near at hand she heard the gurgling and trickling of a beck she followed the sound till she found it and then lay out upon a great slab and washed her hot gnat-bitten face and hands below the slab the water stood a still black pool for over against it there rose a wall of rock behind some small birches and willows 
it made the finest of mirrors and christen leaned over and looked at herself in the water for she wished to see whether twas true as isred said that she bore a likeness to her father she smiled and nodded and bent forward till her hair met the bright hair about the round great-eyed child face she saw in the beck round about grew a great plenty of those gay pink flower clusters they name valerian redder far and finer here by the fell beck than at home by the river of these christen plucked and bound them about with grass till she had woven herself the finest thickest wreath of rose pink the child pressed it down on her head and ran to the pool to see how she looked now she was decked out like a grown maid who goes a-dancing she stooped over the water and saw her own dark image rise from the bottom and grow clearer as it came to meet her and then in the mirror of the pool she saw another figure standing among the birches opposite and bending toward her in haste she got upon her knees and gazed across at first she thought it was but the rock and the bushes clinging round its foot but all at once she was aware of a face amid the leaves there stood a lady pale with waving flaxen hair the great light gray eyes and wide pink nostrils were like goldsvinen's she was clad in something light leaf green and branches and twigs hid her up to the broad breasts which were covered over with brooches and sparkling chains the little girl gazed upon the figure and as she gazed the lady raised a hand and showed her a wreath of golden flowers she beckoned with it behind her christen heard goldsvinen nay loud in fear she turned her head the stallion reared screaming till the echoes rang then flung round and fled up the hill with a thunder of hoofs the other horses followed straight up the scree while stones came rumbling down and boughs and roots broke and rattled then christen screamed aloud father she shrieked father she gained her feet tore after the horses and dared not look behind she clambered up the scree trod on the hem of her dress and slipped back downwards climbed again catching at the stones with bleeding hands creeping on sore bruised knees and crying now to goldsvinen now to her father sweat started from every pore of her body and ran like water into her eyes and her heart beat as though it would break against her ribs while sobs of terror choked her throat oh father oh father then his voice sounded somewhere above she saw him come with great bounds down the scree the bright sunlit scree birch and aspen stood along it and blinked from their small silvered leaves the hillside was so quiet so bright while her father came leaping calling her by name and christen sank down and knew that now she was saved sancta maria lavrens knelt and clasped his daughter he was pale and strange about the mouth so that christen grew yet more afraid twas as though only now in his face she read how great had been her peril child he lifted her bleeding hands looked at them saw the wreath upon her bare head and touched it what is it how came you hither my little christen i went with goldsvinen she sobbed upon his breast i got so afraid seeing you all asleep but then goldsvinen came and and then there was some one by the beck down yonder that beckoned me who beckoned was it a man no twas a lady she beckoned with a wreath of gold i think twas the dwarf maiden father jesus christus said lavrens softly and crossed himself and the child he helped her up the scree till they came to a grassy slope then he lifted and bore her she clung about his neck and sobbed could not stop for all his soothing soon they met the men and isrid the woman smote her hands together when she heard what had befallen 
ay twas the elf maiden sure enough she would have lured the fair child into the mountain trust you me hold your peace bade lavrens sternly never should we have talked of such things here in the woods as we did one knows not what may lie beneath the rocks and hearken to each word he drew the golden chain from out his shirt and hung it and the relic holding cross about christen's neck and thrust them in upon her bare body but see to it all of you he said that you watch well your mouths so ranfried may never know the child has been in such peril then they caught the three horses which had made off into the woods and went quickly down to the pasture where the other horses were grazing there they all mounted and rode to the urengard satyr it was no great way the sun was near setting when they came thither the cattle were in the pens and tortoise and the herds were busy at the milking within the hut porridge stood cooked awaiting them for the satyr folk had spied them by the beacon earlier in the day and they were looked for now at length was christen's weeping stilled she sat upon her father's knee and ate porridge and cream from out the same spoon as he laverance was to go next day to a lake farther in the mountains where lay some of his herdsmen with the bulls christen was to have gone with him but now he said she must stay in the hut while he was gone and you must take heed both tortoise and isrid to keep the door barred and the smoke-hole closed till we come back both for christen's sake and for the poor unchristened babes here in the cradle tortoise was so frightened now that she dared no longer stay with the little one up here for she was still unchurched since her lying in rather would she go down at once and bide in the parish lavren said this seemed to him but wise she could go down with them the next evening he thought he could get an older widow woman serving at urengard up hither in her stead tortoise had spread sweet fresh mountain grass under the skins on the benches it smelled so strong and good and christen was near asleep while her father said our father and ave maria over her ay twill be a long day before i take you with me to the fells again said lavrens patting her cheek christen woke up with a start father mayn't i go with you either when you go southwards at harvest as you promised we must see about that said lavrens and straightway christen fell asleep between the sheepskins End of chapter one part two Chapter Two, Part One of *The Bridal Wreath* by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Part One. Each summer, it was Lavrens Bjorgolfsson's wont to ride southward and see to his manor in Folo. These journeys of her father were landmarks of each year in Kristen's life. The long weeks while he was gone, and the joy of his homecoming with brave gifts fine outlandish stuffs for her bride-chest figs raisins and honey bread from oslo and many strange things to tell her but this year christen marked that there was something more than common afoot toward the time of her father's going twas put off and off the old men from lopsgard rode over at odd times and sat about the board with her father and mother spoke of heritage and freehold and redemption rights and hindrances to working the estate from so far off and the bishop's seat and the king's palace in oslo which took so much labor from the farms round about the town they scarce ever had time to play with her and she was sent out to the kitchen house to the maids her mother's brother trone ivarsson of sunbu came over to them more often than was his wont but he had never been used to play with christen or pet her little by little she came to have some inkling of what it was all about ever since he was come to seal lavrens had sought to gather to himself land here in the parish and now had sir andres goodmanson tendered him formo and seal which was sir andres heritage from his mother 
in change for skull which lay more fittingly for him since he was with the king's bodyguard and rarely came hither to the dale Lavrens was loath to part with Skog, which was his freehold heritage, and had come to his forebears by royal gift. And yet the bargain would be for his gain in many ways. But Lavrens' brother, Osman Bjorgolfsson, too, would gladly have Skog. He dwelt now in Hadeland, where he had wedded an estate, and was not sure that Osman would waive the right his kinship gave him. But one day Lavrens told Ranfried that this year he would have Kristen with him to Skog. She should see the manor where she was born, and which was his father's home, now that it was like to pass from their hands. Ranfried deemed this but right, though she feared not a little to send so young a child on such a long journey, where she herself could not be by for a time after kristen had seen the elf-maid she was so fearful that she kept much within doors by her mother she was afraid even when she saw the folk who had been with them on the fells and knew what had befallen her and she was glad her father had forbidden all talk of that sight of hers but when some little time was gone by she began to think she would like to speak of it in her thoughts she told the story to someone she knew not whom and twas strange the more time went by the better it seemed she remembered it and the clearer and clearer grew the memory of the fair lady but strangest of all each time she thought of the elf-maid there came upon her such a longing for the journey to skog and more and more fear that her father would not take her with him at last she woke one morning in the loft-room and saw her mother and old gunnel sitting on the threshold looking over a heap of lavrens squirrel-skins gunnel was a widow who went the round of the farms and sewed fur lining into cloaks and the like and kristen guessed from their talk that now it was she should have a new cloak lined with squirrel-skin and edged with marten and then she knew she was to go with her father and she sprang up in bed and shrieked with gladness her mother came over to her and stroked her cheek are you so glad then my daughter you are going so far from me ranfried said the same that morning they were to set out they were up at cock crow it was dark without with thick mist between the houses as kristen peeped out of the door at the weather the mist billowed like grey smoke round about the lanterns and out by the open house doors folk ran twixt stables and outhouses and women came from the kitchen with steaming porridge pots and trenchers of meat and pork they were to have a plenty of good strong food before they rode out into the morning cold indoors saddle-bags were shut and opened and forgotten things packed inside ranfried called to her husband's mind all the errands he must do for her and spoke of kin and friends upon the way he must greet this one and not forget to ask for that one kristen ran out and in she said farewell many times to all in the house and could not hold still a moment in any place are you so glad then kristen you are going from me so far and for so long asked her mother kristen was abashed and uneasy and wished her mother had not said this but she answered as best she could no dear my mother but i am glad that i am to go with father ay that you are indeed said ranfried sighing then she kissed the child and put the last touches to her dress at last they were in the saddle the whole train kristen rode on morvan who ere now had been her father's saddle-horse he was old wise and steady ranfried held up the silver stoop with the stirrup-cup to her husband and laid a hand upon her daughter's knee and bade her bear in mind all her mother had taught her and so they rode out of the courtyard in the grey light the fog lay white as milk upon the parish but in a while it began to grow thinner and the sunlight sifted through and dripping with dew there shone through the white haze hillsides green with the aftermath and pale stubble fields and yellow trees and rowans bright with red berries 
glimpses of blue mountain sides seemed rising through the steamy haze then the mist broke and drove in wreaths across the slopes and they rode down the dale in the most glorious sunshine Kristen in front of the troop at her father's side they came to hamar one dark and rainy evening with Kristen sitting in front on her father's saddle-bow for she was so weary that all things swam before her eyes the lake that gleamed wanly on their right the gloomy trees which dripped wet upon them as they rode beneath and the dark leaden clusters of houses on the hueless sodden fields by the wayside she had stopped counting the days it seemed as though she had been an endless time on the journey they had visited kindred and friends all down the dale she had made acquaintance with children on the great manors and had played in strange houses and barns and courtyards and had worn many times her red dress with the silk sleeves they had rested by the roadside by day when the weather was fair orna had gathered nuts for her and she had slept after meals upon the saddle-bags wherein were their clothes at one great house they had silk-covered pillows in their beds but one night they lay at an inn and in one of the other beds was a woman who lay and wept softly and bitterly each time Kristen was awake but every night she had slumbered safely behind her father's broad warm back Kristen awoke with a start she knew not where she was but the wondrous ringing and booming sound she had heard in her dream went on she was lying alone in a bed and on the hearth of the room a fire was burning she called upon her father and he rose from the hearth where he had been sitting and came to her along with a stout woman where are we she asked and lavrens laughed and said we're in hamar now and here is margaret the wife of fartain the shoemaker you must greet her prettily now for you slept when we came hither but now margaret will help you to your clothes is it morning then said Kristen? i thought you were even now coming to bed oh do you help me she begged but lavrin said something sternly that she should rather be thankful to kind margaret for helping her and see what she has for you for a gift twas a pair of red shoes with silken latchets the woman smiled at Kristen's glad face and drew on her shift and hose up on the bed that she should not need to tread barefoot upon the clay floor what is it makes such a noise asked Kristen. like a church bell but many bells ay those are our bells laughed margaret have you heard not of the great minster here in the town tis there you are going now there goes the great bell and now tis ringing in the cloister and in the church of holy cross as well margaret spread the butter thick upon Kristen's bread and gave her honey in her milk that the food she took might stand in more stead she had scant time to eat out of doors it was still dark and the weather had fallen frosty the fog was biting cold the footprints of folk and of cattle and horses were hard as though cast in iron so that Kristen bruised her feet in the thin new shoes and once she trod through the ice on the gutter in the middle of the street and her legs got wet and cold then lavrens took her on his back and carried her she strained her eyes in the gloom but there was not much she could see of the town she caught a glimpse of black house gables and trees through the gray air then they came out upon a little meadow that shone with rime and upon the further side of the meadow she dimly saw a pale gray building big as a fell great stone houses stood about and at points lights glimmered from window holes in the walls the bells which had been silent for a time took to ringing again and now it was with a sound so strong that a cold shiver ran down his back twas like going into the mountainside thought Kristen, when they mounted into the church forehall it struck chill and dark in there they went through a door and were met by the stale cold smell of incense and candles 
now Kristen was in a dark and vastly lofty place she could not see where it ended neither above nor to the sides but lights burned upon an altar far in front there stood a priest and the echoes of his voice stole strangely round the great place like breathings and whisperings her father signed the cross with holy water upon himself and the child and so they went forward though he stepped warily his spurs rang loudly on the stone floor they passed by giant pillars and betwixt the pillars it was like looking into coal-black holes forward nigh to the altar the father bent his knee and Kristen knelt beside him she began to be able to make things out in the gloom gold and silver glittered on altars in between the pillars but upon that before them shone tapers which stood and burned on gilt candlesticks while the light streamed back from the holy vessels and the big beautiful picture panel behind Kristen was brought again to think of the mountain folks hall even so had she dreamed it must be splendid like this but maybe with yet more lights and the dwarf maid's face came up before her but then she raised her eyes and spied upon the wall above the altar christ himself great and stern lifted high upon the cross fear came upon her he did not look mild and sorrowful as at home in their own snug timber-brown church where he hung heavily with pierced feet and hands and bowed his blood-besprinkled head beneath the crown of thorns here he stood upon a footboard with stiff outstretched arms and upright head his gilded hair glittered he was crowned with a crown of gold and his face was upturned and harsh then she tried to follow the priest's words as he read and chanted but his speech was too hurried and unclear at home she was wont to understand each word for sirrah eirik had the clearest speech and had taught her what the holy words betokened in norse that she might the better keep her thoughts with god while she was in church but she could not do that here for every moment she grew aware of something new in the darkness there were windows high up in the walls and these began to shimmer with the day and near by where they knelt there was raised a wondrous scaffolding of timber but beyond lay blocks of light-coloured stone and there stood mortar troughs and tools and she heard folks coming tiptoeing about in there but then again her eyes fell upon the stern lord christ upon the wall and she strove to keep her thoughts fixed upon the service the icy cold from the stone floor stiffened her legs right up to the thighs and her knees gave her pain at length everything began to sway about her so weary was she then her father rose the mass was at an end the priest came forward and greeted her father while they spoke Kristen sat herself down upon a step for she saw the choir-boy had done the like he yawned and so she too fell a yawning while he marked that she looked at him he set his tongue in his cheek and twisted his eyes at her thereupon he dug up a pouch from under his clothing and emptied upon the flags all that was in it fish-hooks lumps of lead leather thongs and a pair of dice and all the while he made signs to her Kristen wondered mightily but now the priest and her father looked at the children the priest laughed and bade the boy be gone back to school but lavrens frowned and took Kristen by the hand it began to grow lighter in the church now Kristen clung sleepily to lavrens hand while he and the priest walked beneath the pile of timber and talked of bishop ingyald's building work they wandered all about the church and in the end went out into the forehall thence a stone stairway led to the western tower Kristen tumbled wearily up the steps the priest opened a door to a fair chapel and her father said that Kristen should set herself without upon the steps and wait while he went to shrift and thereafter she could come in and kiss st thomas's shrine at that there came an old monk in an ash-brown frock from out of the chapel 
he stopped a moment smiled at the child and drew forth some sacks and wadmal cloths which had been stuck into a hole in the wall these he spread upon the landing sit you here and you will not be so cold said he and passed down the steps upon his naked feet Kristen was sleeping when canon martin as the priest was called came out and waked her with a touch up from the church sounded the sweetest of song and in the chapel candles burned upon the altar the priest made sign that she should kneel by her father's side and then he took down a little golden shrine which stood above the communion table he whispered to her that in it was a piece of st thomas of canterbury's bloody garments and he pointed at the saint's figure on the shrine that christian might press her lips to his feet the lovely tones still streamed from the church as they came down the steps canon martin said twas the organist practising his art and the schoolboys singing but they had not the time to stay and listen for her father was hungry he had come fasting for confession and they were now bound for the guest-room of the canon's close to take their food the morning sun without was gilding the steep shores on the further side of the great lake and all the groves of yellowing leaf trees shone like gold dust amid the dark blue pine woods the lake ran in waves with small dancing white caps of foam to their heads the wind blew cold and fresh and the many-hued leaves drifted down upon the rimy hillsides a band of riders came forth from between the bishop's palace and the house of the brothers of holy cross Lavrens stepped aside and bowed with a hand upon his breast, while he all but swept the sward with his hat. So Christian could guess the nobleman in the fur cloak must be the bishop himself, and she curtsied to the ground. The bishop reined in his horse and gave back the greeting. He beckoned Lavrens to him and spoke with him a while. In a short space Lavrens came back to the priest and child and said, "'Now am I bidden to eat at the bishop's palace.' think you canon martin that one of the serving men of the canonry would go with this little maid of mine home to fartain the shoemakers and bid my men send halfdan to meet me here with goldsvinen at the hour of nones the priest answered doubtless what he asked could be done but on this the barefooted monk who had spoken to christen on the tower stairs came forward and saluted them there is a man here in our guest-house who has an errand of his own to the shoemakers he can bear your bidding thither lavrens bjorgolfsson and your daughter can go with him or bide at the cloister with me till you yourself are for home i shall see to it that she has her food there lavrens thanked him but said twere shame you should be troubled with the child brother edwin brother edwin draws to himself all the children he can lay hands upon said canon martin and laughed tis in this wise he gets someone to preach to ay before you learned lords here in hammer i dare not proffer my poor discourses said the monk without anger and smiling all i am fit for is to talk to children and peasants but even so tis not well we know to muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn Kristen looked up at her father beseechingly. She thought there was nothing she would like more than to go with Brother Edwin. So Lavrens gave thanks again, and while her father and the priest went after the bishop's train, Kristen laid her hand in the monk's, and they went down towards the cloister, a cluster of wooden houses and a light-hued stone church far down by the lakeside. Brother Edwin gave her hand a little squeeze, and as they looked at one another they had both to laugh. The monk was thin and tall, but very stoop-backed. The child thought him like an old crane in the head, for twas little, with a small shining bald pate above a shaggy white rim of hair, and set upon a long thin wrinkled neck. His nose was large too, and pointed like a beak, but twas something which made her light of heart and glad, only to look up into the long narrow deep-lined face the old sea-blue eyes were red-rimmed and the lids brown and thin as flakes a thousand wrinkles spread out from them the wizened cheeks with the reddish network of veins were scored with furrows which ran down towards the thin-lipped mouth 
but twas as though brother edwin had grown thus wrinkled only through smiling at mankind christen thought she had never seen any one so blithe and gentle it seemed he bore some bright and privy gladness within which she would get to know of when he began to speak End of chapter two part one chapter two part two of the bridal wreath by sigrid unset this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two part two they followed the fence of an apple orchard where there still hung upon the trees a few red and golden fruit two preaching brothers in black and white gowns were raking together withered bean shaws in the garden the cloister was not much unlike any other farmsteading and the guest-house whither the monk led christen was most like a poor peasant's house though there were many bedsteads in it in one of the beds lay an old man and by the hearth sat a woman swathing a little child two bigger children boy and girl stood beside her they murmured both the man and the woman that they had not been given their breakfast yet none will be at the pains to bear in food to us twice in the day so we must e'en starve while you run about the town brother edwin nay be not peevish steinulf said the monk come hither and make your greetings christen see this bonny sweet little maid who is to stay and eat with us to-day he told how steinulf had fallen sick on the way home from a fair and had got leave to lie here in the cloister guest-house for he had a kinswoman dwelling in the spittal and she was so cursed he could not endure to be there with her but i see well enough they will soon be weary of having me here said the peasant when you set forth again brother edwin there will be none here that has time to tend me and they will surely have me to the spittal again oh you will be well and strong long before i am done with my work in the church said brother edwin then your son will come and fetch you he took up a kettle of hot water from the hearth and let christen hold it while he tended steinulf thereupon the old man grew somewhat easier and soon after there came in a monk with food and drink for them brother edwin said grace over the meat and set himself on the edge of the bed by steinulf that he might help him to take his food christen went and sat by the woman and gave the boy to eat for he was so little he could not well reach up to the porridge dish and he spilled upon himself when he tried to dip into the beer bowl the woman was from Hadeland, and she was come hither with her man and her children to see her brother who was a monk here in the cloister but he was away wandering among the country parishes and she grumbled much that they must lie here and waste their time brother edwin spoke the woman fair she must not say she wasted time when she was here in bishop's hamar here were all the brave churches and the monks and canons held masses and sang the livelong day and night and the city was fine finer than oslo even though twas somewhat less but here were gardens to almost every dwelling-place you should have seen it when i came hither in the spring twas white with blossom over all the town and after when the sweet briar burst forth ay and much good is that to me now said the woman sourly and here are more of holy places than of holiness methinks the monk laughed a little and shook his head then he routed amidst the straw of his bed and brought forth a great handful of apples and pears which he shared amongst the children christen had never tasted such good fruit the juice ran out from the corners of her mouth every bite she took but now brother edwin must go to the church he said and christen should go with him their path went slantwise across the close and by a little side wicket they passed into the choir they were still building at this church as well so that here too stood a tall scaffolding in the cross where nave and transepts met bishop ingyald was bettering and adorning the choir said brother edwin 
the bishop had great wealth and all his riches he used for the adornment of the churches here in the town he was a noble bishop and a good man the preaching friars in the olav's cloister were good men too clean living learned and humble twas a poor cloister but they had made him most welcome brother edwin had his home in the minorite cloister at oslo but he had to leave to spend a term here in hamar diocese but now come hither said he and led christen forward to the foot of the scaffolding first he climbed up a ladder and laid some boards straight up there and then he came down again and helped the child up with him upon the grey stone wall above her christen saw wondrous fluttering flecks of light red as blood and yellow as beer blue and brown and green she would have turned to look behind her but the monk whispered turn not about but when they stood together high upon the planking he turned her gently round and christen saw a sight so fair she almost lost her breath right over against her on the nave's south wall stood a picture and shone as if it were made of naught but gleaming precious stones the many-hued flecks of light upon the wall came from rays which stood out from that picture she herself and the monk stood in the midst of the glory her hands were red as though dipped in wine the monk's visage seemed all golden and his dark frock threw the picture's colours softly back she looked up at him questioningly but he only nodded and smiled twas like standing far off and looking into the heavenly kingdom behind a network of black streaks she made out little by little the lord christ himself in the most precious of red robes the virgin mary in raiment blue as heaven holy men and maidens in shining yellow and green and violet array they stood below arches and pillars of glimmering houses wound about with branches and twigs of strange bright leafage the monk drew her a little further out upon the staging stand here he whispered and twill shine right upon you from christ's own robe from the church beneath there rose to them a faint odour of incense and the smell of cold stone it was dim below but the sun's rays slanted in through a row of window bays in the nave's south wall christen began to understand that the heavenly picture must be a sort of window-pane for it filled just such an opening the others were empty or filled with panes of horn set in wooden frames a bird came set itself upon a window-sill twittered a little and flew away and outside the wall of the choir they heard the clank of metal on stone all else was still only the wind came in small puffs sighed a little around about the church walls and died away ay ay said brother edwin and sighed no one here in the land can make the like they paint on glass tis true in nidaros but not like this but away in the lands of the south christen in the great minsters there they have such picture panes big as the doors of the church here christen thought of the pictures in the church at home there was st olaf's altar and st thomas of canterbury's altar with pictures on their front panels and on the tabernacles behind but those pictures seemed to her dull and lustreless as she thought of them now they went down the ladder and up into the choir there stood the altar table naked and bare and on the stone slab were set many small boxes and cups of metal and wood and earthenware strange little knives and irons pens and brushes lay about brother edwin said these were his gear he plied the crafts of painting pictures and carving altar tabernacles and the fine panels which stood yonder by the choir stalls were his work they were for the altar pieces here in the preaching friars church christen watched how he mixed up coloured powders and stirred them into little cups of stoneware and he let her help him bear the things away to a bench by the wall 
while the monk went from one panel to another and painted fine red lines in the bright hair of the holy men and women so that one could see it curl and crinkle christen kept close at his heels and gazed and questioned and he explained to her what it was that he had limbed on the one panel sat christ in a chair of gold and saint nicholas and saint clement stood beneath a roof by his side and at the sides was painted st nicholas life and works in one place he sat as a suckling child upon his mother's knee he turned away from the breast she reached him for he was so holy that from the very cradle he would not suck more than once on fridays alongside of that was a picture of him as he laid the money purses before the door of the house where dwelt the three maids who were so poor they could not find husbands she saw how he healed the roman knight's child and saw the knight sailing in a boat with the false chalice in his hands he had vowed the holy bishop a chalice of gold which had been in his house a thousand years as guerdon for the bringing his son back to health again but he was minded to trick st nicholas and give him a false chalice instead therefore the boy fell into the sea with the true beaker in his hands but St. Nicholas led the child unhurt underneath the water and up on to the shore, just as his father stood in St. Nicholas's church and offered the false vessel. It all stood painted upon the panels in gold and the fairest colors. On another panel sat the Virgin Mary with the Christ child on her knee. He pressed his mother's chin with the one hand and held an apple in the other. Beside them stood St. Suniva and St. Christina, they bowed in lovely wise from their waists their faces were the fairest red and white and they had golden hair and golden crowns brother edwin steadied himself with the left hand on the right wrist and painted leaves and roses on the crowns the dragon is all too small methinks said christen looking at her holy namesake's picture it looks not as though it could swallow up the maiden and that it could not either said brother edwin it was not bigger dragons and all such like that serve the devil seem great only so long as fear is in ourselves but if a man seek god fervently and with all his soul so that his longing wins into his strength then does the devil's power suffer at once such great downfall that his tools become small and powerless dragons and evil spirits sink down and become no bigger than sprites and cats and crows you see that the whole mountain st suniva was in is no larger than that she can wrap it within the skirt of her gown but were they not in the caves then asked christen st suniva and the selia men is not that true the monk twinkled at her and smiled again tis both true and untrue it seemed so to the folk who found the holy bodies and true it is that it seemed so to soniva and the selya men for they were humble and thought only that the world is stronger than all sinful mankind and they thought not that they themselves were stronger than the world because they loved it not and had they but known it they could have taken all the hills and slung them forth into the sea like so many pebbles no one nor anything can harm us child save what we fear or love but if a body doth not fear nor love god asked christen affrighted the monk took her yellow hair in his hand bent christen's head back gently and looked down into her face his eyes were wide open and blue there is no man nor woman christen who does not love and fear god but tis because our hearts are divided twixt love of god and fear of the devil and fondness for the world and the flesh that we are unhappy in life and death for if a man had not any yearning after god and god's being then should he thrive in hell 
and would be we alone who would not understand that there he had gotten what his heart desired for there the fire would not burn him if he did not long for coolness nor would he feel the torment of the serpent's bite if he knew not the yearning after peace christen looked up in his face she understood none of all this brother edwin went on twas god's loving kindness towards us that seeing how our hearts are drawn asunder he came down and dwelt among us that he might taste in the flesh the lures of the devil when he decoys us with power and splendor as well as the menace of the world when it offers us blows and scorn and sharp nails in hands and feet in such wise did he show us the way and make manifest his love he looked down upon the child's grave set face then he laughed a little and said with quite another voice <laughs> do you know who twas that first knew our lord had caused himself to be born twas the cock he saw the star and so he said all the beasts could talk latin in those days he cried christus not to zest he crowed these last words so like a cock that christen fell to laughing heartily and it did her good to laugh for all the strange things brother edwin had just been saying had laid a burden of awe on her heart the monk laughed himself ay and when the ox heard that he began to low ubi 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 but the goat bleated and said bethlehem 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 and the sheep longed so to see our lady and her son that she bawled out at once emus 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 and the new-born calf that lay in the straw raised itself and stood upon its feet volo 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 it said you never heard that before no i can believe it i know that he is a worthy priest that sira Eirik, that you have up in your parts and learned but he knows not this i warrant for a man does not learn it except he journeyed to paris have you been to paris then asked the child god bless you little christen i have been in paris and have travelled round elsewhere in the world as well and you must not believe aught else than that i am afraid of the devil and love and covet like any other fool but i hold fast to the cross with all my might one must cling to it like a kitten to a lath when it has fallen in the sea and you christen how would you like to offer up this bonny hair and serve our lady like these brides i have figured here we have no child at home but me answered christen so tis like that i must marry and i trow mother has chests and lockers with my bridal gear standing ready even now ay ay said brother edwin and stroked her forehead tis thus that folk deal with their children now to god they give the daughters who are lame or purblind or ugly or blemished or they let him have back the children when they deem him to have given them more than they need and then they wonder that all who dwell in the cloisters are not holy men and maids brother edvin took her into the sacristy and showed her the cloister books which stood there in a bookcase there were the fairest pictures in them but when one of the monks came in brother edvin made as though he were but seeking an ass's head to copy afterward he shook his head at himself ay there you see what fear does christen but they're so fearful about their books in the house here had i the true faith and love i would not stand here as i do and lie to brother osulf but then 
I could take these old fur mittens here and hang them upon yonder sunbeam. She was with the monk to dinner over in the guest house, but for the rest she sat in the church the whole day and watched his work and chatted with him. And first, when Lavrens came to fetch her, did either she or the monk remember the message that should have been sent to the shoemaker? Afterwards, Kristen remembered these days in Hammer better than all else that befell her on the long journey. Oslo indeed was a greater town than Hammer, but now that she had seen a market town, it did not seem to her so notable, nor did she deem it as fair at Skog as at Jurengard, though the houses were grander, but she was glad she was not to dwell there. The manor lay upon a hillside. Below was the Boltenfjord, gray and sad, with dark forest. And on the further shore and behind the houses, the forest stood with the sky right down upon the treetops. There were no high, steep fells, as at home, to hold the heavens high above one and to keep the sight sheltered and in bounds so that the world might seem neither too big nor too little. The journey home was cold. It was nigh upon Advent. But when they were come a little way up the dale, snow was lying, and so they borrowed sleighs and drove most of the way. With the affair of the estates, it fell out so that Lovrens made Skog over to his brother Osmond, keeping the right of redemption for himself and his heirs. End of chapter 2, part 2《ハッピーオーバーライフ》Wreath by Sigrid Unset This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The spring after Kristen's long journey, Ronfried bore her husband another daughter. Both father and mother had wished indeed that it might be a son, but they soon took comfort and were filled with the tenderest love for little Ulfhild. She was a most fair child, healthy, good, happy and quiet ronfried doted so on this new baby that she went on suckling it during the second year of its life wherefore on syra eirik's counsel she left off somewhat her strict fasts and religious exercises while she had the child at the breast on this account and by reason of her joy in ulfhild her bloom came back to her, and Lovrens thought he had never seen his wife so happy or so fair and kindly in all the years he had been wed. Kristen, too, felt that great happiness had come to them with this tender little sister, that her mother's heavy mood made a stillness about her home had never come into her thought. She had deemed it was but as it should be that her mother should correct and chide her, while her father played and jested with her. But Ranfrid was much gentler with her now, and gave her more freedom, petted her more, too, and so Kristen little heeded that her mother had much less time to tend her. She loved Ulfhild as much as the others, and was joyful when they let her carry or rock her sister, and in time there was still more sport with the little one when she began to creep and walk and talk, and Kristen could play with her. Thus there went by three good years for the Jurengard folk. They had fortune with them in many ways, and Lovrens built and bettered round about on the manor, for the buildings and cattle sheds were old and small when he came thither. The yeslings had had the place leased out for more lifetimes than one. Now it fell out at Whitsuntide in the third year that Trond Ivarsson from Sunbu, with his wife Gudrid, and his three small sons, were come to Jurngard to visit them. One morning the older folk were sitting talking in the balcony of the loft room, while the children played about in the courtyard below. In the yard Lovrens had begun a new dwelling-house, and the children were climbing and creeping about on the timber brought together for the building. One of the yesling boys had struck at Ulfhild and made her weep, and at that Trond came down and gave his son a buffet and took Ulfhild up into his arms. She was the fairest and sweetest child a man's eyes could see, and her uncle had much love for her, though else he cared not for children. 
Just then there came a man across the court from the cattle yard, dragging at a great black bull. But the bull was savage and unmanageable and broke away from the man. Trant sprang up upon the pile of timber, driving the bigger children up before him. But he had Olfield in his arms and his youngest son by the hand. Then a beam turned under his feet, and Olfield slipped from his grasp and fell to the ground. The beam slipped after, rolled over on the child, and lay across her back. Lovrens was down from the balcony in the same instant. He ran up and was in act to lift the beam when the bull rushed at him. He tried to seize it by the horns, but was flung down and gored. But getting then a grip of its nostrils, he half raised himself from the ground and managed to hold the brute till Trant came to himself from his bewilderment, and the farm servants, running from the houses, cast thongs about the beast and held it fast. Ranfried was on her knees trying to lift the beam, and now Lovrens was able to ease it so far that she could draw the child from under and into her lap. The little one wailed piteously when they touched her, but her mother sobbed aloud. She lives! Thank God she lives! It was great wonder the child had not been quite crushed, but the log had chanced to fall so that it rested with one end upon a stone in the grass. When Lovrens stood up again, blood was running from the corners of his mouth, and his clothes were all torn at the breast by the bull's horns. Tordis came running with a skin coverlet. Warily she and Ranfried moved the child on to it, but it seemed as though she suffered unbearable pain at the lightest touch. Her mother and Tordis bore her into the winter room. Kristen stood upon the timber pile, white and stock still, while the little boys clung around her, weeping. All the house and farm folk were now huddled together in the courtyard, the women weeping and wailing. Lavrens bade them saddle Goldsvinen and another horse as well. But when Arna came with the horses, Lavrens fell to the ground when he tried to climb to the saddle. So he bade Arna ride for the priest, while Halfdan went southward for a leech woman who dwelt by the meeting of the rivers. Kristen saw that her father was ashy white in the face, and that he had bled till his light blue garments were covered all over with red-brown stains. All at once he stood upright, snatched an axe from one of the men, and went forward where some of the folk stood holding on to the bull. He smote the beast between the horns with the back of the axe. It dropped forward on its knees. But Lavrens ceased not striking till its blood and brains were scattered all about. Then a fit of coughing took him, and he sank backwards on the ground. Trant and another man came to him and bore him within the house. At that, Kristen thought her father was surely dead. She screamed loudly and ran after, calling to him as if her heart were breaking. In the winter room, Ulfhild had been laid on the great bed. All the pillows were thrown out upon the floor, so that the child lay flat. Twas as though already she lay stretched on the dead straw. But she wailed loudly and without cease, and her mother lay bent over her, soothing and patting the child, wild with grief that she could do not to help her. Lovrens lay upon the other bed. He rose and staggered across the floor that he might comfort his wife. At that she started up and shrieked, "'Touch me not! Touch me not! Jesus! Jesus! Twere like her you should strike me dead! Never will it end the ill fortune I bring upon you!' "'You, dear my wife, tis not you that have brought this on us,' said Lovrens, and laid a hand upon her shoulder." She shuddered at that, and her light gray eyes shone in her lean, sallow face. "'Doubtless she means that twas my doing,' said Trant Ivarsson roughly. His sister looked at him with hate in her eyes and answered, "'Trant knows what I mean.' Kristen ran forward to her parents, but both thrust her away from them. And Tordis, coming in with a kettle of hot water, took her gently by the shoulder and said, "'Go, 
Go over to our house, Kristen. You are in the way here. Tortoise was foreseeing to Lovren's hurt. He had set himself down on the step before the bed, but he said there was little amiss with him. But is there naught you can do to ease Ulfeld's pain a little? God help us! Her crying would move the very stones in the mountainside. Nay, nee, we dare not touch her, ere the priest or Ingegerd the leech-wife comes, said Tordis. Orne came just then with word that Syra Eirik was not at home. Ranfried stood a while wringing her hands, then she said, Send to Lady Arshild of Haugen. Not matters now, if only Ulfhild may be saved. No one gave heed to Kristen. She crept on to the bench behind the bed's head, crouched down and laid her head upon her knees. It seemed to her now as if stony hands were pressing on her heart. Lady Osild was to be fetched. Her mother would not have them send for Lady Osild, even when she herself was near death's door at Ulfhild's birth, nor yet when Kristen was so sick of the fever. She was a witch-wife, folk said. The bishop of Oslo and the chapter had held session on her, and she must have been put to death or even burned, had it not been that she was of such high birth and had been like a sister to Queen Ingeborg. But folk said she had given her first husband poison, and him she now had, Sir Bjorn, she had drawn to her by witchcraft. He was young enough to be her son." She had children, too, but they came never to see their mother, and these two high-born folk, Bjorn and Oshild, lived upon a petty farm in Dovre, and had lost all their wealth. None of the great folk in the dale would have to do with them, but privily folk sought her counsel. Nay, poor folk went openly to her with their troubles and hurts. They said she was kind, but they feared her too kristen thought her mother who else was wont to pray so much should rather have called on god and the virgin now she tried to pray herself to saint olaf most of all for she knew he was so good and helped so many who suffered from sickness and wounds or broken bones but she could not keep her thoughts together her father and mother were alone in the room now Lavrens had laid himself upon his bed again, and Ranfried sat bent over the sick child, passing from time to time a damp cloth over her forehead and hands, and wetting her lips with wine. A long time went by. Tordis looked in between whiles, and would fain have helped, but Ranfried sent her out each time. Kristen wept silently and prayed to herself, but all the while she thought of the witch-wife, and waited eagerly to see her come in. Suddenly Ranfried asked in the silence, "'Are you sleeping, Lovrens?' "'No,' answered her husband. "'I am listening to Ulfhild. God will surely help his innocent lamb, wife. We dare not doubt it. But tis weary lying here waiting.' god said ranfried hopelessly hates me for my sins tis well with my children where they are i doubt not that and now tis like ulfhild's hour has come too but me he has cast off for my heart is a viper's nest full of sin and sorrow then someone lifted the latch Syra Eirik stepped in, straightened his huge frame where he stood, and said in his clear, deep voice, God help all in this house. The priest put the box with his medicines on the step before the bed, and went to the open hearth, and poured warm water over his hands. Then he took a cross from his bosom, struck out with it to all four corners of the room, and mumbled something in Latin. Thereupon he opened the smoke vent so that the light might stream into the room, and went and looked at Ulfhild. Kristen grew afraid he might find her and send her out. 
not often did syra Eirik's eyes let much escape them but the priest did not look round he took a flask from the box poured somewhat upon a wad of finely carded wool and laid it over ulfhild's mouth and nose now she will soon suffer less said the priest he went to Lovren's and tended his wounds, while they told him how the mishap had come to pass. Lovren's had two ribs broken and had a wound in the lungs, but the priest thought that for him there was no great fear. And, Ulfhild, asked the father fearfully. I will tell you when I have looked at her more nearly, answered the priest but you must lie in the loft room so that there may be more quiet and room here for those who must tend her he laid lavrin's arm about his own shoulder took firm hold under the man and bore him out kristen would fain have gone with her father now but she dared not show herself when syra Eire came back he did not speak to ranfrid but first cut the clothes off ulfhild who now moaned less and seemed half asleep then carefully he felt with his hands over the child's body and limbs is it so ill with my child eirik that you know not how to save her since you say not asked ranfrid under her breath the priest answered low it seems as though her back were badly hurt ranfrid i see no better way than to leave all in god's hands and st olaf's much there is not that i can do then must we pray cried the mother passionately you know well that lovrens and i will give you all you ask and spare nothing if so be your prayers can win god to grant that ulfhild may live twould seem to me a miracle said the priest were she to live and have her health again and is not of miracles that you preach late and early believe you not that a miracle can happen with my child she said as wildly as before tis true replied the priest that miracles happen but god does not grant the prayers of all we know not his secret counsel and think you not it would be worst of all should this fair little maid grow up marred or crippled ranfrid shook her head she wailed softly i have lost so many priest i cannot lose her too i will do all that i may answered the priest and pray with all my power but you must strive ranfrid to bear the cross god lays upon you the mother moaned low none of my children have i loved like this little one if she too be taken from me full sure i am my heart will break god help you ranfrid ivar's daughter said syra eirik and shook his head in all your praying and fasting you have thought only to force your will upon god can you wonder that it has helped but little ranfrid looked defiantly at the priest and spoke i have sent for the lady arshild even now ay you know her i know her not replied the priest i cannot live without ulfhild said ranfrid as before if so be god will not help her i will seek counsel of lady arshild or even give myself to the devil if he will help the priest looked as though he would answer sharply but checked himself again he bent and felt the limbs of the little sick girl once more her hands and feet are cold he said we must lay jars of hot water about her and then you must touch her no more till lady oshild comes Kristen let herself sink back noiselessly on the bench and lay as if asleep her heart beat hard with fear she had understood but little of the talk between syra eirik and her mother but it had frightened her terribly and the child knew well that it had not been for her ears 
her mother rose up to go for the hot water jars and suddenly she burst out sobbing but yet pray for us syra irik soon after she came back with tortoise then the priest and the women busied themselves with Allfield, and soon Kristen was found and sent away. The light dazzled the child as she stood without in the courtyard. She had thought that most of the day must have gone by while she sat in the dark winter room, and yet the houses stood there light gray, and the grass was shining like silk in the white midday sunshine. The river gleamed behind the dun and golden trellis work of the alder breaks. It filled the air with its gladsome rushing sound, for here by Jurnkard it ran swiftly over a flat bed strewn with boulders. The mountain walls rose into the thin blue haze, and the becks sprang down their sides through the melting snows. The sweet, strong springtide out of doors brought tears to her eyes, for sorrow at the helplessness she felt all about her. There was no one in the courtyard, but she heard voices in the house Carl's cottage. Fresh earth had been strewn over the spot where her father had killed the bull. She knew not what to do with herself, so she crept behind the wall of the new house. Two log courses had already been laid. Inside lay Ulfield's playthings and her own. She put them all together and laid them in a hole between the lowest log and the foundation wall of late ulfhild had wanted all her toys this had vexed her sometimes now she thought if her sister got well she would give her all she had and this thought comforted her a little she thought of the monk in hamar he was sure that miracles could happen for every one but syra eirik was not so sure about it nor her parents either and she was used to think as they did. A heavy weight fell upon her as it came to her for the first time that folk could think so unlike about so many things, not only bad ungodly men and good men, but such men as Brother Edwin and Syra Eirik, even her mother and her father. She felt all at once that they too thought not alike about many things." tortoise found her there in the corner asleep late in the day and took her to her own house the child had eaten nothing since the morning tortoise watched with ronfried over ulfhild through the night and kristen lay in tortoise bed with jon tortoise husband and ivind and orm their little boys the smell of their bodies the man's snoring and the children's even breathing made kristen weep silently it was no longer ago than last evening that she had lain down as each night of her life before by her own father and mother and little Olfield. it was as though a nest had been riven asunder and scattered and she herself lay cast out from the shelter of the wings which had always kept her warm at last she cried herself to sleep alone and unhappy among these strange folk next morning as soon as she was up she heard that her mother's brother and all his party had left the place in anger Trant had called his sister a foolish crazy woman and his brother-in-law a soft simpleton who had never known how to rule his wife kristen grew hot with wrath but she was ashamed too she understood well enough that a most unseemly thing had befallen in that her mother had driven her nearest kin from the house and for the first time she dimly felt that there was something about her mother that was not as it should be that she was not the same as other women while she stood brooding on this a serving-maid came and said she was to go up to the loft room to her father but when she came into the room kristen forgot to look at him for right opposite the open door with the light full upon her face sat a little woman who she guessed must be the witch-wife and yet kristen had never thought that she would look like this she seemed small as a child and slightly made as she sat in the great high-backed armchair which had been brought up thither 
a table had been set before her too covered with ramfried's finest fringed linen tablecloth bacon and fowl were set out upon the silver platter there was wine in a mazer bowl and she had lavrin's own silver goblet to drink from she had finished eating and was busy drying her small and slender hands on one of ranfrit's best hand towels ranfrit herself stood in front of her and held for her a brass basin with water lady oshild let the hand towel sink into her lap she smiled to the child and said in a clear and lovely voice come hither to me child then to the mother fair children are these you have ranfrit her face was greatly wrinkled but as clear white and pink as a child's and it looked as though her skin must be just as soft and fine to the touch her mouth was as red and fresh as a young woman's and her large hazel eyes shone bright a fine white linen headdress lay close about her face and was fastened under her chin with a golden clasp over it she had a veil of soft dark blue wool it fell over her shoulders and far down upon her dark well-fitting dress she was upright as a wand and Kristen felt more than thought that she had never seen a woman so fair and so mannerly as was this old witch-wife with whom the great folk of the valley would have naught to do lady oshild held Kristen's hand in her old soft one and spoke to her with kindly jesting but Kristen could not answer a word then said lady oshild with a little laugh is she afraid of me think you nay nay Kristen all but shouted and then lady oshild laughed still more and said to the mother she has wise eyes this daughter of yours and good strong hands nor is she used to be idle i can see you will need one by and by to help you tend Ulfield when i am gone twere well therefore you let Kristen be by me and help while i am here she is old enough for that eleven years is she not thereupon the lady oshild went out and Kristen would have followed her but lavrin's called to her from his bed he lay flat upon his back with the pillows stuffed beneath his updrawn knees lady oshild had bidden that he should lie so that the hurt in his breast might the sooner heal now surely you will soon be well sir father will you not asked Kristen. lavrin's looked up at her the child had never said sir to him before then he said gravely for me there is naught to fear tis worse with your sister hi said Kristen, and sighed she stood yet a little while by his bed her father said no more and Kristen found naught to say and when lavrin's after a while said she should go down to her mother and lady oshild Kristen hastened out and ran across the courtyard down into the winter room end of chapter three chapter four part one of the bridal wreath by sigrid unset this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four part one lady oshild stayed on at urengard most of the summer thus it fell out that folk came thither seeking her counsel Kristen heard sierra eirik fling at this now and then and it came into her mind that her father and mother too were not pleased but she put all thoughts of such things from her nor did she ponder over what she thought of lady oshild but was with her ever and tired not of listening to the lady and of watching her ulfhild still lay stretched upon her back in the great bed her little face was white to the lips and dark rings had come about her eyes her lovely yellow hair had a stale smell it had been unwashed for so long and it had grown dark and lost all gloss and curl so that it looked like old burnt-up hay she looked tired and suffering and patient but she smiled faintly and wanly at her sister when Kristen sat down on the bedside by her and chattered and showed the child all the fine gifts there were for her from her father and mother and from their friends and kinsfolk from far around 
there were dolls and wooden birds and beasts and a little draught board trinkets and velvet caps and colored ribbons Kristen kept them all together in a box for her and Ulfhild looked at them all with her grave eyes and sighing dropped the treasures from her weary hands but when lady oshild came nigh Ulfhild's face lit up with gladness eagerly she drank the quenching and sleepy drinks lady oshild brewed for her when lady oshild tended her hurts she made no plaint and lay happy listening when the lady played on lavren's harp and sang she had great store of ballads strange to the folk of the dale often she sang to kristen when ulfhild lay asleep and then at times she would tell of her youth when she dwelt in the south at the courts of king magnus and king eirik and their queens once as they sat thus and lady oshild told of these things there slipped from kristen's lips a thought she had often had in mind methinks it is strange you can be so glad at all times you who have been used to she broke off and grew red lady oshild looked down at the child with a smile mean you because i am parted from all that now she laughed quietly and said i have had my happy time kristen and i am not so foolish as to murmur if now since i have drunk up my wine and beer i have to put up with skimmed milk and sour good days may last long if one lives wisely and deals warily with what one has all wise folk know that and tis therefore i trow that wise folk must rest content with good days for the best days of all cost very dear in this world they call him a fool who wastes his heritage that he may make merry in the days of his youth as to that each man may deem as he lists but that man only do i call a fool and a very dolt who rues his bargain after it is made and twice a simpleton and a fool of fools is he who thinks to see more of his boon companions after his heritage is gone is there aught amiss with Ulfhild? she called gently across to ranfrid who had made a sharp movement where she sat by the child's bed nay she sleeps well said the child's mother and came over to lady oshild and kristen at the hearth her hands on the pole of the smoke vent she stood and looked down into lady oshild's face kristen doth not understand such things she said no answered the lady but she learned her prayers too i doubt not before she understood them the times when we need prayers or counsel we are little like to be in a mood to learn nor yet to understand ranfried drew her dark eyebrows together thoughtfully at such times her bright deep-set eyes looked like barns below a dark wooded hillside so kristen had often thought when she was little or so she had heard others say lady oshild looked at ranfried with her little half smile and the mother seated herself upon the edge of the hearth and taking a twig stuck it into the embers but he who has wasted his heritage upon the sorriest goods and thereafter beholds a treasure he would gladly give his life to own think you not he must rue bitterly his own folly no doing without some ruing ranfried said lady oshild and he who is willing to give his life should make the venture and see what he can win ranfried plucked the burning twig from the fire blew out the flame and bent her hand about the glowing end so that it shone out blood-red from between her fingers oh these are words words and only words lady oshild well said the other truly ranfried there is not much that's worth buying so dear as with one's life nay but there is 
said Ranfried passionately, and she whispered so it could scarce be heard. My husband, Ranfried, said Lady Oshild in a low voice, so hath many a maid thought when she strove to bind a man to her and gave her maidenhood to do it but have you not read of men and maids who gave to god all they owned went into a cloister or naked into the woods and repented after ay they are called fools in the godly books and twould sure be sinful to think god cheated them over their bargain Ranfried sat quite still a while. Then Lady Oshild said, "'You must come now, Kristen. "'Tis time we went and gathered dew "'for Ulfhild's morning wash.' Outside, the courtyard lay all black and white in the moonlight. Ranfried went with them through the farmyard down to the gate of the cabbage garden. Kristen saw her mother's thin, dark figure leaning there while she was shaking the dew from the big, icy, cold cabbage leaves and the folds of the ladies' mantles, into her father's silver goblet. Lady Oshild walked silent at Kristen's side. She was there only to watch over her, for it was not well to let a child go out alone on such a night, but the dew had more virtue if gathered by an innocent maid. When they came back to the gate, Ranfried was gone. Kristen was shaking with the cold as she gave the icy silver cup into Lady Oshild's hands. She ran in her wet shoes over toward the loft room, where she slept now with her father. She had her foot upon the first step when Ranfried stepped out of the shadow of the balcony. In her hands she bore a steaming bowl. "'Here I have warmed some beer for you, daughter,' said the mother." Kristen thanked her mother gladly and put the bowl to her lips. Then Ranfried asked, Kristen, the prayers and all the other things that Lady Oshild teaches you, you are sure there is not sinful or ungodly in them? That I can never believe, answered the child. There is Jesus' name and the Virgin Mary's and the names of the saints in them all. What is it she teaches you? asked her mother again. Oh, about herbs and charms to stop running blood and cure warts and sore eyes and moth in clothes and mice in the storeroom and what herbs one should pluck in sunshine and which have virtue in the rain. But the prayers I must not tell to anyone, for then they lose their power, said she quickly. Her mother took the empty bowl and put it upon the step. Then suddenly she threw her arms around her daughter and pressed her tightly to her and kissed her. Kristen felt that her mother's cheeks were wet and hot. May God and Our Lady guard and shield you from all evil. We have naught else but you, your father and I, that has not been touched by our ill fortune. Darling, darling, never forget that you are your father's dearest joy. Ranfried went back to the winter room undressed and crept into bed beside Ulfhild. She put an arm about the child and laid her cheek close to the little ones, so that she felt the warmth of Ulfhild's body and smelled the keen odor of her damp hair. Ulfhild slept heavily and soundly, as she ever did after Lady Oshild's evening draught. The lady's bed straw, spread beneath the bedding, gave out a drowsy scent, None the less did Ranfried lie long sleepless, gazing at the little spot of light in the roof where the moon shone upon the smoke hole's pane of horn. Over in the other bed lay Lady Oshild, but Ranfried never knew whether she slept or waked. The lady never spoke of their having known each other in former days. This frightened Ranfried and it seemed to her she had never known such bitter sorrow and such haunting dread as now, even though she knew that Lavrens would have his full health again, and that Ulfhild would live. It seemed as though Lady Oshild took pleasure in talking to Kristen, and with each day that passed the maid became better friends with her. One day, when they had gone to gather herbs, they sat together high up the hillside on a little green, close under the tree. They could look down into the farm place at Formo, 
and see Arnick Gerdson's red jerkin. He had ridden down the valley with them and was to look after their horses while they were up the hillsides seeking herbs. As they sat, Kristen told Lady Oshild of her meeting with the dwarf maiden. She had not thought of it for many years, but now it rose before her, and while she spoke, the thought came to her strangely that there was some likeness betwixt Lady Oshild and the dwarf lady, though she knew well all the time they were not really like. But when she had told all, Lady Oshild sat still a while and looked down the dale. At length she said, you were wise to fly since you were only a child then but have you never heard of folk who took the gold the dwarfs offered and after bound the troll and stone i have heard such tales said kristen but i would never dare to do it and methinks it is not a fair deed tis well when one dares not to do what one doth not think a fair deed said lady oshild laughing a little but it is not so well when one thinks a thing to be no fair deed because one dares not do it you have grown much this summer the lady said of a sudden do you know yourself i wonder that you are like to be fair i said kristen they say i am like my father lady oshild laughed quietly I, <laughs> "'Twould be best for you if you took after Lavrens, both in mind and body, too. "'Yet twould be pity were they to wed you up here in the dale. "'Plainness and country ways let no man scorn, "'but they think themselves, these big folk up here, "'they are so fine that their like is not to be found in Norway's land. "'They wonder much belike that I can live and thrive, though they bar their doors against me but they are lazy and proud and will not learn new ways and they put the blame on the old strife with the king in Svera's days tis all lies your mother's forefather made friends with king Sver, and received gifts from him but were your mother's brother to become one of our king's men and wait upon his court he would have to trim himself up both without and within and that trone would not be at pains to do but you kristen you should be wedded to a man bred in knightly ways and courtesy kristen sat looking down into the formal yard at arna's red back she scarce knew it herself but when lady ossil talked of the world she had once moved in kristen ever thought of the knights and earls in Arne's likeness. Before, when she was little, she had always seen them in her father's shape. My sister's son, Arlon Nicholasson of Husaby, he might have been a fitting bridegroom for you. He has grown comely as the boy. My sister Monhild looked in on me last year as she passed through the dale, and he with her. Ay, tis not like you could get him but i had gladly spread the coverlet over you two in the bridal bed he is as dark-haired as you are fair and he has goodly eyes but if i know my brother-in-law aright he has bethought him already for sure of a better match for arlon than you am i not a good match then asked kristen wondering she had never thought of being hurt by anything Lady Oshild said, but she felt humbled and sad that the lady should be in some way better than her own folks. "'Ay, you are a good match,' said the other. "'Yet you could scarce look to come into my kindred. Your forefather in this land was an outlaw and a stranger, and the yeslings have sat and grown moulded on their farms so long that soon they'll be forgotten outside the dale. But I and my sister had for husbands the nephews of Queen Margaret Skula's daughter. Kristen could not even pluck up heart to say it was not her forefather but his brother who had come to the land an outlaw. 
she sat and gazed at the dark hillsides across the dale and she thought of the day many years gone by when she had been up on the upland wastes and seen how many fells there were twixt her own valley and the outer world then lady osfield said they must go home now and bade her call on arna so Kristen put her hands to her mouth and halloed and waved her kerchief till she saw the red spot in the farm place move and wave back End of chapter 4, part 1「Four Part Two of the Bridal Wreath by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Part Two. Not long after this, Lady Osild went home, but through the autumn and the first part of the winter, she came often to Jorengard to spend some days with Ulfhild. The child was taken out of bed in the daytime now, and they tried to get her to stand, but her legs gave way beneath her when she put her feet to the ground. She was fretful white and weary and the laced jacket of horse-hide and thin withes which lady osfield had made for her plagued her sorely so that she would rather lie still in her mother's lap ranfried had her sick daughter forever in her arms so that tortie's had the whole care of the house now and at her mother's bidding Kristen went with tortie's to learn and to help Kristen longed for lady osfield between whiles and sometimes the lady would chat much with her but at other times the child would wait in vain for a word beyond the other's greeting when she came and when she went lady osfield sat and talked with the grown-up folk only that was always the way when she had her husband with her for it happened now at times that bjorn gunnarsson came with his wife laverns had ridden to haugen one day in the autumn to take the lady her leech's fee it was the very best silver tankard they had in the house with a plate to match he had slept there the night and ever since he praised the farm mightily it was fair and well ordered and not so small as folks would have it he said and within the house all spoke of well-being and the customs of the house were seemly following the ways of great folks houses in the south what he thought of bjorn lavrens said not but he welcomed him fairly at all times when he came with his wife to jorngard but the lady osfield lavrens liked exceeding well and he said he deemed most of the tales that had been told of her were lies he said too twas most sure that twenty years since she could have had small need of witchcraft to bind a man to her she was near the sixties now yet she still looked young and had a most fair and winning bearing Kristen saw well that her mother liked all of this but little of lady osfield it is true ronfried said not but once she likened bjorn to the yellow flattened grass one sometimes finds growing under big stones and Kristen thought this fitted him well bjorn looked strangely faded he was somewhat fat pale and sluggish and a little bald although he was not much older than lavrens yet one saw he had once been a very comely man Kristen never came to speech with him he spoke little and was wont to sit in the same place where he first settled down from the time he stepped into the room till he went to bed he drank hugely but one marked it but little on him he ate scarce any food but gazed now and again at one or another in the room with a fixed brooding look in his strange pale eyes they had seen naught of their kinsfolk at sunbu since the mishap befell though lavrens had been over at varga more times than one but sierra eirik came to jorngard as before and there he often met lady osfield and they were good friends folk thought this was good of the priest for he was himself a very skilful leech that too was doubtless one cause why the folk of the great estates had not sought lady osfield's counsel at least not openly as they held the priest to be skilful enough nor was it easy for them to know how they should bear themselves to folk who had been cast off in a manner by their own kin and fellows sierra eirik said himself they did not graze on one another's meadows and as to her witchcraft he was not her parish priest 
it might well be the lady knew more than was good for her soul's health yet one must not forget ignorant folk were all too ready to talk of witchcraft as soon as a woman was a bit wiser than her neighbours lady oshild on her side praised the priest much and was diligent at church if it chanced she was at jorengard on a holy day yuletide was sorrowful that year Ulfield could not yet put her feet to the ground and they neither heard nor saw aught of the sunbu folk Christen knew that it was talked of in the parish and that her father took it to heart but her mother seemed to care not and Christen thought this wrong of her but one evening toward the end of yuletide came sira sigurd trond gessling's house priest driving in a great sledge and his chief errand was to bid them all to a feast at sunbu sira sigurd was ill-liked in the parishes about for it was he who really managed trond's estates or at the least he got the blame for trant's hard and unjust dealings and there was no denying trant was something of a plague to his tenants his priest was most learned in writing and reckoning versed in the law and a skilful leech if not quite so skilful as he deemed himself but from his ways no one would have thought him over wise he often said foolish things Ranfried and Lavrens had never liked him, but the Sunbu folk, as was but reason, set great store by their priest, and both they and he felt very bitter that he had not been called in to Ulfhild. Now by ill fortune it fell out that when Sira Sigurd came to Jurngard, Lady Oshild and Sir Bjorn were there already, besides Sira Eirik, Gird and Inga of Finsbrecken, Arne's parents, old Jon from Lopsgard, and a preaching friar from Hammer, Brother Auscout. While Ranfried had the tables spread anew with Christmas fare, and Lovrens looked into the letters brought by Sira Sigurd, the priest wished to look at Ulfhild. She was already abed for the night and sleeping, but Sira Sigurd woke her, felt her back and limbs, and asked her many questions, at first gently enough, but then roughly and impatiently as the child grew frightened sigurd was a little man all but a dwarf with a great flaming red face as he made to lift her out upon the floor to test her feet she began screaming loudly on this lady oshild rose went to the bed and covered ulfhild with the skins saying the child was so sleepy she could not have stood upon the floor even had her legs been strong the priest began then to speak loudly he too was reckoned to know somewhat of leechcraft but lady oshild took him by the hand brought him forward to the high seat and fell to telling him what she had done for ulfhild and asking his judgment on each and every matter on this he grew somewhat milder of mood and ate and drank of ranfried's good cheer but as the beer and wine began to mount to his head sira sigurd's humour changed again and he grew quarrelsome and hot-headed he knew well enough there was no one in the room who liked him first he turned on gert he was the bishop of hammer's bailiff in vaga and seal and there had been many quarrels twixt the bishops c and trant ivarsen gird said not much but inga was a fiery woman and then brother auscout joined in and spoke you should not forget sira sigurd our reverend father ingjald is your overlord too we know enough of you in hamar you wallow in all good things at sunbu never thinking that you are vowed to other work than to do tron eye service helping him in all wrong and injustice to the peril of his soul and the minishing of the rites of holy church have you never heard how it fares with the false and unruly priests who hatch out devices against their spiritual fathers and those in authority what you not of that time when the angels took st thomas of canterbury to the door of hell and let him peep in he wondered much that he saw none of the priests who had set themselves up against him as you have set yourself against your bishop he was about to praise god's mercy for the holy man begrudged not salvation to all sinners but at that the angel bade the devil lift his tail a little and out there came with a great bang and a foul smell of sulphur 
all the priests and learned men who had wrought against the good of the church thus did he come to know whither they had gone there you lie monk said the priest i have heard that tale too only they were not priests but beggar monks who came from the rear of the devil like wasps out of a wasp nest old yon laughed louder than all the serving folk and roared there were both sorts i'll be bound then the devil must have a fine broad tail said bjorn gunnarsson and lady osild smiled and said i have you not heard that all evil drags a long tail behind it be still lady osild cried sira sigurd do not you talk of the long tail evil drags after it you sit here as though you were mistress in the house and not ronfried but tis strange you could not help her child have you no more of that strong water you dealt in once which could make whole the sheep already boiling in the pot and turn women to maids in the bridal bed think you i know not of the wedding in this very parish where you made a bath for the bride that was no maid sira eirik sprang up gripped the other priest by the shoulder and thigh and flung him right over the table so that the jugs and tankards were overturned and food and drink ran upon the cloths and floor while sira sigurd lay his length upon the ground with torn garments eirik leaped over the board and would have struck him again roaring above the tumult hold your filthy mouth priest of hell that you are lavrens strove to part them but Anfried stood white as death by the board and wrung her hands then lady osild ran and helped sira sigurd to his feet and wiped the blood from his face she poured a beaker of mead down his throat saying you must not be so strict sira eirik that you cannot bear to listen to jesting so far on in a drinking bout seat yourself now and you shall hear of that wedding "'Twas not here in the dale at all, nor had I the good fortune to be the one that knew of that water. Could I have brewed it, I trow we would not be sitting now on the hillcroft in the wilds. I might have been a rich woman and had lands in the great rich parishes, nigh to town and cloisters and bishop and chapter. And she smiled at the three churchmen but tis said sure enough that the art was known in the olden days and the lady told a merry tale of a misadventure that befell in king inga's time when the magic wash was used by mistake by the wrong woman and of what followed thereon great was the laughter in the room and both geard and yon shouted for more such tales from lady arsild but the lady said no here sit two priests and brother ausgot and young lads and serving maids tis best we cease before the talk grows unseemly and gross let us bear in mind tis a holy day the men made an outcry but the women held with lady osild no one saw that ronfried had left the room soon after it was time that kristin who sat lowest on the woman's bench among the serving maids should go to bed she was sleeping in Tordy's house. There were so many guests in the manor. It was biting cold, and the northern lights flamed and flickered over the brows of the fells to the north. The snow crackled under Kristen's feet as she ran over the courtyard, shivering, her arms crossed on her breast. Then she was aware of a woman in the shadow of the old loft, walking hurriedly to and fro in the snow, throwing her arms about, wringing her hands, and wailing aloud. Kristen saw it was her mother, and ran to her, affrighted, asking if she were ill. No, no, burst out Ranfried. But I could not stay within. Go you to bed, child. As Kristen turned away, her mother called her softly. Go back to the room and lie beside your father and Ulfild. Take her in your arms so that he may not roll upon her by mischance. He sleeps so heavily when he has drunk deep. I am going up to sleep in the old loft room tonight. Jesus, mother, said Kristen, you will freeze to death if you lie there, alone too, 
and what think you father will say if you come not to bed to-night he will not mark it answered her mother he was all but asleep when i left and to-morrow he will waken late go and do as i have said twill be so cold for you said Kristen, whimpering but her mother sent her away a little more kindly and shut herself into the loft room within it was as cold as without and it was pitch dark ranfried groped her way to the bed pulled off her headdress undid her shoes and crept in among the skins they chilled her to the bone it was like sinking into a snowdrift she pulled the skins over her head and drew her knees up to her chin and thrust her hands into her bosom so she lay and wept now quite low with flowing tears now crying aloud and grinding her teeth but in time she had warmed the bed around her so much that she grew drowsy and at last wept herself to sleep end of chapter four part two Chapter Five, Part One of *The Bridal Wreath* by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, Part One. The year that Kristin was fifteen in the spring, Lavrens Bjorgelson and Sir Andres Gudmundsson of Diffrin made a tryst at the holidest thing. There it was agreed between them that Andres' second son Simon should wed Kristin Lavrens' daughter, and should have formal sir andre's mother's udal estate this the two men shook hands upon yet it was not put in writing for sir andre's had first to settle with his other children about their heritage and for this reason no betrothal feast was held but sir andre's and simon came to uringard to see the bride and lavrens gave them a great banquet by this time Lavrens had ready his new dwelling-house of two stories, with corner fireplaces of masonry, both in the living-room and the loft-room above, richly furnished and adorned with fair wood-carvings. He had rebuilt the old loft-room, too, and bettered the other houses in many ways, so that he was now housed as befitted an esquire bearing arms. He was very wealthy now, for he had had good fortune in his undertakings, and was a shrewd and careful husband of his goods. Above all was he known as a breeder of the finest horses, and the goodliest cattle of all kinds. And now he had been able so to order things that his daughter was to wed into the Diffrin kindred and the formal estate. All folks deemed he had brought to a happy end his purpose to be the foremost man in the countryside. He and Ranfried, too, were well pleased with the betrothal, as were Sir Andres and Simon. Kristen was a little cast down when she first saw Simon Andresen, for she had heard great talk of his good looks and seemly bearing, so that she had outrun all measure in her hopes of what her bridegroom would be truly simon was well favoured but he was something fat to be only twenty years of age he was short of neck and had a face as round and shining as the moon he had goodly hair brown and curly and his eyes were grey and clear but lay deep and as it were shut in the lids were so fat his nose was over small and his mouth was small too and pouting but not unsightly in spite of his stoutness he was light and quick and nimble in all his ways and was skilled in all sports he was something too brisk and forward in his speech but lavrens held he showed both good wit and learning when he talked with older men ranfried soon came to like him and ulfild was taken at once with the greatest love for him he was more gentle and kind with the little sick maid than with any other and when Kristen had grown used a little to his round face and his way of speech, she grew to be well content with her betrothed, and happy in the way her father had ordered things for her. Lady Oshild was at the feast. Since Urengard had opened its doors to her, the great folk in the parishes round about had begun to call to mind her high birth, and to think less of her doubtful fame, so that the lady came much out among people she said when she had seen simon 
"'Tis a good match, Kristen. This Simon will go forward in the world. You will be spared many cares, and he will be good to live with. <laughs> but to my mind he seems something too fat and too cheerful. Were it now in Norway, as it was in days gone by, and as it is still in other lands that folk were not more hard to sinners than is god himself i would say you should find yourself a friend who is lean and sorrowful one you could have to sit and hold converse with then would i say you could not fare better than you would with simon Kristen grew red though she understood not well what the lady's words might mean but as time went on and her bridal chests filled and she evermore heard talk of her wedding and of what she was to take into the new household she began to long that the betrothal knot should be tied once for all and that simon should come north thus she thought much about him in the end and was glad at the thought of meeting him again Kristen was full-grown now and very fair to look upon she was most like her father and had grown tall she was small-waisted with slender fine limbs and joints yet round and plump withal her face was somewhat short and round her forehead low and broad and white as milk her eyes large gray and soft under fairly drawn eyebrows her mouth was something large but it had full bright red lips and her chin was round as an apple and well shaped she had goodly long thick hair but twas something dark in hue almost as much brown as yellow and quite straight laverns liked nothing better than to hear sierra eirik boast of Kristen. the priest had seen the maid grow up had taught her her books and writing and loved her much but the father was not so pleased when the priest sometimes likened his daughter to an unblemished silken-coated filly yet all men said that had not that sorrowful mishap befallen Ulfhild had been many times more comely than her sister she had the fairest and sweetest face white and red as lilies and roses and light yellow hair soft as silk which waved and clung about her slender throat and small shoulders her eyes were like those of her yesling kin they were deep-set under straight dark brows and were clear as water and grey-blue but her glance was mild not sharp like theirs then too the child's voice was so clear and lovely that it was a joy to hearken to her whether she spoke or sang she was most apt at book learning and all kinds of string instruments and draughts but had little mind to work with her hands for her back soon grew weary there seemed little hope indeed this fair child should ever have full use of her limbs it is true she had mended a little after her father and mother had been to Nidaros with her to St. Olaf's shrine. Lavrens and Ranfried had gone thither on foot, without man or serving-maid to attend them. They bore the child between them on a litter the whole way. After the journey, Ulfred grew so far well that she could walk a little with a crutch. But they could not hope that she should grow well enough to be wedded, and so it was like that when the time came she must be given to a cloister with all the wealth that should fall to her they never spoke of this and ulfhild herself scarce knew how much unlike she was to other children she was very fond of finery and pretty clothes and her father and mother had not the heart to deny her anything so ranfried stitched and sewed for her and decked her out like any king's child once some peddlers passing through the parish lay overnight at laugerbru and ulfhild got a sight of their wares there they had some amber-coloured silk stuff and she set her heart on having a shift of it laverance was not wont to deal with such folk who went around against the law selling wares from the market towns in the country parishes but now he bought the whole bale at once he gave Kristen some of the stuff, too, for a bridal shift, and she was sewing on it this summer. Until now, all the shifts she owned had been of wool, or of linen, for best wear. But now Ulfhild had a shift of silk, for feast days, and a Sunday shift of linen, with silk let in above. 
Lavrens Bjorgolfsson owned Lagerbru too now, and Torti Senyon were in charge there. With them was Lavrens and Ranfried's youngest daughter, Ramborg, whom Tortis had nursed. Ranfried would scarce look at the child for some time after it was born, for she said she brought her children ill fortune. Yet she loved the little maid much, and was ever sending gifts to her and Tortis. And later she went often over to Laugerbru and saw Ramborg. But she liked best to come after the child was asleep and sit by her. Lavrens and the two older daughters were often at Laugerbru to play with the little one. She was a strong and healthy child, but not so fair as her sisters. This was the last summer Arne Gertsen was on Jurngard. The bishop had promised Gert to help the youth on in the world and in the autumn Arne was to set out for Hammer. Christa knew well enough that she was dear to Arne, but she was in many ways still a child in mind, and she thought little about it, but bore herself to him as she had always done from the time they were children, was with him as often as she could, and always stood up with him when there was dancing at home or upon the church green. That her mother did not like this seemed to her something of a jest, but she never spoke to Arne of Simon or of her wedding, for she marked that he grew heavy-hearted when there was talk of it. Arne was a very handy man, and was now making Kristen a sewing chair as a keepsake. He had covered both the box and the frame of the chair with fair, rich carving, and was now busy in the smithy on iron bands and lock for it. On a fine evening well on in summer, Kristen had gone down to him. She had taken with her a jacket of her father's she had to mend, and sat upon the stone threshold sewing, while she chatted with the youth in the smithy. Ulfhild was with her. She hopped about upon her crutch, eating the raspberries which grew among the heaps of stone around the field. After a while Arne came to the smithy door to cool himself. He made as though to sit himself beside Kristen but she moved a little away and bade him have a care not to dirty the sewing she had upon her knee is it come to this between us said arne that you dare not let me sit by you for fear the peasant boy should soil you kristen looked at him in wonder and answered you know well enough what i meant but take your apron off wash the charcoal from your hands and sit down a little and rest you here by me and she made room for him. But Arne laid himself in the grass in front of her. Then she said again, <laughs> Nay, be not angry, my Arne. Can you think I could be unthankful for the brave gift you are making me, or ever forget that you have been my best friend at home here all my days? Have I been that? he asked. You know it well, said Kristen and never will i forget you but you who are to go out into the world maybe you will gain wealth and honor or ever you think you will like enough forget me long before i forget you you will never forget me said arne smiling and i will forget you ere you forget me <laughs> you are not but a child kristin you are not so old either she replied i am as old as simon dara said he again and we bear helm and shield as well as the different folk but my folks have not had fortune with them he had dried his hands on the grass tufts and now he took kristin's ankle and pressed his cheek to the foot which showed from under her dress she would have drawn away her foot but arne said your mother is at laugerbru and lavrens has ridden forth from the houses none can see us where we sit surely you can let me speak this once of what is in my heart kristin answered we have known all our days both you and i that twas bootless for us to set our hearts on each other may i lay my head in your lap said arne and as she did not answer he laid his head down and twined an arm about her waist with his other hand he pulled at the plaits of her hair how will you like it he asked in a little when simon lies in your lap thus and plays with your hair 
Kristen did not answer. It seemed as though a heaviness fell upon her of a sudden. Arnie's words and Arnie's head on her knee. It seemed to her as though a door opened into a room where many dark passages led into a greater darkness. Sad and heavy at heart, she faltered and would not look inside. What did folk do not use to do so? said she of a sudden, quickly, as if eased of a weight. She tried to see Simon's fat, round face looking up into hers, as Arne was looking now. She heard his voice, and she could not keep from laughing. I trow Simon will never lie on the ground to play with my shoes. Not he. No, for he can play with you in his bed, said Arne. His voice made her feel sick and powerless all at once. She tried to push his head from off her lap, but he pressed it against her knee and said softly, But I would play with your shoes and your hair and your fingers and follow you out and in the livelong day, Kristen. Were you ever so much my wife and slept in my arms each single night? He half sat up, put his arm round her shoulder, and gazed into her eyes. "'Tis not well done of you to talk thus to me,' said Kristen bashfully in a low voice. "'No,' said Arne. He rose and stood before her. "'But tell me one thing. Would you not rather it were I?' "'Oh, I would rather—' She sat still a while— I would rather not have any man, not yet. Arnie did not move, but said, Would you rather be given to the cloister, then, as tis to be with Ulfhild, and be a maid all your days? Kristen pressed her folded hands down into her lap. A strange, sweet trembling seized her, and with a sudden shudder she seemed to understand how much her little sister was to be pitied her eyes filled with tears of sorrow for Ulfhild's sake. Kristen, said Arne, in a low voice. At that moment a loud scream came from Ulfhild. Her crutch had caught between the stones, and she had fallen. Arne and Kristen ran to her, and Arne lifted her up into her sister's arms. She had cut her mouth, and much blood was flowing from the hurt. Kristen sat down with her in the smithy door, and Arnie fetched water in a wooden bowl. Together they set to washing and wiping her face. She had rubbed the skin off her knees, too. Kristen bent tenderly over the small, thin legs. Ulfhild's wailing soon grew less, but she wept silently and bitterly, as children do who are used to suffering pain. Kristen held her head to her bosom and rocked her gently. Then the bell began to ring for vespers up at Olaf's church. Arne spoke to Kristen, but she sat bent over her sister, as though she neither heard nor marked him, so that at last he grew afraid and asked if she thought there was danger in the hurt. Kristen shook her head, but looked not at him. Soon after she got up and went towards the farmstead, bearing Ulfhild in her arms, Arne followed, silent and troubled, Kristen seemed so deep in thought, and her face was set and hard. As she walked, the bell went on ringing out over the meadows and the dale. It was still ringing as she went into the house. She laid Ulfhild in the bed, which the sisters had shared ever since Kristen had grown too big to sleep by her father and mother. She slipped her shoes off and lay down beside the little one lay and listened for the ringing of the bell long after it was hushed and the child slept it had come to her as the bell began to ring while she sat with Ulfhild's little bleeding face in her hands that maybe it was a sign to her if she should go to convent in her sister's stead if she should vow herself to the service of god and the virgin mary might not god give the child health and strength again she thought of brother edwin's word that nowadays twas only marred and crippled children and those for whom good husbands could not be found that their fathers and mothers gave to god she knew her father and mother were godly folks yet had she never heard aught else but that she should wed 
but when they understood that Ulfhild would be sickly all her days, they planned for her straightway that she should go to the cloister. And she had no mind to go herself. She strove against the thought that God would do a miracle for Ulfhild if she herself turned none. She hung on Sira Eirik's word that in these days not many miracles come to pass. And yet she felt this evening it was, as Brother Edwin said, had a man but faith enough, his faith might work miracles. But she had no mind to have that faith herself. She did not love God and his mother and the saints so much, did not even wish to love them so. She loved the world and longed for the world. Kristen pressed her lips down into Ulfhild's soft silken hair. The child slept soundly, and the elder sister sat up restlessly, but lay down again. Her heart bled with sorrow and shame, but she knew she did not wish to believe in signs and wonders, for she would not give up her heritage of health and beauty and love. So she tried to comfort herself with the thought that her father and mother would not be willing she should do such a thing, nor would they think it could avail. Then, too, she was promised already, and she was sure they would not give up Simon, of whom they were so fond. She felt a betrayal of herself, that they were so proud of this son-in-law. Of a sudden she thought with dislike of Simon's round red face and small laughing eyes. Of his jaunty gait, he bounced like a ball. It came to her all at once. Of his bantering talk that made her feel awkward and foolish. "'Twas no such glory either to get him "'and move with him just down to Formo. "'Still, she would rather have him "'than be sent to convent. "'But, ah, the world beyond the hills, "'the king's palace and the earls and knights "'Lady Oshild talked of, "'and a comely man with sorrowful eyes "'who would follow her in and out "'and never grow weary, she thought of Arne that summer day when he lay on his side and slept with his brown glossy hair outspread among the heather. She had loved him then as though he were her brother. It was not well done of him to have spoken to her so, when he knew they could never belong to one another. Word came from Laugerbru that her mother would stay there overnight. Kristen got up to undress and go to rest. She began to unlace her dress then she put her shoes on again, threw her cloak about her, and went out. End of chapter 5, part 1Chapter 5, Part 2 of The Bridal Wreath by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 2 The night sky stretched clear and green above the hill crests. It was near time for the moon to rise, and where it was yet hid, behind the fell, sailed some small clouds, their lower edges shining like silver. The sky grew brighter and brighter, like metal under gathering drops of dew. She ran up between the fences, over the road, and up the slope toward the church. It stood there as though asleep, dark and shut, but she went up to the cross, which stood nearby to mark the place where St. Olaf once rested as he fled before his enemies. Kristen knelt down upon the stone and laid her folded hands upon the base of the cross. Holy cross, strongest of masts, fairest of trees, bridge for the sick to the fair shores of health. At the words of the prayer, it was as if her longing widened out and faded little by little like rings on a pool. The single thoughts that troubled her smoothed themselves out one after the other. Her mind grew calmer, more tender, and there came upon her a gentle, vague sadness in place of her distress. She lay kneeling there and drank in all the sounds of the night. The wind sighed strangely. The rushing sound of the river came from beyond the wood by the church. The beck ran nearby, right across the road, and all about, far and near in the dark, she half saw and heard small rills of running and dripping water. The river gleamed white down below in the valley. The moon crept up in a little nick in the hills. 
the dewy leaves and stones sparkled faintly and the newly tarred timber of the belfry shone dull and dark by the churchyard gate then the moon was hid once more where the mountain ridge rose higher and now many more white and shining clouds floated in the sky she heard a horse coming at a slow pace from higher up the road and the sound of men's voices speaking low and even she had no fear of folk here close at home where she knew everyone so she felt quite safe her father's dogs rushed at her turned and dashed back into the wood then turned back and leaped upon her again her father shouted a greeting as he came out from among the birches he was leading goldsvinen by the bridle a brace or two of birds hung dangling from the saddle and lavrens bore a hooded hawk upon his left wrist he had with him a tall bent man in a monk's frock and even before Kristen had seen his face she knew it was brother edwin she went to meet them wondering no more than if it had been a dream she only smiled when lavrens asked whether she knew their guest again lavrens had chanced upon him by the rost bridge and had coaxed him home with him to spend the night but brother edwin would have it they must let him lie in an outhouse for i am grown so lousy said he you cannot put me in the good beds and for all lavrens talked and begged the monk held out nay at first he would have it they should give him his food out in the courtyard but at last they got him into the hall with them and Kristen made up the fire in the fireplace in the corner and set candles on the board while a serving-maid brought in meat and drink the monk seated himself on the beggar's bench by the door and would have naught but cold porridge and water for his supper neither would he have aught of lavrens proffered to have a bath made ready for him and have his clothes well washed brother edwin fidgeted and scratched himself and laughed all over his lean old face nay nay said he these things bite into my proud hide better than either whips or the guardian's words i have been sitting under a rock up here among the fells all summer they gave me leave to go out into the wilderness to fast and pray and there i sat and thought now was i like a holy hermit indeed and the poor folk away and set not all came up with food for me and thought here they saw in very truth a godly and clean living monk brother edvin they said were there many such monks as you we would be better men fast enough but when we see priests and bishops and monks biting and fighting like young swine in a trough i i told them it was unchristianlike to talk so but i liked to hear it well enough and i sang and i prayed till the mountain rang again now will it be wholesome for me to feel the lice biting and fighting upon my skin and to hear the good housewives who would have all clean and seemly in their houses cry out that dirty pig of a monk can lie out in the barn well enough now tis summer i am for northwards now to nidaros for saint olaf's vigil and twill be well for me to mark that folk are none too fain to come nigh me ulfhild woke and lavrens went and lifted her up and wrapped her in his cloak here is the child i spoke of dear father lay your hands upon her and pray to god for her as you prayed for the boy away north in meldal who we heard got his health again the monk lifted ulfhild's chin gently and looked into her face and then he raised one of her hands and kissed it pray rather you and your wife lavrens bjorgolfsson that you be not tempted to try and bend god's will concerning this child our lord jesus himself has set these small feet upon the path which will lead her most surely to the home of peace i see it by your eyes you blessed ulfield you have your intercessors in our second home the boy in meldal got well i have heard said lavrens in a low voice he was a poor widow's only child 
and there was none but the parish to feed or clothe him when his mother should be gone and yet the woman prayed only that god might give her a fearless heart so that she might have faith he would bring that to pass which would be best for the lad not else did i do but join in that prayer of hers tis hard for her mother and for me to rest content with this answered lavrens heavily the more that she is so fair and so good have you seen the child at lidstad south in the dale asked the monk would you rather your daughter had been like that lavrens shuddered and pressed the child close to him think you not said brother edvin again that in god's eyes we are all children he has cause to grieve for crippled as we are with sin and yet we deem not we are so badly off in this world he went to the picture of the virgin mary upon the wall and all knelt down while he said the evening prayer it seemed to them that brother edwin had given them good comfort but none the less after he had gone from the room to seek his place of rest ostrid the head serving wench swept with care all parts of the floor where the monk had stood and cast the sweepings at once into the fire next morning christen rose early took milk porridge and wheat cakes in a goodly dish of flame grained birch wood for she knew that the monk never touched meat and herself bore the food out to him but few of the folk were yet about in the houses brother edwin stood upon the bridge of the cowhouse ready for the road with staff and scrip with a smile he thanked christen for her pains and sat himself down on the grass and ate while christen sat at his feet her little white dog came running up the little bells on his collar tinkling she took him into her lap and brother edwin snapped his fingers at him threw small bits of wheat cake into his mouth and praised him mightily the while tis a breed queen euphemia brought to the country said he you are passing fine here on your guard now both in great things and small christen flushed with pleasure she knew already the dog was of a fine breed and she was proud of having it no one else in the parish had a lap dog but she had not known it was of the same kind as the queen's pet dogs simon andresen sent him to me said she and pressed it to her while it licked her face his name is cortelin she had thought to speak to the monk about her trouble and to pray for his counsel but she had no longer any wish to let her mind dwell on the thoughts of the past evening brother edwin was sure god would turn all things to the best for ulfhild and it was good of simon to send her such a gift before even their betrothal was fixed arne she would not think of he had not borne himself as he should towards her she thought brother edwin took his staff and scrip and bade christen greet those within the house he would not stay till folk were up but go while the day was yet cool she went with him up past the church and a little way into the wood when they parted he wished her god's peace and blessed her give me a word like the word you gave to ulfhild dear father begged christen as she stood with his hand in hers the monk rubbed his naked foot knotted with gout in the wet grass then would i bid you daughter that you lay to heart how god cares for folks good here in the dale little rain falls here but he has given you water from the fells and the dew freshens meadow and field each night thank god for the good gifts he has given you and murmur not if you seem to miss aught you think might well be added to you you have bonny yellow hair see you fret not because it does not curl have you not heard of the old wife who sat and wept for that she had only a small bite of swine's flesh to give to her seven little ones for christmas cheer but at the moment st olaf came riding by and he stretched out his hand over the meat and prayed that god might give the poor little ravens their fill but when the woman saw a whole pig's carcass lying upon the board she wept that she had not pots and platters enough christen ran homewards with cortelin dancing at her heels 
snapping at the hem of her dress and barking and ringing all his little silver bells. End of chapter 5, part 2《Chapter Six of the Bridal Wreath by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Six Arne stayed at home at Finsbrecken the last days before he was to set out for Hammer. His mother and sisters were making ready his clothes. The day before he was to ride southward, he came to Jurngard to bid farewell, and he made a chance to whisper to Kristen, would she meet him on the road south of Laugerbru next evening? I would so fain we two should be alone the last time we are together, said he. Does it seem such a great thing that I ask? After all, we were brought up together like brother and sister, he said, when Kristen hung doubtful a little, before making reply. So she promised to come, if she could slip away from home. It snowed next morning, but through the day it turned to rain, and soon roads and fields were a sea of gray mud. Wreaths of mist hung and drifted along the lower hillsides. Now and then they sank yet lower and gathered into white rollers along the roots of the hills, and then the thick rain clouds closed in again. Sierra Eirik came over to help Lavrens draw up some deeds. They went down to the hearth room, for in such weather it was pleasanter there than in the great hall, where the fireplace filled the room with smoke. Ranfried was at Laugerbru, where Ramborg was now getting better of a fever she had caught early in the autumn. Thus it was not hard for Kristen to slip away unseen, but she dared not take a horse, so she went on foot. The road was a quagmire of snow slush and withered leaves. There was a saddening breath of death and decay in the raw, chill air, and now and again there came a gust of wind driving the rain into her face. She drew her hood well down over her head, and holding her cloak about her with both hands, went quickly forward. She was a little afraid. The roar of the river sounded so hollow in the heavy air, and the clouds drove dark and ragged over the hill crests. Now and again she halted and listened for Arne's coming. After a time she heard the splashing of hoofs upon the slushy road behind her, and she stopped then where she was for this was a somewhat lonely spot, and she thought twas a good place for them to say their farewells in quiet. Almost at once she saw the horseman coming, and Arne sprang from his horse and led it as he came to meet her. "'Twas kindly done of you to come,' said he, in this ugly weather. "'Tis worse for you, who have so far to ride. And how is it you set out so late?' she asked. "'Yon has bidden me to lie the night at Lopsgard answered arne i thought twas easier for you to meet me at this time of day they stood silent for a time kristen thought she had never seen before how fair a youth arne was he had on a smooth steel cap and under that a brown woolen hood that sat tight about his face and spread out over his shoulders under it his narrow face showed bright and comely his leather jerkin was old spotted with rust and rubbed by the coat of mail which had been worn above it arne had taken it over from his father but it fitted closely to his slim lithe and powerful body and he had a sword at his side and in his hand a spear his other weapons hung from his saddle he was full grown now and bore himself manfully she laid her hand upon his shoulder and said mind you arne you asked me once if i thought you as good a man as simon andresen now will i tell you one thing before we part tis that you seem to me as much above him in looks and bearing as he is reckoned above you in birth and riches by those who look most to such things why, why do you tell me this asked arne breathlessly because brother edwin told me to lay to heart that we should thank god for his good gifts and not be like the woman when St. Olaf added to her meat, and she wept because she had not trenchers to put it in. So you should not grieve that he has not given you as much of riches as of bodily gifts. Was it that you meant? said Arne. And then, as she was silent, he said, I wondered if you meant that you would rather be wedded to me than to the other. That I would, truly said she in a low voice 
i know you better arnie threw his arms around her so that her feet were lifted from the ground he kissed her face many times and then set her down again god help us kristen what a child you are she stood and hung her head but left her hands upon his shoulders he caught her wrists and held them tight i see how tis with you my sweeting you little know how sore i am at heart to lose you kristen you know we have grown up together like two apples on one branch i loved you long before i began to understand that one day another would come and break you from me as sure as god suffered death for us all i know not how i can ever be happy in this world after to-day kristen wept bitterly and lifted her face so that he might kiss her do not talk so my arnie she begged and patted him on the shoulder kristen said arnie in a low voice and took her into his arms again think you not that if you begged your father lavrens is so good a man he would not force you against your will if you begged him but to let you wait a few years no one knows how fortune may turn for me we are both of us so young oh i fear i must do as they wish at home she wept and now weeping came upon arnie too you you know not kristen how dear you are to me he hid his face upon her shoulder if you did and if you cared for me for sure you would go to laverne's and beg hard i cannot do it she sobbed i could never come to love any man so much as to go against my father and mother for his sake she groped with her hands for his face under the hood and the heavy steel cap do not cry so arnie my dearest friend you must take this at least said he after a time giving her a little brooch and and think of me sometimes for i shall never forget you nor my grief it was all dark when kristen and arne had said their last farewell she stood and looked after him when at length he rode away a streak of yellow light shone through a rift in the clouds and was reflected in the footprints where they had walked and stood in the slush on the road it all looked so cold and sorrowful she thought she drew up her linen neckerchief and dried her tear-stained face then turned and went homeward she was wet and cold and walked quickly after a time she heard someone coming along the road behind her she was a little frightened even on such a night as this there might be strange folk journeying on the highway and she had a lonely stretch before her a great black scree rose right up on one side and on the other the ground fell steeply and there was fir forest all the way down to the leaden-hued river in the bottom of the dale so she was glad when the man behind her called to her by name and she stood still and waited the newcomer was a tall thin man in a dark surcoat with lighter sleeves as he came nearer she saw he was dressed as a priest and carried an empty wallet on his back and now she knew him to be bentain priest's son as they called him sierra eirik's daughter's son she saw at once that he was far gone in drink ay one goes and another comes said he laughing when they had greeted one another i met arne a brecon even now i see you are weeping you might as well smile a little now i am come home we have been friends too ever since we were children have we not tis an ill exchange methinks getting you into the parish in his stead said kristen bluntly she had never liked bentain and so i fear will many think your grandfather here has been so glad you were in oslo making such a fair beginning oh ay said bentain with a nickering laugh so twas a fair beginning i was making you think i was even like a pig in a wheat-field kristen and the end was the same i was hunted out with cudgels and the hue and cry <laughs> tis no great thing the gladness my grandfather gets from his offspring 
but what a mighty hurry you are in i am cold said christen curtly not colder than i said the priest i have no more clothes on me than you see here my cloak i had to sell for food and beer in little hammer now you should still have some heat in your body from making your farewells with arnie methinks you should let me get under your fur with you and he caught her cloak pulled it over his shoulders and gripped her round the waist with his wet arm Kristen was so amazed with his boldness it was a moment before she could gather her wits then she strove to tear herself away but he had a hold of her cloak and it was fastened together by a strong silver clasp bentain got his arms about her again and made to kiss her his mouth nearly touching her chin she tried to strike but he held her fast by the upper arm i trow you have lost your wits she hissed as she struggled dare you to lay hands on me as i were a <sighs> dearly shall you rue this to-morrow dastard that you are nay to-morrow you will not be so foolish says bentain putting his leg in front of her so that she half fell into the mud and pressing one hand over her mouth yet she had no thought of crying out now for the first time it flashed on her mind what he dared to want with her but rage came upon her so wild and furious she had scarce a thought of fear she snarled like an animal at grips with another and fought furiously with the man as he tried to hold her down while the ice-cold snow water soaked through her clothes on to her burning skin to-morrow you will have wit enough to hold your tongue said bentain and if it cannot be hidden you can put the blame on arne twill be believed the sooner just then one of his fingers got into her mouth and at once she bit it with all her might so that bentain shrieked and let go his hold quick as lightning Kristen got one hand free seized his face with it and pressed her thumb with all her might against the ball of one of his eyes he roared out and rose to his knees like a cat she slipped from his grasp threw herself upon him so that he fell upon his back and turning rushed along the road with the mud splashing over her at every bound she ran and ran without looking back she heard bentain coming after and she ran till her heart thumped in her throat while she moaned softly and strained her eyes forward should she never reach lagerbru at last she was out on the road where it passed through the fields she saw the group of houses down on the hill slope and at the same moment she bethought her that she durst not run in there where her mother was in the state she was now in plastered with clay and withered leaves from head to foot and with her clothing torn to rags she marked that bentain was gaining upon her and on that she bent down and took up two great stones she threw them when he came near enough one struck him with such force it felled him to the ground then she ran on again and stayed not before she stood upon the bridge all trembling she stood and clutched the railing of the bridge a darkness came before her eyes and she feared she would drop down in a swoon but then she thought of bentain what if he should come and find her shaken with rage and shame she went onwards though her legs would scarce bear her and now she felt her face smart where fingernails had scarred it and felt too she had hurts upon both back and arms her tears came hot as fire she wished bentain might have been killed by the stone she had thrown she wished she had gone back and made an end of him she felt for her knife but found that she must have lost it then again came the thought she must not be seen at home as she was and so it came into her mind that she would go to ramengard she would complain to sira eirik but the priest had not come back yet from jorengard in the kitchen house she found gunhild bentain's mother the woman was alone and Kristen told her how her son had dealt with her but that she had gone out to meet arne she did not tell her when she saw that gunhild thought she had been at laugerbru she left her to think so 
gunhild said little but wept a great deal while she washed the mud off christen's clothes and sewed up the worst rents and the girl was so shaken she paid no heed to the covert glances gunhild cast on her now and then when christen went gunhild took her cloak and went out with her but took the way to the stables christen asked her whither she was going surely i may have leave to ride down and look after my son answered the woman see whether you have killed him with that stone of yours or how it fares with him there seemed to be naught christen could answer to this so she said only that gunhild should see to it that bentain got out of the parish as soon as might be and kept out of her sight or i will speak of this to lavrens and you can guess i trow what would happen then and indeed bentain went southward not more than a week later he carried letters from sierra eirik to the bishop of hammer begging the bishop to find work for him or otherwise to help him End of chapter six chapter seven part one of the bridal wreath by sigrid unset this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven part one one day at yuletide simon andresen came riding to urengard a quite unlooked-for guest he craved pardon for coming thus unbidden and alone without his kinsfolk but sir andres was in sweden on the king's business he himself had been home at Diffrin for a time but only his young sisters and his mother who lay ill abed were there so time had hung on his hands and a great longing had taken him to look in upon them up here ranfried and lavrens thanked him much for having made this long journey in the depth of winter the more they saw of simon the more they liked him he knew of all that had passed between andres and lavrens and it was now fixed that his and christen's betrothal ale should be drunk before the beginning of lent if sir andres should be home by that time but if not then as soon as easter was past christen was quiet and downcast when with her betrothed she found not much to talk of with him one evening when they had all been sitting drinking he asked her to go out with him a little into the cool then as they stood on the balcony in front of the upper hall he put his arm round her waist and kissed her after that he did the same often when they were alone it gave her no gladness but she suffered him to do it since she knew the betrothal was a thing that must come she thought of her wedding now only as something which she must go through with not as something she wished for none the less she liked simon well enough most though when he talked with others and did not touch or talk with her she had been so unhappy through this whole autumn it was of no use however often she told herself bentain had been able to do her no harm none the less she felt herself soiled and shamed nothing could be the same as it had been before since a man had dared try to wreak such a will on her she lay awake of nights and burned with shame and could not stop thinking of it she felt bentain's body close against hers as when they fought his hot beery breath she could not help thinking of what might have happened and she thought with a shudder through all her body of what he had said how ernie would get the blame if it could not be hidden there rushed through her mind all that would have followed if such a calamity had befallen and then folk had heard of her meeting with arnie what if her father and mother had believed such a thing of arnie and arnie himself she saw him as she had seen him that last evening and she felt as though she sank crushed before him at the very thought that she might have dragged him down with her into sorrow and disgrace and then she had such ugly dreams she had heard tell in church and in holy stories of fleshly lusts and the temptations of the body but they had meant naught to her now it was become real to her that she herself and all mankind had a sinful carnal body which enmeshed the soul and ate into it with hard bonds 
then she would think out for herself how she might have killed or blinded Bentane. It was the only solace she could find to sate herself with dreams of revenge upon the dark, hateful man who stood always in the way of her thoughts. But this did not help for long. She lay by Ulfhild's side of nights and wept bitter tears at the thought of all this that had been brought upon her by brute force. Bentane had not failed altogether. He had wrought scathe to the maidenhood of her spirit. The first workday after Christmas, all the women on Jurengard were busy in the kitchen house. Ranfried and Kristen had been there, too, for most of the day. Late in the evening, while some of the women were clearing up after the baking, and others making ready for supper, the dairymaid came rushing in, shrieking and wringing her hands. Jesus, Jesus, did ever any hear such a dreadful thing? They are bringing Arne Gertsen home, dead, on a sleigh. God help Gert and Inga in this misery. A man who dwelt in a cottage a little way down the road came in with Halvden. It was these two who had met the beer. The women crowded round them. Outside the circle stood Kristen, white and shaking. Halvdan, Lavren's own body servant, who had known Arnie from his boyhood, wept aloud as he told the story. It was Bentane, priest's son, who had killed Arnie. On New Year's Eve the men of the bishop's household were sitting and drinking in the men's hall, and Bentane had come in. He had been given a clerkship now with the Corpus Christi Prebendri. The men did not want him amongst them at first, but he had put Arne in mind that they were both from the same parish, and Arne had let him sit by him, and they had drunk together. But presently they had quarreled and fought, and Arne had fallen on so fiercely that Bentane had snatched a knife from the table and stabbed him in the throat and then more than once in the breast. Arnie had died almost at once. The bishop had taken this mischance much to heart. He himself had cared for the laying out of the corpse, and had it brought all the long way home by his own folk. Bentane he had thrown into irons, cast him out from the church, and, if he were not already hanged, he was going to be. Haldan had to tell all this over again many times as fresh people streamed in. Lavrens and Simon came over to the kitchen, too, when they marked all the stir and commotion about the place. Lavrens was much moved. He bade them saddle his horse. He would ride over to Brecken at once. As he was about to go, his eyes fell on Kristen's white face. "'Maybe you would like to go with me?' he asked. Kristen faltered a little. She shuddered, but then she nodded, for she could not utter one word. "'It's not too cold for her,' said Ranfried. "'Doubtless they will have the wake to-morrow, and then tis like we shall all go together.' Lavrens looked at his wife. He marked Simon's face, too, and then he went and laid his arm round Kristen's shoulders. "'She is his foster-sister, you must bear in mind.' said he maybe she would like to help inga with the laying out the body and though kristen's heart was benumbed with despair and fear she felt a glow of thankfulness to her father for his words ranfried said then that if kristen was to go they must eat their evening porridge before they started she wished too to send gifts to inga by them a new linen sheet wax candles and fresh baked bread and she bade them say she would come up herself and help to prepare for the burial. There was little eating, but much talking in the room while the food was on the table. One reminded the other of the trials that God had laid upon Gert and Inga. Their farm had been laid waste by stone slips and floods. More than one of their elder children were dead, so that all Arnie's brothers and sisters were still but little ones. They had had fortune with them now for some years, since the bishop placed Gerd at Finsbrecken as his bailiff, and the children who were left to them were fair and full of promise. But his mother loved Arne more than all the rest. 
They pitied Sierra Eirik, too. The priest was beloved and well-respected, and the folk of the parish were proud of him. He was learned and skilled in his office, and in all the years he had had their church, he had never let a holy day or mass or a service pass that he was in duty bound to hold. In his youth he had been a man-at-arms under Count Alf of Tornberg, but he had had the misfortune to kill a man of very high birth, and so had taken refuge with the Bishop of Oslo. When the bishop saw what a turn Eirik had for book-learning, he had him trained for a priest. And had it not been that he still had enemies, by reason of that slaying of long ago, it was like Sierra Eirik would not have stayed here in this little charge. True enough, he was very greedy of pence, both for his own purse and for the church. But then was not his church richly fitted out with plate and vestments and books? and he himself had these children, and he had had naught but sorrow and trouble with his family. In these far-away country parishes, folk held it was not reason that priests should live like monks, for they must at least have women to help on their farms, and they might well need a woman to look after things for them, seeing what long and toilsome journeys they must make round the parishes and that, too, in all kinds of weather. Besides, folk had not forgotten that it was not so very long since priests in Norway had been wedded men. Thus no one had blamed Sierra Eirik overmuch, that he had had three children by the woman who tended his house, while he was yet young. But this evening, they said, it looked indeed as though t'was God's will to punish Eirik for his loose living, so much evil had his children and his children's children brought upon him and some thought there was good reason too that a priest should have neither wife nor children for after this it was much to be feared that bitterness and enmity would arise between the priest and the folk on finsbrecken who until now had been the best of friends simon andresen knew much of bentain's doings in oslo and he told of them Bentain had been clerk to the dean of the Church of the Holy Virgin, and he had the name of being a quick-witted youth. There were many women, too, who liked him well. He had roving eyes and a glib tongue. Some held him a comely man. These were, for the most part, such women as thought they had a bad bargain in their husbands. And then young maids, the sort that liked well that men should be somewhat free with them simon laughed ay they understood well bentain was so sly he never went too far with that kind of woman he was all talk with them and so he got a name for clean living but the thing was that king hawken as they knew was a good and pious man himself and fain would keep order among his men and hold them to a seemly walk and conversation the young ones at least the others were apt to be too much for him. And it came about that whatever pranks the youngsters managed to slip out and take part in, drinking bouts, gambling, and beer-drinking, and such like, the priest of the king's household always got to hear of, and the madcaps had to confess and pay Scott and suffer hard reproof. Ay, two or three of the wildest youths of all were hunted away. But at last it came out that it was this fox— bentain secretarius unknown to any one he had been made free of all the beer-houses and worst places still he confessed the serving wenches and gave them absolution christen sat at her mother's side she tried to eat so that no one should mark how it was with her though her hand shook so that she spilled the milk porridge at each spoonful and her tongue felt so thick and dry in her mouth that she could not swallow the morsels of bread. But when Simon began to tell of Bentain, she had to give up making believe to eat. She held on to the bench beneath her. Terror and loathing seized her, so that she felt dizzy and sick. It was he who had wanted to. Bentain and Arne! Bentain and Arne! beside herself with impatience she waited for them to be finished she longed to see arne 
Arnie's comely face, to throw herself down beside him and mourn and forget all else. As her mother helped her with her outer wrappings, she kissed her daughter on the cheek. Kristen was so little used to endearments from her mother now. It comforted her much. She laid her head upon Ranfried's shoulder a moment, but she could not weep. When they came out of the courtyard, she saw that others were going with them, Halfdan, Johan from Laugerbu, and Simon and his man. It gave her a pang, she knew not why, that the two strangers should be coming with them. It was a bitter cold evening, and the snow crackled underfoot. In the black sky, the stars crowded thick, glittering like rime. When they had ridden a little way, they heard yells and howls and furious hoofbeats from the flats to the south. A little further up the road, a whole troop of horsemen came tearing up behind and swept past them with a ringing of metal, leaving behind a vapor of reeking rime-covered horseflesh, which reached them even where they stood aside in the deep snow. Haldan hailed the wild crew. They were youths from the farms in the south of the parish. They were still keeping yuletide and were out trying their horses. Some, who were too drunk to understand, thundered on at a gallop, roaring at the top of their voices and hammering on their shields. But a few grasped the tidings which Halvdan shouted to them. They fell out of the troop, grew silent, joined Lavren's company, and talked in whispers to those in the rear. At last they came in sight of Finsbrecken, on the hillside beyond the Seal River. There were lights about the houses. In the middle of the courtyard, pine-root torches had been planted in a heap of snow, and their glare lay red over the white slopes. But the black houses looked as though smeared with clotted blood. One of Arnie's little sisters stood outside and stamped her feet. She hugged her hands beneath her cloak. Kristen kissed the tear-stained, half-frozen child. Her heart was heavy as stone, and it seemed as though she had lead in her limbs as she climbed the stairs to the loft room where they had laid him. End of chapter 7, part 1Chapter Seven, Part Two of the Bridal Wreath by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, Part Two. The sound of singing and the glitter of many lighted candles met them in the doorway. In the middle of the room stood the coffin he had been brought home in, covered with a sheet. Boards had been laid on trestles and the coffin placed upon them. At the head of the bier, a young priest stood with a book in his hands, chanting. Round about knelt the mourners, with their faces hidden in their heavy cloaks. Lavrens lit his candle at one of those already burning, set it firmly upon one of the boards of the bier, and knelt down. Kristen tried to do the like, but could not get her candle to stand. So Simon took it and helped her. As long as the priest went on chanting, all stayed upon their knees and repeated his words in whispers their breath hanging like steam about their mouths in the bitter cold of the room. When the priest shut his book and the folk rose, there were many gathered in the death chamber already. Lavrens went forward to Inga. She stared at Kristen and seemed scarce to hear what Lavrens said. She stood holding the gifts he had handed to her, as though she knew not she had aught in her hand. "'Are you come too, Kristen?' she said in a strange labored voice maybe you would see my son so as he is come back to me she pushed some of the candles aside seized kristen's arm with a shaking hand and with the other swept the napkin from the face of the dead it was grayish yellow like clay and the lips had the hue of lead they had parted a little so that the small, even, bone-white teeth showed through as in a mocking smile. Under the long eyelashes there was a gleam of the glassy eyes, and there were some livid stains below the temples, either marks of blows or the death spots. "'Maybe you would kiss him?' asked Inga, as before." and Kristen bent forward at her bidding and pressed her lips upon the dead man's cheek. 
it was clammy as with dew and she thought she could feel the least breath of decay the body had begun to thaw perhaps with the heat from all the tapers round Kristen stayed still lying with her hands on the bier for she could not rise inga drew the shroud further aside so that the great gash above the collarbone came to sight then she turned towards the people and said with a shaking voice they lie i see who say a dead man's wounds will bleed when he is touched by him who wrought his death he is colder now my boy and less comely than when you met him last down there on the road you care not much to kiss him now i see but i have heard you scorned not his lips then inga said lavrens coming forward have you lost your wits are you raving oh ay you are all so fine down at jorngard you were far too rich a man you lavrens bjorgolfsson for my son to dare think of courting your daughter with honour and kristin too she thought herself too good but she was not too good to run after him on the highway at night and play with him in the thickets the night he left ask her yourself and we will see if she dare deny it here with arnie lying dead and all through her lightness lavrens did not ask he turned to gerd curb your wife man you see she has clean lost her wits but kristin lifted her white face and looked desperately about her i went and met arni the last evening because he begged me to but not of wrong passed between us and then as she seemed to come to herself and to understand all she cried out i know not what you mean inga would you slander arni and he lying here never did he tempt me nor lure me astray but inga laughed aloud ah nay not arni but bentane priest he did not let you play with him so ask gunild lavrens that washed the dirt off your daughter's back and ask each man who was in the bishop's henchman's hall on new year's eve when bentane flouted arni for that he had let her go and leave him standing like a fool she let bentane walk homeward with her under her cloak and would have played the same game with him lavrens took her by the shoulder and laid his hand over her mouth take her away gerd shameful it is that you should speak such words by this good youth's body but if all your children lay here dead i would not stand and hear you lie about mine you gerd must answer for what this madwoman says gerd took hold of his wife and tried to lead her away but he said to lavrens tis true though twas of kristin they talked arni and bentane when my son lost his life like enough you have not heard it but there hath been talk in the parish here too this autumn simon struck a blow with his sword upon the clothes chest beside him nay good folk now must you find somewhat else to talk of in this death chamber than my betrothed priest can you not rule these folk and keep seemly order here the priest kristin saw now he was the youngest son from ulfsvolden who had been at home for yule opened his book and stood up beside the bier but lavrens shouted that those who had talked about his daughter let them be who they might should be made to swallow their words and inga shrieked ay take my life then lavrens since she has taken all my comfort and joy and make her wedding with this knight's son but yet do all folk know that she was wed with bentane upon the highway here and she cast the sheet lavrens had given her right across the bier to kristin i need not ranfried's linen to lay my arnie in the grave make headcloths of it you or keep it to swaddle your roadside brat and go down and help gunhild to moan for the man that's hanged lavrens gerd and the priest took hold of inga 
simon tried to lift kristen who was lying over the bier but she thrust his arm fiercely aside drew herself up straight upon her knees and cried aloud so god my saviour help me it is false and stretching out one hand she held it over the nearest candle on the bier it seemed as if the flame bent and waved aside kristen felt all eyes fixed upon her what seemed to her a long time went by and then all at once she grew aware of a burning pain in her palm and with a piercing cry she fell back upon the floor she thought herself she swooned but she was aware that simon and the priest raised her inga shrieked out something she saw her father's horror-stricken face and heard the priest shout that no one must take account of this ordeal not thus might one call god to witness and then simon bore her from the room and down the stairs simon's man ran to the stable and soon after kristen was sitting still half senseless in front of simon on his saddle wrapped in his coat and he was riding toward urengard as fast as his horse could gallop they were nigh to urengard when lavrens came up with them the rest of their company came thundering along the road far behind say not to your mother said simon as he set her down at the door of the house we have heard all too much wild talk to-night tis no wonder you lost your wits yourself at the last ranfried was lying awake when they came in and she asked how things had been in the wake chamber simon took it upon himself to answer for all ay there had been many candles and many folk ay there had been a priest tormot from ulfsfolden sire eirik he heard had ridden off to hamar this very evening so there would be no trouble about the burial we must have a mass said over the lad said ranfried god strengthen inga the good worthy woman is sorely tried lavrin sang the same tune as simon and in a little simon said that now they must all go to rest for kristen is both weary and sorrowful after a time when ranfried slept lavrin's threw on a few clothes and went and seated himself on the edge of his daughter's bed he found kristen's hand in the dark and said very gently now must you tell me child what is true and what is false in all this talk inga is spreading sobbing kristen told him all that had befallen the evening arna had set out for hammer lavrens said but little kristen crept toward him in her bed threw her arms round his neck and wailed softly it is my fault that arne is dead tis but too true what inga said twas arne himself that begged you to go and meet him said lavrens pulling the coverlid up over his daughter's bare shoulders i trow it was heedless in me to let you two go about together but i thought the lad would have known better i will not blame you two i know these things are heavy for you to bear yet did i never think that daughter of mine would fall into ill fame in this parish of ours and will go hard with your mother when she hears these tidings but that you went to gunhild with this and not to me twas so witless a thing i understand not how you could behave so foolishly i cannot bear to stay here in the dale any more sobbed kristen not a soul would i dare look in the face and all i have brought upon them the folks at romangard and at finn's breckham ay they will have to see to it both gerd and sira eirik said lavrens that these lies about you are buried with arne for the rest tis simon andresen can best defend you in this business said he and patted her in the dark think you not he took the matter well and wisely father and kristen clung close to him and begged piteously and fervently send me to the convent father i listen to me i have thought of this for long maybe olfield will grow well if i go in her stead you know the shoes with beads upon them that i sewed for her in the autumn i pricked my fingers sorely and my hands bled from the sharp gold thread yet i sat and sewed on them for i thought it was wicked of me not to love my sister so that i would be a nun to help her 
Arnie once asked if I would not. Had I but said I then, all this would not have befallen. Lavrin shook his head. Lie down now, he bade. You know not yourself what you say, poor child. Now you must try if you can sleep. But Kristen lay and felt the smart in her burnt hand, and despair and bitterness over her fate raged in her heart. No worse could have befallen her had she been the most sinful of women. Everyone would believe. No, she could not, she could not bear to stay here in the dale. Horror after horror rose before her. When her mother came to know of this, and now there was blood between them and their parish priest, ill will betwixt all who had been friends around her the whole of her life, but the worst, the most crushing fear of all, fell upon her when she thought of Simon and of how he had taken her and carried her away and stood forth for her at home and borne himself as though she were his own possession. Her father and mother had fallen aside before him as though she belonged already more to him than to them. Then she thought of Arnie's face in the coffin, cold and cruel. She remembered the last time she was at church. She had seen, as she left, an open grave that stood waiting for a dead man. The upthrown clods of earth lay upon the snow, hard and cold and gray, like iron. To this had she brought Arnie. All at once the thought came to her of a summer evening many years before. She was standing on the balcony of the loft room at Finsbrecken, the same room where she had been struck down that night. Arnie was playing ball with some boys in the courtyard below, and the ball was hit up to her in the balcony. She had held it behind her back and would not give it up when Arnie came after it. Then he had tried to wrest it from her by strength, and they had fought for it in the balcony, in the room amid the chess, with the leather sacks which hung there full of clothes, bumping their heads as they knocked against them in their frolic. They had laughed and struggled over that ball. And then at last the truth seemed to come home to her. He was dead and gone, and she should never again see his comely, fearless face, nor feel the touch of his warm living hands. And she had been so childish and so heartless as never to give a thought to what it must be for him to lose her. She wept bitter tears and felt she had earned all her unhappiness. But then the thought came back of all that still awaited her, and she wept anew, for after all it seemed to her too hard a punishment. It was Simon who told Ranfried of what happened in the corpse chamber at Brecken the night before. He did not make more of it than he needs must. But Kristen was so amazed with sorrow and night waking that she felt a senseless anger against him because he talked as if it were not so dreadful a thing after all. Besides, it vexed her sorely that her father and mother let Simon behave as though he were master of the house. And you, Simon, surely you believe not aught of this, asked Ranfried fearfully. No, replied Simon, nor do I deem there is any one who believes it. They know you and her and this Bentain. But so little befalls for folk to talk of in these out parishes. Tis but reason they should fall to on such a fat titbit. Tis for us to teach them Kristen's good name is too fine fair for such clowns as they. But pity it was she let herself be so frighted by his grossness that she went not forthwith to you or to Sira Eirik with the tale. Methinks this bordal priest would but too gladly have avowed he meant not worse than harmless jesting, had you, Lovrens, got a word with him. Both Christian's parents said that Simon was right in this. But she cried out, stamping her foot, But he threw me down on the ground, I say. I scarce know myself what he did or did not do. I was beside myself. I can remember not, for all I know it may be as Inga says. I have not been well nor happy a single day since. Ranfried shrieked and clasped her hands together. Lovrens started up. Even Simon's face fell. He looked at her sharply, then went up to her and took her by the chin. Then he laughed. 
God bless you, Kristen. You had remembered but too well if he had done you any harm. No marvel if she has been sad and ill since that unhappy evening. She had such an ugly fright. She who had never known aught but kindness and good will before, said he to the others. Any but the evil-minded, who would fain think ill rather than good, can see by her eyes that she is a maid and no woman. Kristen looked up into her betrothed's small, steady eyes. She half lifted her hands as if to throw them round his neck when he went on. You must not think, Kristen, that you will not forget this. Tis not in my mind that we should settle down at Formo as soon as we are wed, so that you would never leave the dale. No one has the same hue of hair or mind in both rain and sunshine, said old King Svera when they blamed his birch-legs for being overbearing in good fortune. Lavrens and Ranfried smiled. It was pleasant enough to hear the young man discourse with the air of a wise old bishop. Simon went on. "'Twould ill beseem me to seek to teach you who are to be my father-in-law, but so much maybe I may make bold to say that we, my brothers and sisters and I, were brought up more strictly— we were not let run about so freely with the housefolk as I have seen that Kristen is used to. My mother often said that if one played with the Cotter Carl's brats, twas like one would get a louse or two in one's hair in the end. And there's somewhat in that saying. Lavrens and Ranfried held their peace, but Kristen turned away, and the wish she had felt but a moment before to clasp Simon round the neck had quite left her. Towards noon, Lavrens and Simon took their skis and went out to see to some snares up on the mountain ridges. The weather was fine outside, sunshine, and the cold not so great. Both men were glad to slip away from all the sadness and weeping at home, and so they went far, right up among the bare hilltops. They lay in the sun under a crag and drank and ate. Lavrens spoke a little of Arnie. He had loved the boy well simon chimed in praised the dead lad and said he thought it not strange that kristen grieved for her foster brother then lavren said maybe they should not press her much but should give her a little time to get back her peace of mind before they drank the betrothal ale she had said somewhat of wishing to go into a convent for a time simon sat bolt upright and gave a long whistle you like not the thought asked Lovrens. "'Nay, but I do, I do,' said the other hastily. "'Methinks it is the best way, dear father-in-law. Send her to the sisters in Oslo for a year. There will she learn how folk talk, one of the other out in the world. I know a little of some of the maidens who are there,' he said, laughing. "'They would not throw themselves down and die of grief if two mad yonkers tore each other to pieces for their sakes.' Not that I would have such an one for wife, but methinks Kristen will be none the worse for meeting new folks. Lavrens put the rest of the food into the wallet and said, without looking at the youth, Methinks you love Kristen? Simon laughed a little and did not look at Lavrens. Be sure I know her worth, and yours too, he said quickly and shamefacedly, as he got up and took his ski. None that I have ever met would I sooner wed with. A little before Easter, when there was still snow enough for sleighing down the dale, and the ice still bore on Mjolsen, Kristen journeyed southward for the second time. Simon came up to bear her company, so now she journeyed driving in a sleigh, well wrapped in furs, and with father and betrothed beside her, and after them followed her father's men and sledges with her clothes, and gifts of food and furs for the abbess and the sisters of Nana Setter. End of chapter 7, part 2this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, The Garland, Chapter One. Osman Bjorgelson's church boat stood in round the point of Hovede early one Sunday at the end of April, while the bells were ringing in the cloister church and were answered from across the bay by the chimes of bells from the town, now louder and now fainter as the breeze rose or fell. 
Light, fluted clouds were floating over the high, pale blue heavens, and the sun was glittering on the dancing ripples of the water. It was quite spring-like along the shores. The fields lay almost bare of snow, and over the leaf-tree thickets the light had a yellow shimmer, and the shadows were blue. But in the pine forests up on the high ridges, which framed in the settled lands of Ockersbig, there were glimpses of snow, and on the far blue fells to the westward beyond the fjord, there still showed many flashes of white. Kristen was standing in the bow of the boat with her father and Girid, Osman's wife. She gazed at the town with all the light-hued churches and stone buildings that rose above the swarm of gray-brown wooden houses and bare treetops. The wind ruffled the skirts of her cloak and snatched at her hair beneath her hood. They had let the cattle out at Skog the day before and a great longing had come on her to be at Jurengard. It would be a long time still before they could let the cattle out there. She longed with tender pity for the lean, winter-worn cows in the dark byres. They would have to wait and suffer a long while yet. Her mother, Ulfhild, who had slept in her arms each night all these years, little Romborg, she yearned so much for them. She longed for all the folk at home, and the horses and the dogs, for Cortelin, whom Ulfield was to have while she was gone, and for her father's hawks as they sat there on their perches with their hoods over their heads. She saw the horse-hide gloves that hung beside them to wear when you took them onto your wrist, and the ivory staves to scratch them with. It was as if all the woe of the last winter had gone far away from her, and she only saw her home as it used to be. They had told her, too, that none thought ill of her in the parish. Sierra Eirik did not believe that story. He was angry and grieved at what Bentain had done. Bentain had fled from Hammer. Twas said he had gone to Sweden. So things were not so bad between them and their neighbor as she had feared. On the journey down to Oslo, they had stayed as guests at Simon's home, and she had come to know his mother and sisters. Sir Andres was in Sweden still. She had not felt at ease there, and her dislike of the Diefen folk was all the stronger that she could think of no good ground for it. All the way thither she had said to herself that they had no cause to be proud or to think themselves better than her kin. No man knew aught of Ryder Dara, the birch leg, before King Svera got him the widow of the Diefen baron to wife. But lo! they were not proud at all, and when Simon himself spoke one night of his forefather, I have found out now for sure he was a comb-maker, so tis as though you were come into a kingly stock, almost, Kristen, said he. Take heed to your tongue, boy, said his mother, but they all laughed together. It vexed her strangely when she thought of her father. He laughed much, if Simon gave him the least cause. A thought came to her dimly that maybe her father would gladly have had more laughter in his life. But t'was not to her mind that he should like Simon so much. They had all been at Skog over Easter. She had found that her uncle was a hard master to his farmers and serving folk. She had met one and another who asked after her mother and spoke lovingly of Lovren's. They had better times when he lived here. Osmond's mother, Lavren's stepmother, lived on the manor in a house by herself. She was not so very old, but sickly and failing. Lavren's had but seldom spoken of her at home. Once when Kristen asked him if he had had a hard stepmother, her father answered, She never did much to me of either good or ill. Kristen felt for her father's hand, and he pressed hers. You will be happy soon enough, my daughter, with the good sisters. You will have other things to think of, besides longing to be home with us. They sailed so near by the town that the smell of tar and salt fish was borne out to them from the wharves. Girid named all the churches, the traders' quarters and the open places which ran up from the water's edge. Kristen remembered nothing from the time she was here before but the great heavy towers of St. Halvard's Church. They sailed westward past the whole town and laid two at the convent pier. 
Kristen walked between her father and her uncle through a cluster of warehouses and came out upon a road which led up through the fields. Simon came after, leading Geared by the hand. The serving folks stayed behind to help some men from the convent load the baggage upon a cart. Nonna Setter and the whole Leiren quarter lay within the boundaries of the town grazing grounds. But there were but a few clusters of houses here and there along the roadside. The larks were trilling over their heads in the pale blue sky, and the small yellow flowers of the colt's foot were thickly sprinkled over the wan clay slopes, but along by the fences the roots of the grass were green. When they were through the gate and were come into the cloister, all the nuns came marching two by two towards them from the church, while song and music streamed out after them through the open door. Ill at ease, Kristen watched the many black-robed women with white linen wimples about their faces. She curtsied low, and the men bowed with their hats held close to their breasts. After the nuns came a flock of young maidens, some of them but children, in gowns of undyed wadamal, their waists bound with belts of twined black and white, and their hair braided tightly back from their faces, with cords of the same black and white. Without thinking, Kristen put on a bold and forward look as the young maids passed, for she felt bashful and was afraid they must think she looked countrified and foolish. The convent was so glorious that she was quite overcome. All the buildings round the inner court were of grey stone. On the north side, the main wall of the church stood up high above the other houses. It had two tiers of roofs and towers at the west end. The court itself was laid with stone flags, and round the hole there ran a covered way whose roof was borne on pillars fairly wrought. In the midst of the court stood a stone statue of the Mater Misericordiae, spreading her cloak over some kneeling figures. Then a lay sister came and prayed them to go with her to the abbess parlor. The Lady Groa Guttum's daughter was a tall and stoutly made old woman. She would have been comely had she not had so many hairs about her mouth. Her voice was deep, like a man's, but her bearing was gentle and kindly. She called to mind that she had known Lavrin's father and mother, and asked after his wife and his other children. Last she spoke to Kristen, in friendly wise. "'I have heard good report of you, and you look to be wise and well-nurtured. Sure I am you will give us no cause for miscontent. I have heard that you are plighted to this good and well-born man, Simon Andresen, whom I see here. It seems to us that was wise counsel of your father and your husband to be, to grant you leave to live here a while in the Virgin Mary's house, that you may learn to obey and serve before you are called to rule and to command. Now would I have you lay to heart this counsel, that you learn to find joy in prayer and the worship of God, that you may use yourself in all your doings to remember your Creator, God's gentle mother, and all the saints who have given us the best patterns of strength, uprightness, faithfulness, and all the virtues you must show forth in guiding your people and your goods, and nurturing your children. And you will learn in this house, too, to take good heed of time, for here every hour has its use and its task also. Many young maids and women love all too well to lie abed late of a morning, and sit long at table of an evening in idle talk. Yet look not you as you were one of these. Yet may you learn much in the year you are here that may profit you, both here on earth and in our heavenly home. Kristen curtsied and kissed her hand. After that, Lady Groa bade Kristen go with a monstrously fat old nun, whom she called Sister Potentia, over to the nun's refectory. The men and Geared she asked to dine with her in another house. The refectory was a great and fair room with a stone floor and pointed windows with glass panes. There was a doorway into another room where Kristen could see there must be glass windows too, for the sun shone in. The sisters were already seated at the table waiting for their food, the elder nuns upon a cushioned stone bench along the wall under the windows the younger sisters, and the bareheaded maidens in light-hued wadmal dresses, sat upon a wooden bench on the outer side of the board. In the next room a board was laid, too, 
this was for the commoners and the lay servants there were a few old men amongst them these folk did not wear the convent habit but were none the less clad soberly in dark raiment sister potentia showed christen to a seat on the outer bench but went and placed herself near to the abbess high seat at the end of the board the high seat was empty to-day all rose both in this room and in the side room while the sisters said grace after that a fair young nun went and stood at the lectern placed in the doorway between the two chambers and while the lay sisters in the greater room and two of the youngest nuns in the side room bore in food and drink the nun read in a high and sweet voice and without stopping or tripping at a single word the story of saint theodora and saint didymus at first christen was thinking most of minding her table manners for she saw all the sisters and the young maids bore them as seemly and ate as nicely as though they had been sitting at the finest feast there was abundance of the best food and drink but all helped themselves modestly and dipped but the very tips of their fingers into the dishes no one spilled the broth either upon the cloths or upon their garments and all cut up the meat so small that they did not soil their mouths and ate with so much care that not a sound was to be heard christen grew hot with fear that she might not seem as well behaved as the others she was feeling ill at ease too in her bright dress in the midst of all these women in black and white she fancied that they were all looking at her so when she had to eat a fat piece of breast of mutton and was holding it by the bone with two fingers while cutting morsels off with her right hand and taking care to handle the knife lightly and neatly suddenly the whole slipped from her fingers her slice of bread and the meat flew on to the cloth and the knife fell clattering on the stone flags the noise sounded fearfully in the quiet room christen flushed red as fire and would have bent to pick up the knife but a lay sister came noiselessly in her sandals and gathered up the things but christen could eat no more she found too that she had cut one of her fingers and she was afraid of bleeding upon the cloth so she sat with her hand wrapped in a corner of her skirt and thought of how she was staining the goodly light blue dress she had gotten for the journey to oslo and she did not dare to raise her eyes from her lap howbeit in a little she began to listen more to what the nun was reading when the ruler found he could not shake the steadfastness of the maid theodora she would neither make offerings to the false gods nor let herself be given in marriage he bade them lead her to a brothel yet while on the way thither he exhorted her to think of her free-born kindred and her honoured father and mother upon whom everlasting shame must now be brought and gave his word she should be let live in peace and stay a maid if she would but join the service of a heathen goddess whom they called diana theodora answered fearlessly chastity is like a lamp but love of god is the flame were i to serve the devil woman whom you call diana my chastity were no more worth than a rusty lamp without flame or oil thou callest me free-born but we are all born bondsmen since our first parents sold us to the devil christ has bought me free and i am bound to serve him so that i cannot wed me with his foes he will guard his dove but should he even suffer you to break my body that is the temple of his holy spirit it shall not be counted to me for shame if so be that i consent not to betray what is his into the hands of his enemies christen's heart began to throb for this in some way reminded her of her meeting with bentain she was smitten by the thought that this perhaps was her sin she had not for a moment thought of god nor prayed for his help and now sister cecilia read further of saint didymus he was a christian knight but heretofore he had kept his faith hidden from all save a few friends he went now to the house where the maid was he gave money to the woman who owned the house and thus was the first to be led in to theodora she fled into a corner like a frightened hare but didymus hailed her as his sister and as his lord's bride and said he was come to save her then he spake with her a while saying 
was it not meet that a brother should wage his life for his sister's honour and at last she did as he bade her changed clothes with him and let herself be clad in didymus coat of mail he pulled the hat down over her eyes and drew the cape up about her chin and bade her go out with her face hidden like a youth who is abashed at having been in such a place christen thought of arni and was scarce able to hold back her tears she gazed straight before her with wet eyes while the nun was reading to the end how didymus was led to the place of execution and how theodore came hastening down from the mountains cast herself at the headsman's feet and begged that she might die in his stead and now the holy man and maid strove together who should first win the crown and both were beheaded on the one day this was the eight and twentieth day of april in the year three hundred four after the birth of christ in antioch as was written by saint ambrosius when they rose from the table sister potentia came and patted christen kindly on the cheek ah you are longing for your mother i can well believe and on that christian's tears began to fall but the nun made as though she did not see them and led christian to the hostel where she was to dwell it was in one of the stone houses by the cloisters a goodly room with glass windows and a big fireplace in the short wall at the far end along one main wall stood six bedsteads and along the other all the maiden's chests Kristen wished they would let her sleep with one of the little girls, but Sister Potentia called a fat, fair-haired, grown maiden. Here is Ingeborg, Philippus' daughter, who is to be your bedfellow. You must see now and learn to know each other. And with that she went out. Ingeborg took Kristen at once by the hand and began to talk. She was not very tall and was much too fat, above all in her face her cheeks were so plump that her eyes looked quite small but her skin was clear red and white and her hair was yellow as gold and so curly that her thick plaits twisted and twined together like strands of rope and small locks kept ever slipping from under her snood she began straightway to question christen about many things but never waited for an answer instead she talked about herself reckoned out the whole of her kindred in all its branches they were not but fine and exceeding rich folk she was betrothed too to a rich and mighty man einer einerson of agenes but he was far too old and twice widowed this was her greatest sorrow she said yet could christen not mark that she took it very much to heart then she talked a little of simon dara twas a marvel how closely she had looked him over in the short moment when they were passing in the cloisters after that she had a mind to look into christen's chest but first she opened her own and brought forth all her clothes while they were ransacking their chests sister cecilia came in she rebuked them and said that this was no seemly sunday pastime this made christen unhappy again she had never been taken to task by any but her mother and that was not the same as being chid by a stranger ingebjorg was not abashed after they were come to bed in the evening she lay chattering until christen fell asleep two elder lay sisters slept in a corner of the room they were to see that the maidens did not take their shifts off at night for it was against the rules for the girls to undress entirely and to see that they were up in time for matins in the church but else they did not trouble themselves to keep order in the hostel and made as though they marked it not when the maids were lying talking or eating the dainties which they had hidden in their chests when christen was awakened next morning ingebjorg was in the midst of a long tale already so that christen almost wondered whether the other had been talking the whole night through End of chapter one chapter two of the bridal wreath by sigrid unset this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the foreign merchants who lay in oslo during the summer and trafficked there came to the town in the spring about holy rood day which is ten days before the halvards wake fair to this folks streamed in from all the parishes between Mursen and the swedish marches so that the town swarmed with people in the first weeks of may this was the best time to buy from the strangers before they had sold too many of their wares 
Sister Potentia had the care of the marketing for Nonna Setter, and she had promised Ingeborg and Kristen that they should go with her down to the town the day before the halvard's wake. But about midday some of Sister Potentia's kin came to the convent to see her, and so she could not go that day. Then Ingeborg begged and prayed, till at last she let them go alone, though it was against the rules. An old peasant, who was a commoner of the convent, was sent with them as escort. Hoken was his name. Kristen had been three weeks now at Nonasetter, and in all that time she had not set foot outside the convent grounds and gardens. She wondered to see how spring-like it was outside. The little woods out in the fields were pale green. The wood anemones grew thick as a carpet round the light-colored tree stems. White, fair-weather clouds came sailing up over the islands in the fjord, and the water lay fresh and blue, slightly ruffled here and there by the light flaws of wind. Ingeborg skipped about, plucked bunches of leaves from the trees and smelt them, and peeped round after the folk they met, till Hulken chid her, were these seemly goings-on for a well-born maid, and in the convent habit, too? The maidens were made to walk just behind him, hand in hand, quietly and seemly. But Ingeborg used her eyes and her tongue all the same. Hulken was somewhat deaf. Kristen, too, was wearing the novice's garb now, an undyed light gray wadmal dress, woolen belt and headband, and a plain dark blue cloak over all, with a hood turned up so that the plaited hair was quite hid. Hulken strode in front with a stout brass-knobbed staff in his hand. He was dressed in a long black gown, had a leaden agnus dei hanging on his breast, and an image of St. Christopher in his hat. His white hair and beard were so well brushed that they shone like silver in the sunshine. The upper part of the town, between the Nunsbeck and the Bishop's Palace, was a quiet neighborhood. There were here neither shops nor taverns. Most of the dwelling places belonged to great folk from the parishes around, and the houses turned dark windowless timber gables to the street. But on this day whole crowds of people were roaming about the roads, even up here, and the serving folk stood loitering about the courtyard gates, gossiping with the passers-by. When they were come out near the bishop's palace, there was a great crush upon the place in front of Halvard's church and the Olaf cloister booths had been set up on the grassy slopes, and there were showmen making trained dogs jump through barrel hoops. But Hulken would not have the maids stand and look at these things, and he would not let Kristen go into the church. He said twould be better worth her seeing on the great feast day itself. As they came down over the open space by St. Clement's Church, Hulken took them by the hands, for here was the greatest press of folk coming from the wharves or out from the alleys between the traders' yards. The maidens were bound for the mickle yard, where the shoemakers plied their trade, for Ingeborg had found the clothes Kristen had brought from home very good and sightly, but she said the shoes she had with her from the dale were not fit to wear for best. And when Kristen had seen the shoes from the outland Ingeborg had in her chest, more pairs than one, she felt she could not rest until she too had bought some like them. The Mickle Yard was one of the largest in Oslo. It stretched from the wharves up to the Sauter's Alley, with more than forty houses round two great courts. And now they had set up booths with wadmal roofs in the courts as well. Above the roofs of these tents there rose a statue of St. Crispinus. Within the courts was a great throng of folk buying and selling, women running between the kitchens with pots and pails, children getting in the way of folks' feet, horses being led in and out of the stables, and serving men carrying packages to and from the warehouses. From the balconies of the lofts above, where the finest wares were sold, shoemakers and their apprentices shouted to the two maids and dangled small gaily colored or gold-embroidered shoes before them. But Ingeborg made her way toward the loft where Diedrich, the shoemaker, sat. He was a German, but had a Norse wife, and owned a house in the Mickle Yard. The old man was standing bargaining with an esquire wearing a traveller's cloak and a sword at his belt, but Ingeborg went forward unabashed, bowed, and said, 
good sir will you not suffer us of your courtesy to have speech with diedrich first we must be home in our convent by vespers you perchance have no such great haste the esquire bowed and stepped aside diedrich nudged ingeborg with his elbow and asked laughing whether they danced so much in the convent that she had worn out already all the shoons she had of him the year before ingeborg nudged him again and said they were still unworn thank heaven but here was this other maid and she pulled christen forward then diedrich and his lad bore forth a box into the balcony and out of it he brought forth shoes each pair finer than the last they had christen sit down upon a chest that he might try them on her there were white shoes and brown and red and green and blue shoes with painted wooden heels and shoes without heels shoes with buckles and shoes with silken laces in them shoes in leather of two or three hues christen felt she would fain have had them all but they cost so dear she was quite dismayed not one pair cost less than a cow at home her father had given her a purse with a mark of silver and counted money when he left that was her pocket money and christen had deemed it great riches but she soon saw that ingeborg thought it no great store to go a marketing with ingeborg too must try on some shoes for the jest of it that cost no money said diedrich laughing she did pie one pair of leaf-green shoes with red heels she said she must have them on trust but then diedrich knew her and her folks christen thought indeed that diedrich liked this none too well and that he was vexed too that the tall esquire in the travelling coat had left the loft much time had been taken up with the trying on so she chose for herself a pair of heelless shoes of thin purple blue leather broidered with silver and with rose-red stones but she liked not the green silk laces in them diedrich said he could change these and took the maids with him into a room at the back of the loft here he had coffers full of silk ribbons and small silver buckles twas against the law strictly for shoemakers to trade in these things and the ribbons too were many of them too broad and the buckles too big for footgear they felt they had to buy one or two of the smaller things and when they had drunk a cup of sweet wine with diedrich and he had packed the things they had bought into a wadmal cloth the hour was grown somewhat late and christen's purse much lighter when they had come to the Oestrestreite again, the sunlight was turned golden, and by reason of the traffic in the town, the dust hung over the street in a bright haze. The evening was warm and fair, and folk were coming down from Eicheberg with great armfuls of green branches wherewith to deck their houses for the holy day. And now the whim took Ingeborg that they should go out to the Gieta Bridge. At fair times there was wont to be so much merry-making in the fields on the further side of the river, both jugglers and fiddlers. Nay, Ingeborg had heard there was come a whole shipful of outlandish beasts that were being shown in booths down by the waterside. Hawken had had a pot or two of German beer at the mickle yard, and was now easy and mild of mood, so when the maidens took him by the arm and begged him sweetly, he gave way at last, and the three went out towards Eicheberg beyond the stream there were but a few small dwelling-places scattered about the green slopes between the river and the steep hillside they went past the minorite monastery and christen's heart sank with shame as she bethought her how she had meant to give most of her silver for the good of arnie's soul but she had had no mind to speak of it to the priest at nonaceter she feared to be asked questions she had thought that she could maybe come out to the barefoot friars and find if by chance brother edwin were in the cloister now she was fain to meet him again but she knew not either what would be the most seemly way to get speech with one of the monks and tell him her desire and now she had so little money she knew not whether she could buy a mass maybe she must be content to offer a thick wax candle of a sudden they heard a fearful yell from countless throats down by the shore a storm seemed to sweep over the press of human beings down there and now the whole mass rushed towards them shrieking and shouting all seemed wild with terror and some of the runners-by cried out to hawken and the maids that the pards were loose they set out running back to the bridge and heard folk shout to one another that a booth had fallen down and two pards had broken loose some spoke of a serpent too the nearer they came to the bridge the worse became the crush 
Just in front of them a woman dropped a little child out of her arms. Holcomb stood astride the little one to shield it. Soon after they caught sight of him far away with the child in his arms, and then they lost him. At the narrow bridge the press of people was so great that the maids were pushed right out into a field. They saw folks run down to the river bank, young men jumped in and swam, but elder folks sprang into the boats that lay there, and these were overladen in a trice. Kristen tried to make Ingeborg hear. She cried out to her that they should run up to the Minorite cloister. They could see the Greyfriars come running out from it, striving to gather in the terrified people. Kristen was not so frightened as the other girl. They saw nothing either of the wild beasts, but Ingeborg had quite lost her wits. And now, when there was a fresh uproar in the throng, and it was driven back by a whole troop of men from the nearest dwellings who had armed themselves and forced their way back over the bridge, some riding and some running, and Ingeborg nigh coming under the feet of a horse, she gave a scream and set off running for the woods. Kristen had never thought the girl could have run so fast. It made her think of a hunted pig. She ran after her so that they two, at least, should not be parted. They were deep in the woods before Kristen could get Ingebjorg to stop. They were on a little path which seemed to lead down toward the road to Trelleborg. They stood still for a little to get their breath again. Ingebjorg was sniveling and weeping, and said she dared not go back alone through the town and all the way out to the convent. Nor did Kristen deem that this would be well, with the streets in such commotion. She thought they must try to find a house where they might hire a lad to take them home. Ingebjorg thought there was a bridle path to Trelleborg, further down by the shore, and along it there lay some houses, she knew. So they followed the path downward, away from the town. Fearful and uneasy as they both were, it seemed to them they had gone far ere at last they came to a farmstead lying off in a field. In the courtyard there they found a band of men sitting drinking at a board under some ash trees, while a woman came and went, bearing out tankards to them. She looked wonderingly and sourly at the two maids in convent habit, and none of the men seemed to have a mind to go with them, when Kristen told their need. At last, though, two young men stood up and said they would bring the girls to Nona Setter, if Kristen would give them a silver ducat. She heard by their speech that they were not Norse, but she thought they seemed honest folk enough. "'Twas a shameless sum they asked, she thought, but Ingeborg was beside herself with fright, and she saw not how they could go home alone so late, and so she struck the bargain. No sooner were they come to the forest path than the men drew closer to them and began to talk. Kristen liked this but ill, but she would not show she was afraid, so she answered them quietly, told them of the pards, and asked the men where they were from. She spied about her, too, and made as though she looked each moment to meet the serving men they had had with them. She talked as though there had been a whole band. As they went on, the men spoke less and less, nor did she understand much of their speech. After a while she became aware that they were not going the same way she had come with Ingeborg. The course their path took was not the same. "'Twas more northerly, and she deemed they had already gone much too far. "'Deep within her there smoldered a fear she dared not let herself think upon. "'But it strengthened her strangely to have Ingeborg with her, "'for the girl was so foolish that Krista knew she must trust in herself alone "'to find a way out for them both. "'Under her cloak she managed, by stealth, to pull out the cross "'with the holy relic she had had of her father.' She clasped it in her hand, praying fervently in her heart that they might soon meet someone, and in all ways sought to gather all her courage and to make no sign. Just after this she saw that the path came out onto a road, and there was a clearing in the forest. The town and the bay lay far below. The men had led them astray, whether willfully, or because they knew not the paths, they were high up on the mountainside, and far north of Gieta Bridge, which she could see below. The road they had now met seemed to lead thither. Thereupon she stopped, drew forth her purse, and made to count out ten silver pennies into her hand. "'Now, good fellows,' said she, "'we need you not any more to guide us, for we know the way from here. We thank you for your pains, and here is the wage we bargain for. God be with you, good friends.' The men looked at one another so foolishly that Kristen was near smiling. Then one said, with an ugly grin, 
that the road down to the bridge was exceeding lonely twas not wise for them to go alone none surely are such nithings or such fools that they would seek to stop two maids and they in convent habit answered christen we would fain go our own way alone now and she held out the money the man caught her by the wrist thrust his face close up to hers and said somewhat of kuss and boitel christen made out he was saying they might go in peace if she but gave him a kiss and her purse she remembered bentain's face close to hers like this and such a fear came on her for a moment that she grew faint and sick but she pressed her lips together and called in her heart upon god and the virgin mary and in the same instant she thought she heard hoof-falls on the path from the north she struck the man in the face with her purse so that he staggered and then she pushed him in the breast with all her strength so that he tumbled off the path and down into the wood the other german gripped her from behind tore the purse from her hand and her chain from her neck so that it broke she was near falling but clutched the man and tried to get her cross from him again he struggled to get free the robbers too had now heard folk coming ingeborg screamed with all her might and the riders on the path came galloping forward at full speed they burst out of the thicket three of them and ingeborg ran shrieking to meet them as they sprang from their horses christen knew one for the esquire of diedrich's loft he drew his sword seized the german she was struggling with by the back of the neck and thrashed him with the flat of his blade his men ran after the other caught him and beat him to their heart's content christen leaned against the face of the rock she was trembling now that all was over but what she felt most was marvel that her prayer had brought such speedy help then she caught sight of ingeborg who had thrown back her hood hung her cape loosely over her shoulders and was in the act of bringing her heavy shining plaits of hair forward into sight upon her breast at this sight christen burst out a laughing her strength left her and she had to hold on to a tree to keep her feet for twas as though the marrow of her bones was turned to water she felt so weak and so she trembled and laughed and cried the esquire came forward and laid a hand warily upon her shoulder you were more frightened i see than you would show said he and his voice was kindly and gentle but now you must take a hold on yourself you bore yourself so bravely while yet there was peril christen could only look up at him and nod he had fine bright eyes set in a narrow pale brown face and coal-black hair clipped somewhat short over the forehead and behind the ears ingeborg had her hair in order now and she came and thanked the stranger with many fair words he stood there still with a hand on christen's shoulder while he answered her comrade we must take these birds along said he to his men who stood holding the two germans they were from a rostock ship they said we must have them along with us to the town that they may be sent to the black hole but first must we take these two maids home to the convent you can find some thongs i trow to bind them with mean you the maids Aralon? asked one of the men they were young stout well-appointed yeomen and were in a high feather from the tussle their master frowned and seemed about to answer sharply but christen laid her hand upon his sleeve let them go dear sir she shuddered a little loath would we be in truth both my sister and i this matter should be talked of the stranger looked down at her he bit his lip and nodded as though he understood her then he gave each of the captives a blow on the nape with the flat of his sword which sent them sprawling forwards run for it then he said kicking them and both scrambled up and took to their heels as fast as they could then he turned again to the maidens and asked if they would please to ride ingeborg let herself be lifted into arlen's saddle but it was soon plain that she could not keep her seat she slid down again at once he looked at christen doubtfully and she said that she was used to ride on a man's saddle he took hold of her below the knees and lifted her up a sweet and happy thrill ran through her to feel how carefully he held her from him as though afraid to come near her at home no one had ever minded how tight they held her when they helped her onto a horse she felt marvellously honoured and uplifted the knight as ingeborg called him though he had but silver spurs now offered that maiden his hand and his men sprang to their saddles 
Ingeborg would have it that they should ride round the town to the northward, below the Rheinberg and Marchestolke, and not through the streets. First she gave as a reason that Sir Arlon and his men were fully armed, were they not? The knight answered gravely that the ban on carrying arms was not over strict at any time, for travellers at least, and now everyone in the town was out on a wild beast hunt. Then she said she was fearful of the pards. Christen saw full well that Ingebjorg was fain to go by the longest and loneliest road, that she might have the more talk with Arlon. "'This is the second time this evening that we hinder you, good sir,' said she, and Arlon answered soberly. "'Tis no matter. I am bound no further than to Gerderud to-night, and tis light the whole night long.' It liked Christen well that he jested not, nor bantered them, but talked to her as though she were his like, or even more than his like. She thought of Simon. She had not met other young men of courtly breeding, but twas true this man seemed older than Simon. They rode down into the valley below the Rheinberg hills and up along the back. The path was narrow, and the young bushes swung wet, heavily scented branches against her. It was a little darker down here, and the air was cool, and the leaves all dewy along the beck path. They went slowly, and the horse's hoofs sounded muffled on the damp, grass-grown path. She rocked gently in the saddle. Behind her she heard Ingebjorg's chatter and the stranger's deep, quiet voice. He said little, and answered as if his mind wandered. It sounded almost as if his mood were like her own, she thought. She felt strangely drowsy yet safe and content now that all the day's chances were safely over it was like waking to come out of the woods on to the green slopes under the martestoka hills the sun was gone down and the town and the bay lay below them in a clear pale light above the ochre ridges there was a light yellow strip edging the pale blue sky in the evening hush sounds were borne to them from far off as they came out of the cool depths of the wood a cart-wheel creaked somewhere upon a road, dogs on the farms bayed at each other across the valley, and from the woods behind them birds trilled and sang full-throated now the sun was down. Smoke was in the air from the fires on lands under clearance, and out in a field there was the red flare of a bonfire. Against the great ruddy flame the clearness of the night seemed a kind of darkness." They were riding between the fences of the convent fields, when the stranger spoke to her again. He asked her what she thought best. Should he go with her to the gate, and ask for speech of the Lady Groa, so that he might tell her how this thing had come about? But Ingebjorg would have it that they should steal in through the church. Then maybe they might slip into the convent without anyone knowing they had been away so much too long. It might be her kinsfolk's visit had made Sister Potentia forget them. The open place before the west door of the church was empty and still, and it came not into Christen's thoughts to wonder at this, though there was wont to be much life there of an evening with folks from the neighborhood who came to the nun's church, and round about were houses wherein lay servants and commoners dwelt. They said farewell to Arlon here. Christen stood and stroked his horse. It was black and had a comely head and soft eyes she thought it like Morvan, whom she had been wont to ride at home when she was a child. "'What is your horse's name, sir?' she asked, as it turned its head from her and snuffed at its master's breast. "'Bayard,' said he, looking at her over the horse's neck. "'You ask my horse's name, but not mine.' "'I would be fain to know your name, sir,' she replied, and bent her head a little. "'I am called Erlon Nicholson,' said he. "'Then, Erlon Nicholson,' "'Have thanks for your good service this night,' said Christen, and proffered him her hand. Of a sudden she flushed red, and half withdrew her hand from his. "'Lady Oshild Gautas, daughter of Dovre, is she your kinswoman?' she asked. To her wonder she saw that he too blushed. He dropped her hand suddenly, and answered, "'She is my mother's sister, and I am Arla Nicholson of Husseby.' He looked at her so strangely that she became still more abashed, but she mastered herself and said, "'Tis true I should have thanked you with better words, Arlon Nicholson, but I know not what I can say to you.' He bowed before her, and she felt that now she must bid him good-bye, though she would fain have spoken more with him. In the church door she turned, and as she saw that Arlon still stood beside his horse, she waved her hand to him in farewell." The convent was in a hubbub, and all within in great dismay. 
Holken had sent word home by a horseman, while he himself went, seeking the maids in the town, and folks had been sent from the convent to help him. The nuns had heard the wild beasts had killed and eaten up two children down in the town. This, to be sure, was a lie, and the pard, there was only one, had been caught before vespers by some men from the king's palace. Christen stood with bent head and kept silence, while the abbess and sister Potentia poured out their wrath upon the two maidens. She felt as though something were asleep within her. Ingeborg wept and began to make excuse. They had gone out with sister Potentia's leave, with fitting attendance, and sure they were not to blame for what had happened after. But Lady Groa said they might now stay in the church till the hour of midnight struck, that they might strive to turn their thoughts to the things of the spirit, and might thank God who had saved their lives and honor. God hath now manifested clearly to you the truth about the world, said she. Wild beasts and the servants of the devil threaten his children there at every footstep, and there is no salvation except you hold fast to him with prayer and supplication. She gave them each a lighted candle and bade them go with Sister Cecilia Bird's daughter, who was often alone in the church praying the whole night long. Kristen put her candle upon St. Lawrence's altar and knelt on the praying stool. She fixed her gaze on the flame while she said over the Pater Noster and the Ave Maria softly, the sheen of the candles seemed little by little to enfold her and to shut out all that was outside her and the light. She felt her heart open and overflow with thankfulness and praise and love of God and his gentle mother. They came so near to her. She had always known they saw her, but tonight she felt that it was so. She saw the world as in a vision, a great dark room wherein too fell a sunbeam, the motes were dancing in and out between the darkness and the light, and she felt that now she had at last slipped into the sunbeam. She felt she would gladly have stayed forever in this dark, still church, with the few small spots of light like golden stars in the night, the sweet, stale scent of incense, and the warm smell of the burning wax, and she at rest within her own star. It was as if some great joy were at an end when Sister Cecilia came gliding to her and touched her shoulder. Bending before the altars, the three women went out of the little south door into the convent close. Ingeborg was so sleepy that she went to bed without a word. Kristen was glad. She had been loath to have her good thoughts broken in on, and she was glad, too, that they must keep on their shifts at night. Ingeborg was so fat and had been so over-hot. She lay awake long, but the deep flood of sweetness that she had left, lifting her up as she knelt in the church, would not come again. Yet she felt the warmth of it within her still. She thanked God with all her heart, and thought she felt her spirit strengthened while she prayed for her father and mother and sisters, and for Arne Gertsen's soul father she thought she longed so much for him for all they had been to one another before simon dara came into their lives there welled up in her a new tenderness for him there was as it were a foretaste of mother's love and care in her love for her father this night dimly she felt that there was so much in life that he had missed she called to mind the old black wooden church at gerderud she had seen there this last Easter the graves of her three little brothers and of her grandmother, her father's own mother, Kristen Sigurd's daughter, who died when she brought him into the world. What could Erlon Nicholson have to do at Gerderud? She could not think. She had no knowledge that she had thought much of him that evening, but the whole time the thought of his dark, narrow face and his quiet voice had hung somewhere in the dusk outside the glow of light that enfolded her spirit. When she awoke the next morning, the sun was shining into the dormitory, and Ingeborg told her how Lady Groa herself had bidden the lay sisters not to wake them for matins. She had said that when they woke they might go over to the kitchen house and get some food. Kristen grew warm with gladness at the abbess's kindness. It seemed as if the whole world had been good to her. End of chapter 2
Book Two, Chapter Three of *The Bridal Wreath* by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: The Farmer Guild of Acre had Saint Margaret for their patroness, and they began their festival each year on the twentieth of July, the day of Saint Margaret's Mass. In that day, the guild brothers and sisters, with their children, their guests, and their serving folk, gathered at Acre's church and heard mass at Saint Margaret's altar there after that they wended their way to the hall of the guild which lay near the hofwin hospital there they were wont to hold a drinking feast lasting five days but since both Acker's church and the hofwin spittal belonged to nona setter and as besides many of the Acker families were tenants of the convent it had come to be the custom that the abbess and some of the elder sisters should honour the guild by coming to the feasting on the first day and those of the young maids who were at the convent only to learn and were not to take the veil had leave to go with them and to dance in the evening therefore at this feast they wore their own clothes and not the convent habit and so there was great stir and bustle in the novices sleeping-rooms on the eve of st margaret's mass the maids who were to go to the guild feast ransacking their chests and making ready their finery while the others less fortunate went about something moodily and looked on some had set small pots in the fireplace and were boiling water to make their skin white and soft others were making a brew to be smeared on the hair then they parted the hair into strands and twisted them tightly round strips of leather and this gave them curling wavy tresses ingeborg brought out all the finery she had but could not think what she should wear come what might not her best leaf-green velvet dress that was too good and too costly for such a peasant rout but a little thin sister who was not to go with them helga was her name she had been vowed to the convent by her father and mother while still a child took christen aside and whispered she was sure ingeborg would wear the green dress and her pink silk shift too you have ever been kind to me christen said helga it beseems me little to meddle in such doings but i will tell you none the less the knight who brought you home that evening in the spring i have seen and heard ingeborg talking with him since they spoke together in the church and he has tarried for her up in the hollow when she hath gone to ingon at the commoner's house but tis you he asks for and ingeborg has promised him to bring you there along with her but i wager you have not heard aught of this before true it is that ingeborg has said naught of this said christen she pursed up her mouth that the other might not see the smile that would come out so this was ingeborg's way <laughs> tis like she knows i am not of such as to run trysts with strange men round house corners and behind fences said she proudly then i might have spared myself the pains of bringing you tidings whereof twould have been seemly i should say no word said helga wounded and they parted but the whole evening christen was put to it not to smile when any one was looking at her next morning ingeborg went dallying about in her shift till christen saw she meant not to dress before she herself was ready christen said not but laughed as she went to her chest and took out her golden yellow silken shift she had never worn it before and it felt so soft and cool as it slipped down over her body it was broidered with goodly work in silver and blue and brown silk about the neck and down upon the breast as much as should be seen above the low-cut gown there were sleeves to match too she drew on her linen hose and laced up the small purple-blue shoes which hawken by good luck had saved that day of commotion ingeborg gazed at her then christen said laughing my father ever taught me never to show disdain of those beneath us but tis like you are too grand to deck yourself in your best for poor tenants and peasant folk red as a berry ingeborg slipped her woolen smock down over her white hips and hurried on the pink silk shift christen threw over her own head her best velvet gown it was violet blue 
deeply cut out at the bosom, with long slashed sleeves flowing well nigh to the ground. She fastened the gilt belt about her waist and hung her gray squirrel cape over her shoulders. Then she spread her masses of yellow hair out over her shoulders and back and fitted the golden fillet, chased with small roses, upon her brow. She saw that Helga stood watching them. Then she took from her chest a great silver clasp. It was that she had on her cloak the night Bentane met her on the highway, and she had never cared to wear it since. She went to Helga and said, in a low voice, "'I know twas your wish to show me good will last night. Think me not unthankful.' And with that she gave her the clasp." Ingeborg was a fine sight, too, when she stood fully decked in her green gown, with a red silk cloak over her shoulders, and her fair curly hair waving behind her. They had ended by striving to outdress each other, thought Kristen, and she laughed. The morning was cool and fresh with dew, as the procession went forth from Nona Setter, and wound its way westward toward Frisia. The hay-making was near at an end here on the lowlands, but along the fences grew bluebells and yellow crowsfoot in clumps. In the fields the barley was in ear and bent its heads in pale silvery waves, just tinged with pink. Here and there, where the path was narrow and led through the fields, the corn all but met about folk's knees. Hawken walked at the head, bearing the convent's banner with the Virgin Mary's picture upon the blue silken cloth. After him walked the servants and the commoners, and then came the Lady Groa and four old sisters, on horseback, while behind these came the young maidens on foot, their many-hued holiday attire flaunted and shone in the sunlight. Some of the commoners' womenfolk and a few armed serving-men closed the train. They sang as they went over the bright fields, and the folk they met at the byways stood aside and gave them reverent greeting. All round, out on the fields, they could see small groups of men coming walking and riding, for folks were drawing toward the church from every house and every farm. Soon they heard behind them the sound of hymns chanted in men's deep voices, and the banner of the Hovedu Monastery rose above a hillock, the red silk shone in the sun, swaying and bending to the step of the bearer. The mighty metal voice of the bells rang out above the neighing and screaming of stallions as the procession climbed the last slope to the church. Kristen had never seen so many horses at one time, a heaving, restless sea of horses' backs round about the green before the church door. Upon the sward stood and sat lay folk dressed in all their best, but all rose in reverence as the virgin's flag from Nonoseter was borne in amongst them, and all bowed deeply before the Lady Groa. It seemed as though more folk had come than the church could hold, but for those from the convent room had been kept in front near the altar. Straightway after them the Cistercian monks from Hovedu marched in and went up into the choir, and forthwith song burst from the throats of men and boys and filled the church. Soon after the mass had begun, when the service brought all to their feet, Kristen caught sight of Erlon Nicholson. He was tall, and his head rose above those about him. She saw his face from the side. He had a high, steep, and narrow forehead, and a large, straight nose. It jutted triangle-like from his face, and was strangely thin about the fine, quivering nostrils. Something about it reminded Kristen of a restless, high-strung stallion. His face was not as comely as she had thought it, the long-drawn lines running down to his small, weak, yet well-formed mouth gave it, as twere, a touch of joylessness. Ay, but yet he was comely. He turned his head and saw her. She knew not how long they stood thus, looking into each other's eyes. From that time she thought of naught but the end of the Mass. She waited, intent on what would then befall. There was some pressing and thronging as the folks made their way out from the overcrowded church. Ingeborg held Kristen back till they were at the rear of the throng. She gained her point. They were quite cut off from the nuns, who went out first. The two girls were among the last in coming to the offertory box and out of the church. Erlon stood without, just by the door, beside the priest from Gerderud, and a stoutish red-faced man, splendid in blue velvet. Erlon himself was clad in silk, 
but of a sober hue a long coat of brown figured with black and a black cloak with a pattern of small yellow hawks inwoven they greeted each other and crossed the green together to where the men's horses stood tethered while they spoke of the fine weather the goodly mass and the great crowd of folk that were mustered the fat ruddy knight he bore golden spurs and was named sir munan bardson took ingebjorg by the hand twas plain he was mightily taken with the maid erlon and christen fell behind they were silent as they walked there was a great to-do upon the church green as folk began to ride away horses jostled one another people shouted some angry others laughing many sat in pairs upon the horses men had their wives behind them or their children in front upon the saddle youths swung themselves up beside a friend they could see the church banners the nuns and the priests far down the hill already sir munin rode by ingebjorg sat in front of him his arm about her both of them called out and waved then erlen said my serving men are both with me they could ride one horse and you have haftors if you would rather have it so christen flushed as she replied we are so far behind the others already i see not your serving men hereabouts and <laughs> then she broke into a laugh and erlon smiled he sprang to the saddle and helped her to a seat behind him at home christen had often sat thus sidewise behind her father after she had grown too big to ride astride the horse still she felt a little bashful and none too safe as she laid a hand upon erlon's shoulder the other she put on the horse's back to steady herself they rode slowly down towards the bridge in a while christen thought she must speak since he was silent so she said we looked not sir to meet you here to-day looked you not to meet me asked erlon turning his head did not ingebjorg philippus daughter bear you my greeting then no said christen i heard not of any greeting she hath not named you once since you came to our help last may said she guilefully she was not sorry that ingebjorg's falseness should come to light erlon did not look back again but she could hear by his voice that he was smiling when he asked again but the little dark one the novice i mind not her name her i even feed to bear you my greeting christen blushed but she had to laugh too ay tis but helga's due i should say that she earned her fee she said erlon moved his head a little his neck almost touched her hand christen shifted her hand at once further out on his shoulder somewhat uneasily she thought maybe she had been more bold than was fitting seeing she had come to this feast after a man had in a manner made tryst with her there soon after erlon asked will you dance with me to-night christen i know not sir answered the maid you think mayhap tis not seemly he asked and as she did not answer he said again it may well be it is not so but i thought now maybe you might deem you would be none the worse if you took my hand in the dance to-night but indeed tis eight years since i stood up to dance how may that be sir asked christen mayhap you are wedded but then it came into her head that had he been a wedded man to have made tryst with her thus would have been no fair deed of him on that she tried to mend her speech saying maybe you have lost your betrothed maid or your wife erlon turned quickly and looked at her with strange eyes hath not lady oshild why grew you red when you heard who i was that evening he asked a little after christen flushed red once more but did not answer then erlon asked again i would fain know what my mother's sister said to you of me not else said christen quickly but in your praise she said you were so comely and so great of kin that <laughs> she said that besides such as you and her kin we were of no such great account my folk and i thus she still talk thus living the life she lives said erlon and laughed bitterly <laughs> ay ay if it comfort her said she not else of me what should she have said asked christen 
she knew not why she was grown so strangely heavy-hearted oh she must have said he spoke in a low voice looking down she might have said that i had been under the church's ban and had to pay dear for peace and atonement Kristen was silent a long time then she said softly there is many a man who is not master of his own fortunes so have i heard said tis little i have seen of the world but i will never believe of you erlan that twas for any dishonourable deed may god reward you for those words Kristen said erlan and bent his head and kissed her wrist so vehemently that the horse gave a bound beneath them when erlan had it in hand again he said earnestly dance with me to-night then Kristen. afterwards i will tell how things are with me will tell you all but to-night we will be happy together Kristen answered ay and they rode a while in silence but ere long erlon began to ask of lady oshild and Kristen told all she knew of her she praised her much then all doors are not barred against bjorn and oshild asked erlon Kristen said they were thought much of and that her father and many with him deemed that most of the tales about these two were untrue how liked you my kinsman moon and bardson asked erlon laughing slyly i looked not much upon him said Kristen, and methought too he was not much to look on knew you not asked erlon that he is her son son to lady oshild said Kristen in great wonder ay her children could not take their mother's fair looks though they took all else said erlon i have never known her first husband's name said Kristen they were two brothers who wedded two sisters said erlon bard and nicholas munensen my father was the elder my mother was his second wife but he had no children by his first bard whom oshild wedded was not young either nor i trow did they ever live happily together i i was a little child when all this befell they hid from me as much as they could but she fled the land with sir bjorn and married him against the will of her kin when bard was dead then folk would have had the wedding set aside they made out that bjorn had sought her bed while her first husband was still living and that they had plotted together to put away my father's brother tis clear they could not bring this home to them since they had to leave them together in wedlock but to make amends they had to forfeit all their estate bjorn had killed their sister's son too my mother's and oshild's i mean Kristen's heart beat hard at home her father and mother had kept strict watch that no unclean talk should come to the ears of their children or of young folk but still things had happened in their parish and Kristen had heard of them a man had lived in adultery with a wedded woman that was horror-dumb one of the worst of sins twas said they plotted the husband's death and that brought with it outlawry and the church's ban lavrens had said no woman was bound to stay with her husband if he had had to do with another's wife the state of a child gotten in adultery could never be mended not even though its father and mother were free to wed afterward a man might bring into his family and make his heir his child by any wanton or strolling beggar woman but not the child of his adultery not if its mother came to be a knight's lady she thought of the misliking she had ever felt for sir bjorn with his bleached face and fat yet shrunken body she could not think how lady oshild could be so good and yielding at all times to the man who had led her away into such shame how such a gracious woman could have let herself be beguiled by him he was not even good to her he let her toil and moil with all the farm work bjorn did not but drink beer yet oshild was ever mild and gentle when she spoke with her husband Kristen wondered if her father could know all this since he had asked sir bjorn to their home now she came to think too it seemed strange erlon should think fit to tell such tales of his near kin but like enough he deemed she knew of it already i would like well 
said Erlon in a while, to visit her, Moster Asild, some day when I journey northwards. Is he comely still, Bjorn, my kinsman? No, said Kristen. He looks like hay that has lain the winter through upon the fields. And I, I, it tells upon a man, I trow, said Erland, with the same bitter smile. Never have I seen so fair a man. Tis twenty years since I was but a lad then, but his like have I never seen. A little after they came to the hospital. It was an exceeding great and fine place, with many houses both of stone and of wood, houses for the sick, almhouses, hostels for travellers, a chapel and a house for the priest. There was great bustle in the courtyard, for food was being made ready in the kitchen of the hospital for the guild feast, and the poor and sick, too, that were dwelling in the place, were to be feasted on the best this day. The hall of the guild was beyond the garden of the hospital, and folks took their way thither through the herb garden, for this was of great renown. Lady Groa had had brought hither plants that no one had heard of in Norway before, and moreover all plants that else folks were used to grow in gardens throve better in her herberies, both flowers and pot herbs and healing herbs. She was a most learned woman in all such matters, and had herself put into the Norse tongue the herbals of the Salernitan school. Lady Groa had been more than ever kind to Kristen, since she had marked that the maid knew somewhat of herb lore, and was fain to know yet more of it. So Kristen named for Erlon what grew in the beds on either side the grassy path they walked on. In the midday sun there was a warm and spicy scent of dill and celery, garlic and roses, southern wood and wallflower. Beyond the shadeless baking herb garden the fruit orchards looked cool and enticing. Red cherries gleamed amid the dark leafy tops, and the apple trees drooped their branches heavy with green fruit. About the garden was a hedge of sweet briar. There were some flowers on it still. They looked the same as other briar roses, but in the sun the leaves smelt of wine and apples. Folk plucked sprays to deck themselves as they went past. Kristen, too, took some roses and hung them on her temples, fixed under her golden fillet. One she kept in her hand. After a time, Erlon took it, saying no word. A while he bore it in his hand as they walked, then fastened it with a brooch upon his breast. He looked awkward and bashful as he did it, and was so clumsy that he pricked his fingers till they bled. Broad tables were spread in the loft room of the guild's hall, two by the main walls for the men and the women, and two smaller boards out on the floor where children and young folk sat side by side. At the woman's board Lady Groa was in the high seat. The nuns and the chief of the married women sat on the inner bench along the wall, and the unwedded women on the outer benches, the maids from Nonasetter at the upper end. Kristen knew that Erlon was watching her, but she durst not turn her head, even once, either when they rose or when they sat down. Only when they got up at last to hear the priest read the names of the dead guild brothers and sisters, she stole a hasty glance at the men's table. She caught a glimpse of him where he stood by the wall, behind the candles burning on the board. He was looking at her. The meal lasted long with all the toasts in honor of God, the Virgin Mary, and St. Margaret, and St. Olaf, and St. Halvard, and prayers and song between. Kristen saw through the open door that the sun was gone, sounds of fiddling and song came in from the green without, and all the young folks had left the tables already when Lady Groa said to the convent maidens that they might go now and play themselves for a time if they listed. Three red bonfires were burning upon the green. Around them moved the many-colored chains of dancers. The fiddlers sat aloft on heaped-up chests and scraped their fiddles. They played and sang a different tune in every ring. There were too many folk for one dance. It was nearly dark already. Northward, the wooded ridge stood out coal-black against the yellow-green sky. Under the loft balcony, folk were sitting, drinking. Some men sprang forward, as soon as the six maids from Nonasetter came down the steps. Moon and Bardson flew to meet Ingebjorg and went off with her, and Kristen was caught by the wrist. Erlan, she knew his hand already. He pressed her hand in his, so that their rings grated on one another and bruised the flesh. 
he drew her with him to the outermost bonfire many children were dancing there christen gave her other hand to a twelve-year-old lad and erlon had a little half-grown maid on his other side no one was singing in the ring just then they were swaying in and out to the tune of the fiddle as they moved round then someone shouted that Sivord the Dane should sing the Manu dance. A tall, fair-haired man with huge fists stepped out in front of the chain and struck up his ballad. Fair goes the dance at Moncombe, on silver sand. There danceth Ivar Sir Alfson, holds the queen's own hand. Know ye not, Ivar Sir Alfson? The fiddlers knew not the tune. They thrummed their strings a little, and the Dane sang alone. He had a strong, tuneful voice. Mind you, queen of the Danemen, that summer fair, they led you out of Sweden to Denmark here. They led you out of Sweden to Denmark here, all with a crown of the red gold and many a tear. All with a crown of the red gold and tear field ein. Mind you, queen of the Danemen, you first were mine. The fiddles struck in again. The dancers hummed the new-learned tune and joined in the burden. And are you, Ivar Sir Alfson, sworn man to me? Then shall you hang to-morrow on the gallows tree. But twas Ivar Sir Alfson, all unafraid, he leaped into the gold bark in harness clad. God send to you, O Dane Queen, so many a good night, as in the high heavens are stars alight. God send to you, O Dane King, so many ill years, as be leaves on the linden or the hind hath hairs. Know ye not, Ivar Sir Alfson. It was far on in the night, and the fires were but heaps of embers growing more and more black. Christen and Erlon stood hand in hand under the trees by the garden fence. Behind them the noise of the revellers was hushed. A few young lads were hopping around the glowing mounds, singing softly. But the fiddlers had sought their resting places, and most of the people were gone. One or two wives went round seeking their husbands, who were lying somewhere out of doors, overcome by the beer. "'Where think you I can have laid my cloak?' whispered Christen. Erlon put his arm about her waist and drew his mantle round them both. Close pressed to one another, they went into the herb garden. A lingering breath of the day's warm, spicy scents, deadened and damp with the chill of the dew, met them in there the night was very dark the sky overcast with murky gray clouds close down upon the treetops but they could tell that there were other folks in the garden once erlon pressed the maiden close to him and asked in a whisper are you not afraid christen in her mind she caught a faint glimpse of the world outside this night and knew that this was madness but a blessed strengthlessness was upon her. She leaned closer to the man and whispered softly. She herself knew not what. They came to the end of the path. A stone wall divided them from the woods. Erlon helped her up. As she jumped down on the other side, he caught her and held her lifted in his arms a moment before he set her on the grass. She stood with upturned face to take his kiss. He held her head between his hands. It was so sweet to her to feel his fingers sink into her hair. She felt she must repay him, and so she clasped his head and sought to kiss him as he had kissed her. When he put his hands upon her breast, she felt as though he drew her heart from out her bosom. He parted the folds of silk ever so little and laid a kiss betwixt them. It sent the glow into her inmost soul. You I could never harm whispered Erlon, you should never shed a tear through fault of mine. Never had I dreamed a maid might be so good as you, my Christen. He drew her down into the grass beneath the bushes. They sat with their backs against the wall. Christen said not, but when he ceased from caressing her, she put up her hand and touched his face. In a while Erlon asked, Are you not weary, my dear one? and when Christen nestled in to his breast, he folded his arms around her and whispered, Sleep, Christen, here in my arms. She slipped deeper and deeper into darkness and warmth and happiness upon his breast. When she came to herself again, she was lying outstretched in the grass with her cheek upon the soft brown silk above his knees. 
Erlon was sitting as before with his back to the stone wall. His face looked gray in the gray twilight, but his wide-opened eyes were marvelously clear and fair. She saw he had wrapped his cloak all about her. Her feet were so warm and snug with the fur lining around them. Now have you slept in my lap, said he, smiling faintly. May God bless you, Kristen. You slept as safe as a child in its mother's arms. Have you not slept, Sir Erlon? asked Kristen, and he smiled down into her fresh opened eyes. Maybe the night will come when you and I may lie down to sleep together. I know not what you will think when you have weighed all things. I have watched by you to-night. There is still so much betwixt us two, that tis more than if there had laid a naked sword between you and me. Tell me, if you will hold me dear, when this night is past. I will hold you dear, Sir Erlon, said Kristen. I will hold you dear, so long as you will, and thereafter I will love none other. Then, said Erlon slowly, may God forsake me if any maid or woman come to my arms ere i may make you mine in law and honour say you this too he prayed kristen said may god forsake me if i take any other man to my arms so long as i live on earth we must go now said erlon a little after before folk waken they passed along without the wall among the bushes have you bethought you asked erlon what further must be done in this tis for you to say what we must do erlon answered kristen your father he asked in a little they say at gerderud he is a mild and a righteous man think you he will be so exceeding loath to go back from what he hath agreed with andre stara father has said so often he would never force us his daughters said kristen the chief thing is that our lands and Simon's lie so fitly together. But I trow father would not that I should miss all my gladness in this world for the sake of that. A fear stirred within her that so simple as this perhaps it might not prove to be. But she fought it down. Then maybe twill be less hard than I deemed in the night, said Erlon. God help me, Kristen. Methinks I cannot lose you now unless i win you now never can i be glad again they parted among the trees and in the dawning light kristen found her way to the guest chamber where the women from nonaceter were to lie all the beds were full but she threw a cloak upon some straw on the floor and laid her down in all her clothes when she awoke it was far on in the day ingeborg philippa's daughter was sitting on a bench near by stitching down an edge of fur that had been torn loose on her cloak she was full of talk as ever. "'Were you with Erla Nicholson the whole night?' she asked. "'Twere well you went warily with that lad, Kristen. How think you Simon Anderson would like it if you came to be dear friends with him?' Kristen found a hand-basin and began to wash herself. "'And your betrothed think you he would like that you danced with Dumpy Moonen last night? Surely we must dance with him who chooses us out on such a night of merry-making.' and Lady Groa had given us leave. Ingeborg shawed. Einar Einarsson and Sir Munin are friends, and besides he is wedded and old. Ugly he is to boot, for that matter, but likable, and hath becoming ways. See what he gave me for a remembrance of last night? And she held forth a gold clasp which Kristen had seen in Sir Munin's hat the day before. But this Erlon, tis true he was freed of the ban at easter last year but they say aileen orm's daughter has been with him at husaby since sir moonen says erlon hath fled to sira yon at gerderud and he deems tis because he cannot trust himself not to fall back into sin if he meet her again kristen crossed over to the other her face was white knew you not this said ingeborg that he lured a woman from her husband somewhere in halogaland in the north and held her with him at his manor in despite of the king's command and the archbishop's ban 
they had two children together and he was driven to fly to sweden and hath been forced to pay and forfeit so much of his lands and goods sir moonan says he will be a poor man in the end unless he mend his ways the sooner think not but that i know all this said christen with a set face but tis known the matter is ended now ay but as to that sir moonan said there had been an end between them so many times before said ingeborg pensively but all these things can be nothing to you you that are to wed simon dara but a comely man is erlon nicholson sure enough the company from Nonnesetter was to set out for home that same day after Nones. Kristen had promised Erlon to meet him by the wall where they had sat the night before, if she could but find a way to come. He was lying face downwards in the grass with his head upon his hands. As soon as he saw her, he sprang to his feet and held out both his hands as she was about jumping from the wall. Kristen took them, and the two stood a little hand in hand. Then said Kristen, why did you tell me that of sir bjorn and lady oshild yesterday i can see you know it all said erlon and let go her hands suddenly what think you of me now christen i was eighteen then he went on vehemently tis ten years since that the king my kinsman sent me with the mission to vargoyas and we stayed the winter at steigen she was wife to the lagmand sigurd saxelsen i thought pity of her for he was old and ugly beyond belief i know not how it came to pass i but i loved her too i bade sigurd crave what amends he would i would fain have done right by him he is a good and doughty man in many ways but he would have it that all must go by law he took the matter to the king i was to be branded for whoredom with the wife of him whose guest i had been you, you understand then it came to my father's ears and then to king hawkins he he drove me from his court and if you must know the whole there is not more now betwixt elena and me save the children and she cares not much for them they are in Ersterdal upon a farm i owned there i have given it to orm the boy but she will not stay with them doubtless she reckons that sigurd cannot live for ever but i know not what she would be at sigurd took her back again but she says she fared like a dog and a bondwoman in his house so she set a tryst with me at nidaros twas little better for me at husaby with my father i sold all i could lay hands on and fled with her to halland count jacob stood my friend could i do aught else she was great with my child i knew many a man had lived even so with another's wife and had got off cheap enough if he were rich that is but so it is with king hawken he is hardest upon his own kin we were away from one another for a year but then my father died and then she came back then there were other troubles my tenants denied me rent and would have no speech with my bailiffs because i lay under ban i on my side dealt harshly with them and so they brought suit against me for robbery but i had not the money to pay my housefolk withal and you can see i was too young to meet these troubles wisely and my kinsfolk would not help me save moonan he did all his wife would let him ay now you know it christen i have lost much both of lands and goods and of honour true it is you would be better served if you held fast to simon andresen christen put her arms about his neck we will abide by what we swore to each other yesternight erlon if so be you think as i do erlon drew her close to him kissed her and said you will see too trust me that all things will be changed with me now for none in the world has power on me now but you oh my thoughts were many last night as you slept upon my lap my fairest one so much power the devil cannot have over a man that i should ever work you care and woe you my dearest life End of chapter three Book Two, Chapter Four of *The Bridal Wreath* by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. 
At the time he dwelt at Skog, Lavrens Bjorgelsen had made gifts of land to Gerderud Church, that masses for the souls of his father and mother might be said on their death days. Bjorgolf Kettelsen's day was the 13th of August, and Lavrens had settled with his brother that this year Osmond should bring Kristen out to Skog, that she might be at the mass. She went in fear that something should come in the way, so that her uncle would not keep his promise. She thought she had marked that Osmond did not care overmuch about her. But the day before the mass was to be, Osmond Bjorgolfsson came to the convent to fetch his brother's daughter. Kristen was told to clothe herself in lay garb, but simply and in dark garments. There had been some carping at the sisters of Nonaceter for going about too much without the convent walls. Therefore the bishop had given order that the maidens who were not to take the veil must wear not like to the habit of the order when they went visiting their kinsfolk, so that laymen could not mistake them for novices or nuns. Kristen's heart was full of gladness as she rode along the highway with her uncle, and Osmond grew more friendly and merry with her when he saw the maid was not so tongue-tied, after all, with folk. Otherwise Osmond was somewhat moody and downcast. He said it looked as though there would be a call to arms in the autumn, and that the king would lead an army into Sweden to avenge the slaying of his son-in-law and the husband of his niece. Kristen had heard of the murder of the Swedish dukes, and thought it a most foul deed. Yet all these questions of state seemed far away from her. No one spoke much of such things at home in the Dale. She remembered, too, that her father had been to the war against Duke Eirik at Ranhildarholm and Koningahela. Then Osmond told her of all that had come and gone between the king and the dukes. Kristen understood but little of this, but she gave careful heed to all her uncle told her of the making and breaking of the betrothals of the king's daughters. It gave her comfort to think, t'was not everywhere as it was at home in her countryside, that a betrothal once fixed by word of mouth was held to bind nigh as fast as a wedding. Then she took courage to tell of her adventure on the evening before the halvard wake, and asked her uncle if he knew Erlon of Hussaby. Osmond spoke well of Erlon, said he had guided his affairs unwisely, but his father and the king were most to blame. They had borne themselves as though the young lad were a very limb of the devil, only because he had fallen into this misfortune. The king was over-pious in such matters, and Sir Nicholas was angry because Erlon had lost much good land, so they had thundered about whoredom and hell-fire, and there must be a bit of the daredevil in every likely lad, said Osmond Bjorgelfsson, and the woman was most fair. But you have no call now to look Erlon's way, so trouble yourself no more about his doings. Erlon came not to the mass, as he had promised Kristen he would, and she thought about this more than of God's word. She felt no sorrow that this was so. She had only that strange new feeling that she was cut off from all the ties that she had felt binding on her before. She tried to take comfort. Like enough, Erlon deemed it wisest that no one in whose charge she was should come to know of their friendship at this time. She could understand herself that twas wise, but her heart had longed so for him, and she wept when she had gone to rest in the loft room, where she was to sleep with Osmond's little daughters. The day after, she went up into the wood with the youngest of her uncle's children, a little maid of six years. When they were come to the pastures among the woods a little way off, Erlon came running after them. Kristen knew it was he, before she had seen who was coming. "'I have sat up here on the hill, spying down into the cart-yard the whole day,' said he i thought surely you would find a chance to come out think you i came out to meet you then said kristen laughing and are you not afraid to beat about my uncle's woods with dogs and bow your uncle gave me leave to take my pastime hunting here said erlon and the dogs are osmond's they found me out this morning he patted them and lifted the little girl up in his arms you know me randid but say not you have spoken with me, and you can have this. And he took out a bunch of raisins and gave them to the child. I had brought them for you, he said to Kristen. Think you this child can hold her tongue? 
they talked fast and laughed together erlon was dressed in a short close-fitting brown jacket and had a small red silk cap pulled down over his black hair he looked so young he laughed and played with the child but sometimes he would take christen's hand and press it till it hurt her he spoke of the rumours of war and was glad twill be easier for me to win back the king's friendship said he and then will all things be easy he said vehemently at last they sat down in a meadow up among the woods erlon had the child on his lap christen sat by his side under cover of the grass he played with her fingers he pressed into her hand three gold rings bound together by a cord by and by he whispered you shall have as many as will go on your fingers i shall wait for you here on this field each day about this time as long as you are at skog he said as they parted and you must come if you can the next day osmond bjorgelson set out with his wife and children to the manor of Gerrit's kin at hadeland they had been scared by the talk of war the folk about gallo still went in terror since duke eirik's harrying of that countryside some years before osmond's old mother was so fearful she was minded to seek shelter in nonsetter besides she was too weak to travel with the others so christen was to stay at skog with the old woman she called her grandmother till osmond came back from hadeland about the midday hour when the folk on the farm were resting christen went to the loft room where she slept she had brought some clothes with her in a sheepskin bag and now she changed her garments humming to herself the while her father had given her a dress of thick cotton stuff from the east sky blue with a close pattern of red flowers this she put on she brushed and combed out her hair and bound it back from her face with a red silk ribbon wound a red silk belt tightly about her waist and put erlon's rings upon her fingers all the time she wondered if he would think her fair the two dogs that had been with erlon in the forest had slept in the loft room overnight she called them to go with her now she stole out round the houses and took the same path as the day before up through the hill pastures the field amid the forest lay lonely and silent in the burning midday sun the pine woods that shut it in on all sides gave out a hot strong scent the sun stung and the blue sky seemed strangely near and close down upon the treetops christen sat down in the shade in the borders of the wood she was not vexed that erlon was not there she was sure he would come and it gave her an odd gladness to sit there alone a little and to be the first she listened to the low hum of tiny life above the yellow scorched grass pulled a few dry spicy scented flowers that she could reach without moving more than her hand and rolled them between her fingers and smelt them she sat with wide open eyes sunk in a kind of drowse she did not move when she heard a horse in the woods the dogs growled and the hair on their necks bristled then they bounded up over the meadow barking and wagging their tails erlon sprang from his horse at the edge of the forest let it go with a clap on its flank and ran down towards her with the dogs jumping about him he caught their muzzles in his hands and came to her leading the two elk-gray wolf-like beasts christen smiled and held out her hand without getting up once while she was looking at the dark head that lay in her lap between her hands something bygone flashed on her mind it stood out clear yet distant as a homestead far away on a mountain slope may start to sight of a sudden from out dark clouds when a sunbeam strikes it on a stormy day and it was as though there welled up in her heart all the tenderness arne gerdsen had once begged for while as yet she did not understand his words with timid passion she drew the man up to her and laid his head upon her breast kissing him as if afraid he should be taken from her and when she saw his head upon her arm she felt as though she clasped a child she hid his eyes with one of her hands and showered little kisses upon his mouth and cheek the sunshine had gone from the meadow the leaden colour above the tree-tops had thickened to dark blue and spread over the whole sky little coppery flashes like fire-tinged smoke flickered within the clouds bayard came down to them neighed loudly once and then stood stock still staring before him soon after came the first flash of lightning and the thunder followed close not far away 
Erlon got up and took hold of the horse. An old barn stood at the lowest end of the meadow. They went thither, and he tied Bayard to some woodwork just inside the door. At the back of the barn lay some hay. Erlon spread his cloak out, and they seated themselves with the dogs at their feet. And now the rain came down like a sheet before the doorway. It hissed in the trees and lashed the ground. Soon they had to move further in, away from the drips from the roof. Each time it lightened and thundered. Erlon whispered, Are you not afraid, Kristen? A little, she whispered back and drew closer to him. They knew not how long they had sat. The storm had soon passed over. It thundered far away. But the sun shone on the wet grass outside the door, and the sparkling drops fell more and more rarely from the roof. The sweet smell of the hay in the barn grew stronger. "'Now must I go,' said Kristen, and Erlon answered, "'Ay, tis like you must.' He took her foot in his hand. "'You will be wet. You must ride, and I must walk out of the woods.' And he looked at her so strangely. Kristen shook. It must be because her heart beat so, she thought. Her hands were cold and clammy. As he kissed her vehemently, she weakly tried to push him from her. Erlon lifted his face a moment. She thought of a man who had been given food at the convent one day. He had kissed the bread they gave him. She sank back upon the hay. She sat upright when Erlon lifted his head from her arms. He raised himself suddenly upon his elbow. "'Look not so, Kristen. His voice sent a new wild pang into Kristen's soul. He was not glad. He was unhappy, too. "'Kristen, think you I lured you out here to me in the woods, meaning this, to make you mine by force?' he asked in a little. She stroked his hair and did not look at him. "'Twas not force, I trow. You had let me go as I came, had I begged you?' said she in a low voice. "'I know not,' he answered and hid his face in her lap. "'Think you that I would betray you?' asked he vehemently. "'Christian, I swear to you, by my Christian faith, may God forsake me in my last hour, if I keep not faith with you till the day of my death.' She could say not. She only stroked his hair again and again. "'Tis time I went home, is it not?' she asked at length and she seemed to wait in deadly terror for his answer maybe so he answered dully he got up quickly and went to the horse and began to loosen the reins then she too got up slowly wearily and with crushing pain it came home to her she knew not what she had hoped he might do set her upon his horse maybe and carry her off with him so she might be spared from going back amongst other people it was as though her whole body ached with wonder that this ill thing was what was sung in all the songs and since erlon had wrought her this she felt herself grown so wholly his she knew not how she should live away from him any more she was to go from him now but she could not understand that it should be so down through the woods he went on foot leading the horse he held her hand in his but they found no words to say when they had come so far that they could see the houses at skog he bade her farewell kristen be not so sorrowful the day will come or ever you know it when you will be my wedded wife but her heart sank as he spoke must you go away then she asked dismayed as soon as you are gone from skulk said he and his voice already rang more bright if there be no war i will speak to munin he has long urged me that i should wed he will go with me and speak for me to your father kristen bent her head at each word he said she felt the time that lay before grew longer and more hard to think of the convent Jorngard, she seemed to float upon a stream which bore her far from it all sleep you alone in the loft room now your kinsfolk are gone asked erlon then will i come and speak with you to-night will you let me in i said kristen low and so they parted 
The rest of the day she sat with her father's mother, and after supper she took the old lady to her bed. Then she went up to the loft room where she was to lie. There was a little window in the room. Kristen sat herself down on the chest that stood below it. She had no mind to go to bed. She had longed to wait. It was quite dark without when she heard the soft steps upon the balcony. He knocked upon the door with his cloak about his knuckles, and Kristen got up, drew the bolt, and let Erlon in. She marked how glad he was when she flung her arms about his neck and clung to him. "'I have been fearing you would be angry with me,' he said. "'You must not grieve for our sin,' he said some time after. "'Tis not a deadly sin. God's law is not like to the law of the land in this. Gunolf, my brother, once made this matter plain to me. If two vow to have and hold each other fast for all time, and thereafter lie together, then they are wedded before God, and may not break their troths without great sin.' I can give you the words in Latin when they come to my mind. I knew them once. Kristen wondered a little why Erlon's brother should have said this, but she thrust from her the hateful fear that it might have been said of Erlon and another, and sought to find comfort in his words. They sat together on the chest, he with his arm about her, and now Kristen felt that twas well with her once more, and she was safe. Beside him was the only spot now where she could feel safe and sheltered. At times Erlon spoke much and cheerfully. Then he would be silent for long while he sat caressing her. Without knowing it, Kristen gathered up out of all he said each little thing that could make him fairer and dearer to her, and lessen his blame in all she knew of him that was not good. Erlon's father, Sir Nicholas, had been so old before he had children, he had not patience enough nor strength enough left to rear them up himself. Both the sons had grown up in the house of Sir Bayard Peterson at Hesnes. Erlon had no sisters and no brother save Gunolf. He was one year younger and was a priest at Christ Church in Nidaros. He is dearest to me of all mankind, save only you. Kristen asked if Gunolf were like him, but Erlon laughed and said they were much unlike, both in mind and body. Now Gunolf was in foreign lands studying. He had been away these three years, but had sent letters home twice, the last a year ago, when he thought to go from St. Genevieve's in Paris and make his way to Rome. "'He will be glad, Gunolf, when he comes home and finds me wed,' said Erlon. Then he spoke of the great heritage he had from his father and mother. Kristen saw he scarce knew himself how things stood with him now. She knew somewhat of her father's dealings in land— Erlon had dealt in his the other way about, sold and scattered and wasted and pawned, worst of all in the last years when he had been striving to free him of his paramour, thinking that, this done, his sinful life might in time be forgotten and his kin stand by him once more. He had thought he might some day come to be warden of half the Orkdula county, as his father had been before him. But now do I scarce know what the end will be, said he. Maybe I shall sit at last on a mountain croft like Bjorn Gunnarsson, and bear out the dung on my back as did the thralls of old, because I have no horse. God help you, said Kristen, laughing. Then I must come to you for sure. I trow I know more of farm work and country ways than you. I can scarce think you have borne out the dung basket, said he, laughing too. No, but I have seen how they spread the dung out, and sown corn have I, well nigh every year at home. Twas my father's wont to plough himself the fields nearest the farm, and he let me sow the first piece that I might bring good fortune. The thought sent a pang through her heart. So she said quickly, And a woman you must have to bake, and brew the small beer, and wash your one shirt, and milk and you must hire a cow or two from the rich farmer nearby. Oh, God be thanked that I hear you laugh a little once more, said Erlon, and caught her up so that she lay on his arms like a child. Each of the six nights which passed ere Osmond Bjorgelsen came home, Erlon was in the loft room with Kristen. The last night he seemed as unhappy as she. He said many times they must not be parted from one another a day longer than needful, at last he said, very low, Now should 
things go so ill that I cannot come back hither to Oshlo before winter, and if it so falls out, you need help of friends. Fear not to turn to Sierra Yon here at Gerderud. We are friends from childhood up, and Moon and Bairdson, too, you may safely trust. Kristen could only nod. She knew he spoke of what she had thought on each single day, but Erlon said no more of it. So she too said not, and would not show how heavy of heart she was. On the other nights he had gone from her when the night grew late, but this last evening he begged hard that he might lie and sleep by her an hour. Kristen was fearful, but Erlon said haughtily, "'Be sure that were I found here in your bower, I am well able to answer for myself.' she herself too was fain to keep him by her yet a little while and she had not strength enough to deny him aught but she feared that they might sleep too long so most of the night she sat leaning against the head of the bed dozing a little at times and scarce knowing herself when he caressed her and when she only dreamed it her one hand she held upon his breast where she could feel the beating of his heart beneath and her face was turned to the window that she might see the dawn without at length she had to wake him she threw on some clothes and went out with him upon the balcony he clambered over the railing on the side that faced on to another house near by now he was gone from her sight the corner hid him kristen went in again and crept into her bed and now she quite gave way and fell to weeping for the first time since erlon had made her all his own End of chapter four Book Two, Chapter Five of the Bridal Wreath by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. At Nonnesetter, the days went by as before. Kristen's time was passed between the dormitory and the church, the weaving room, the book hall, and the refectory. The nuns and the convent folk gathered in the pot herbs and the fruits from the herb garden and the orchard. Holy Cross Day came in the autumn with the procession. Then there was the fast before Michaelmas. Kristen wondered. None seemed to mark any change in her. But she had ever been quiet when amongst strangers. And Ingeborg Philippus' daughter, who was by her night and day, was well able to chatter for them both. Thus no one marked that her thoughts were far away from all around her. Erlon's paramour, she said to herself she was erlon's paramour now it seemed now as though she had dreamed it all the eve of st margaret's mass that hour in the barn the nights in her bower at skog either she had dreamed it or else all about her now was a dream but one day she must waken one day it must all come out not for a moment did she think aught else than that she bore Erlon's child within her. But what would happen to her when this came to light, she could not well think. Would she be put into the black hole, or be sent home? She saw dim pictures of her father and mother far away. Then she shut her eyes, dizzy and sick, bowed in fancy beneath the coming storm and tried to harden herself to bear it since she thought it must end by sweeping her forever into arlan's arms the only place where now she felt she had a home thus was there in this strained waiting as much of hope as terror as much of sweetness as of torment she was unhappy but she felt her love for Erlond as it were a flower planted within her, and spite of her unhappiness, it put forth fresher and richer blooms each day. That last night when he had slept by her side, she had felt as a faint and fleeting bliss, that there awaited her a joy and happiness in his arms, such as she had not yet known. She thrilled now at the thought of it, it came to her like warm spicy breaths from sun-heated gardens wayside brat inga had flung the word at her she opened her arms to it and pressed it to her bosom wayside brat was the name they gave to the child begotten in secret in woods or fields 
she felt the sunshine and the smell of the pines in the forest pasture each new creeping tremor each sudden pulse beat in her body she took as a reminder from the unborn babe that now she was come out into new paths and were they never so hard to follow to the end she was sure they must lead to erlon at the last she sat betwixt ingeborg and sister astrid and sewed at the great tapestry of knights and birds amidst leafy tendrils and as she sewed she thought of how she should fly when the time was come and it could no longer be hidden she saw herself walking along the highways clothed like a poor woman all she owned of gold and silver she bore within a bundle in her hand she bought herself shelter on a farm somewhere in a faraway countryside she went as a serving wench bore the water carrier's yoke upon her neck worked in the byres baked and washed and was cursed because she would not tell who was the child's father then erlon came and found her sometimes she dreamed that he came too late she lay snow-white and fair in the poor peasant's bed erlon stooped as he came in at the door he had on the long black cloak he had used to wear when he came to her by night at skog the woman led him forward to where she lay he sank down and took her cold hands his eyes were sad as death dost thou lie here my one delight bent with sorrow he went out with his tender son clasped to his breast in the folds of his cloak nay she thought not in good sooth that it would so fall out she had no mind to die erlon should have no such sorrow but her heart was so heavy it did her good to dream these dreams then for a moment it stood out cold and clear as ice before her the child that was no dream that must be faced she must answer one day for what she had done and it seemed as if her heart stood still with terror but after a little time had gone by she came to think was not so sure after all she was with child she understood not herself why she was not glad it was as though she had lain and wept beneath a warm covering and now must get up in the cold a month went by then two now she was sure that she had been spared this ill hap and empty and chill of soul she felt yet unhappier than before in her heart there dawned a little bitterness toward erlon advent drew near and she had heard neither from or of him she knew not where he was and now she felt she could not bear this fear and doubt it was as though a bond betwixt them had snapped now she was afraid indeed might it not so befall that she should never see him more all she had been safely linked to once she was parted from now and the new tie that bound her to her lover was such a frail one she never thought that he would mean to play her false but there was so much that might happen she knew not how she could go on any longer day after day suffering the tormenting doubt of this time of waiting now and then she thought of her father and mother and sisters she longed for them but as for something she had lost forever and sometimes in church and elsewhere too she would feel a great yearning to take part in all that this meant the communion of mankind with god it had ever been a part of her life now she stood outside with her unconfessed sin she told herself that this cutting adrift from home and kin and church was but for a time erlon must take her by the hand and lead her back into it all when her father had given consent to their love she could go to him as of yore when she and erlon were wed they could confess and do penance for their transgression she began to seek for tokens that other folk were not without sin any more than they she hearkened more to tale-bearing and marked all the little things about her which showed that not even the sisters in the convent here were altogether godly and unworldly these were only little things 
Under Lady Groa's rule, Nona set her to the world was a pattern of what a godly sisterhood should be, zealous in their devotions, diligent, full of care for the poor and sick were the nuns. Their aloofness from the world was not so strict, but that the sisters both had visits from their friends and kin in the parlor, and themselves were given leave to visit these in the town when aught was afoot. But no nun had brought shame upon the house by her life all the years of Lady Groa's rule. But Kristen had now an ear alive to all the little jars within the convent walls, little wranglings and spites and vanities. Save in the nursing of the sick, none of the sisters would help with the rough housework. All were minded to be women of learning or skilled in some craft. The one strove to outdo the other, and the sisters who had no turn for learning or the nobler crafts lost heart and mooned through the hours as though but half awake lady groa herself was wise as well as learned she kept a wakeful eye on her spiritual daughter's way of life and their diligence but she troubled herself little about their soul's health she had been kind and friendly to kristen at all times she seemed to like her better than the other young girls but that was because kristen was apt at books and needlework diligent and sparing of words lady groa never looked for an answer from any of the sisters but on the other hand she was ever glad to speak with men they came and went in her parlour tenant farmers and bailiffs of the convent preaching friars from the bishop stewards of estates on hovedu with whom she was at law she had her hands full with the oversight of the convent's great estates with the keeping of accounts sending out church vestments and taking in books to be copied and sending them away again not the most evil-minded of men could find aught unseemly in lady groa's way of life but she liked only to talk of such things as women seldom know about the prior who dwelt in a house by himself northward of the church seemed to have no more will of his own than the abbess writing reed or her scourge sister potentia looked after most things within the house and she thought most of keeping such order as she had seen in the far-famed german convent where she had passed her novitiate she had been called sigrid ransvald's daughter before but had taken a new name when she took the habit of the order for this was much the use in other lands it was she too who had thought of making the maidens who were at nonocetra as pupils and for a time only wear novices dress sister cecilia bard's daughter was not as the other nuns she went about quietly with downcast eyes answered always gently and humbly was serving made to all did for choice all the roughest work fasted much more than she need as much as lady groa would let her and knelt by the hour in the church after evensong or went thither before matins but one evening after she had been all day at the beck with two lay sisters washing clothes she suddenly burst into a loud sobbing at the supper table she cast herself upon the stone floor crept among the sisters on hands and knees beat her breast and with burning cheeks and streaming tears begged them all to forgive her she was the worst sinner of them all she had been hard as stone with pride all her days pride and not meekness or thankfulness for jesus redeeming death had held her up when she had been tempted in the world she had fled thither not because she loved a man's soul but because she loved her own vain glory she had served her sisters out of pride vanity had she drunken from her water-cup self-righteousness had she spread thick upon her dry bread while the other sisters were drinking their beer and eating their bread slices with butter of all this kristen understood no more than that not even cecilia bard's daughter was truly godly at heart an unlit tallow candle that has hung from the roof and grown foul with soot and cobweb to this she herself likened her unloving chastity lady groa went herself and lifted up the sobbing woman sternly she said that for this disorder cecilia should as a punishment move from the sisters dormitory into the abbess's own bed and lie there till she was free of this fever 
and thereafter sister cecilia shall you sit in my seat for the space of a week we will seek counsel of you in spiritual things and give you such honour for your godly life that you may have your fill of the homage of sinful mankind thus may you judge if it be worth so much striving and thereafter choose whether you will live by the rules as do we others or keep on in exercises that no one demands of you then can you ponder whether you will do for love of god that he may look down upon you in his mercy all those things which you say you have done that we should look up to you and so was it done sister cecilia lay in the abbess's room for fourteen days she had a high fever and lady groa herself tended her when she got up again she had to sit for a week at the side of the abbess in the high seat both in the church and in the convent and all waited on her she wept all the time as though she were being beaten with whips but afterward she was much calmer and happier she lived much as before but she blushed like a bride if any one looked at her whether she was sweeping the floor or going alone to the church none the less did this matter of sister cecilia awake in christen a great longing for peace and atonement with all wherefrom she had come to feel herself cast out she thought of brother edwin and one day she took courage and begged leave of lady groa to go out to the barefoot friars and visit a friend she knew there she marked that lady groa misliked this there was scant friendship between the minorites and the other cloisters in the bishopric and the abbess was no better pleased when she heard who was christen's friend she said this brother edwin was an unstable man of god he was ever wandering about the country and seeking leave to pay begging visits to strange bishoprics the common folk in many places held him to be a holy man but he did not seem to understand that a franciscan's first duty was obedience to those set over him he had shriven freebooters and outlaws baptized their children chanted them to their graves without asking leave yet doubtless he had sinned as much through ignorance as in despite and he had borne meekly the penances laid upon him on account of these things he was born with too much because he was skilled in his handicraft but even in working at this he had fallen out with his craft fellows the master limners of the bishop of bergen would not suffer him to come and work in the bishopric there christen made bold to ask where he had come from this monk with the unnorse name lady groa was in the mood for talking she told how he had been born here in oslo but his father was an englishman richard platemaster who had wedded a farmer's daughter from the skolkheim hundred and had taken up his abode in the town two of edwin's brothers were armourers of good repute in oslo but this eldest of the platemaster's sons had been a restless spirit all his days twas true he had felt a call to the life of the cloister from childhood up he had joined the cistercians at hovedu as soon as he was old enough they sent him to a monastery in france to be trained for his gifts were good while still there he had managed to get leave to pass from the cistercian into the minorite order and at the time the unruly friars began building their church eastward in the fields in despite of the bishop's command brother edwin had been one of the worst and most stiff-necked of them all nay he had half killed with his hammer one of the men the bishop sent to stop the work it was a long time now since any one had spoken so much with christen at one time so when lady groa said that now she might go the young girl bent and kissed the abbess's hand fervently and reverently and as she did so tears came into her eyes and lady groa who saw she was weeping thought it was from sorrow and so she said maybe she might after all let her go out one day to see brother edwin and a few days later she was told some of the convent folk had an errand to the king's palace and they could take her out along with them to the brothers in the fields brother edwin was at home christen had not thought she could have been so glad to see any one except it had been erlon the old man sat and stroked her hand while they talked together in thanks for her coming no he had not been in her part of the country since the night he lay at urengard 
but he had heard she was to wed and he wished her all good fortune then christen begged that he would go over to the church with her they had to go out of the monastery and round to the main door brother edwin durst not take her through the courtyard he seemed altogether exceeding downcast and fearful of doing aught that might offend he had grown very old thought christen and when she had laid upon the altar her offering for the officiant monk who was in the church and afterward asked edwin if he would confess her he grew very frightened he dared not he said he had been strictly forbidden to hear confession ay maybe you have heard of it said he so it was that i felt i could not deny to those poor unfortunates the gifts which god had given me of his free grace but tis true i should have enjoined on them to seek forgiveness in the right place ay ay and you christen you are in duty bound to confess to your own prior nay but this is the thing i cannot confess to the prior of the convent said christen think you it can profit you aught to confess to me what you would hide from your true father confessor said the monk more severely if so be you cannot confess me said christen at least you can let me speak with you and ask your counsel about what lies upon my soul the monk looked about him the church was empty at the moment then he sat himself down on a chest which stood in a corner you must remember that i cannot absolve you but i will counsel you and keep silence as though you had told me in confession christen stood up before him and said it is this i cannot be simon dara's wife therein you know well that i can counsel no otherwise than would your own prior said brother edwin to undutiful children god gives no happiness and your father had looked only to your welfare that you know full well i know not what your counsel will be when you have heard me to the end answered christen thus stands it now with us simon is too good to gnaw the bare branch from which another man has broken the blossom she looked the monk straight in the face but when she met his eyes and marked how the dry wrinkled old forehead changed grew full of sorrow and dismay something seemed to snap within her tears started to her eyes and she would have cast herself upon her knees but edwin stopped her hurriedly nay nay sit here upon the chest by me confess you i cannot he drew aside and made room for her she went on weeping he stroked her hand and said gently mind you that morning christen i first saw you there on the stairway in the hammer church i heard a tale once when i was in foreign lands of a monk who could not believe that god loved all us wretched sinners then came an angel and touched his eyes and he beheld a stone in the bottom of the sea and under the stone there lived a blind white naked creature and he gazed at it until he came to love it for it was so frail and weak when i saw you sitting there so little and so frail within the great stone house methought it was but reason that god should love such as you fair and pure you were and yet did you need a helper and a protector methought i saw the whole church with you in it lying in the hollow of god's hand christen said low we have bound ourselves one to the other with the dearest oaths and i have heard that in the eyes of god such a pact hallows our coming together as much as if our fathers and mothers had given us one to the other the monk answered sadly i see well christen some one who knew it not to the full has spoken to you of the canonical law you could not bind yourself by oath to this man without sinning against your father and mother them had god set over you before you met him and is it not sorrow 
and a shame for his kin too if they learn that he has lured astray the daughter of a man who has borne his shield with honour at all seasons betrothed too to another i hear by your words you deem you have not sinned so greatly yet dare you not confess this thing to your appointed priest and if so be you think you are as good as wed to this man wherefore set you not on your head the linen coif of wedlock but go still with flowing hair amidst the young maids with whom you can have no great fellowship any more for now must the chief of your thoughts be with other things than they have in mind i know not what they have in their minds said Kristen wearily true it is that all my thoughts are with the man i long for were it not for my father and mother i would full gladly bind up my hair this day little would i care if i were called wanton if only i might be called his know you if this man means so to deal toward you that you may be called his with honour some day asked brother edwin then Kristen told of all that had passed between Erlon Nicholson and herself, and while she spoke she seemed not even to call to mind that she had ever doubted the outcome of it all. "'See you not, Brother Edvin,' she began again, "'we could not help ourselves. God help me, if I were to meet him without here, when I go from you, and should he pray me to go with him, I would go.' i wot well too i have seen now there be other folk who have sinned as well as we when i was a girl at home twas past my understanding how aught could win such power over the souls of men that they would forget the fear of sin but so much have i learnt now if the wrongs men do through lust and anger cannot be atoned for then must heaven be an empty place they tell of you even that you too once struck a man in wrath tis true said the monk god's mercy alone have i to thank that i am not called manslayer tis many years agone i was a young man then and methought i could not endure the wrong the bishop would have put upon us poor friars king hawken he was duke then had given us the ground for our house but we were so poor we had to work upon our church ourselves with some few workmen who gave their help more for heavenly reward than for what we could pay them maybe twas sinful pride in us beggar monks to wish to build our church so fair and goodly but we were happy as children in the fields and sang songs of praise while we hewed and built and toiled brother ranulph god rest his soul was master builder he was a right skilful stone-cutter nay i trow the man had been granted skill in all knowledge and all arts by god himself i was a carver of stone panels in those days i had but just finished one of st clara whom the angels were bearing to the church of st francis in the dawn of christmas day a most fair panel it had proved and all of us joyed in it greatly then the hellish miscreants tore down the walls and a stone fell and crushed my panels i struck at a man with my hammer i could not contain me ay now you smile my christen but see you not that tis not well with you now since you would rather hear such tales of other folks frailties than of the life and deeds of good men who might serve you as a pattern tis no easy matter to give you counsel he said when it was time for her to go for were you to do what were most right you would bring sorrow to your father and mother and shame to all your kin but you must see to it that you free yourself from the troth you plighted to simon andresen and then must you wait in patience for the lot god may send you make in your heart what amends you can and let not this erlon tempt you to sin again but pray him lovingly to seek atonement with your kin and with god 
from your sin i cannot free you said brother edmund as they parted but pray for you i will with all my might he laid his thin old hands upon her head and prayed in farewell that god might bless her and give her peace End of chapter 5book 2 chapter 6 of the bridal wreath by sigrid unset this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 6 afterwards there was much in what brother edvin had said to her that kristen could not call to mind but she left him with a mind strangely clear and peaceful hitherto she had striven with a dull secret fear and tried to brave it out telling herself she had not sinned so deeply now she felt edvin had shown her plainly and clearly that she had sinned indeed such and such was her sin and she must take it upon her and try to bear it meekly and well she strove to think of erlon without impatience either because he did not send word of himself or because she must want his caresses she would only be faithful and full of love for him she thought of her father and mother and vowed to herself that she would requite them for all their love once they had got over the sorrow she must bring upon them by breaking with the different folk and well nigh most of all she thought of brother edvin's words of how she must not seek comfort in looking on others faults she felt she grew humble and kind and now she saw at once how easy it was for her to win folks friendship then she was comforted by the thought that after all twas not so hard to come to a good understanding with people and so it seemed to her it surely could not be so hard for her and erlon either until the day she gave her word to erlon she had always striven earnestly to do what was right and good but she had done all at the bidding of others now she felt she had grown from maid to woman twas not only by reason of the fervent secret caresses she had taken and given not only that she had passed from her father's ward and was now under erlon's will for edvin had laid upon her the burden of answering for her own life ay and for erlon's too and she was willing to bear it well and bravely thus she went about among the nuns at yuletide and throughout the goodly rites and the joy and peace of the holy time though she felt herself unworthy yet she took comfort in thinking that the time would soon come when she could set herself right again but the second day of the new year sir andre stara with his wife and all five children came all unlooked for to the convent they were come to keep the last days of yuletide with their friends and kindred in the town and they asked that christen might have leave to be with them in their lodging for a short space for me thought my daughter said lady ongard you would scarce be loath to see a few new faces for a time the different folk dwelt in a goodly house that stood in a dwelling-place near the bishop's palace sir andre's cousin owned it there was a great hall where the serving folk slept and a fine loft room with a fireplace of masonry and three good beds in the one sir andres and lady ongard slept with their youngest son gudmund who was yet a child in another slept christen and their two daughters astrid and sigrid and in the third simon and his elder brother geert andresen all sir andres children were comely simon the least so yet he too was reckoned to be well favoured and christen marked still more than when she was at Differn the year before that both his father and mother and his four brothers and sisters hearkened most to simon and did all he would have them they all loved each other dearly but all agreed without grudging or envy in setting simon foremost amongst them here these good folk lived a merry care-free life they visited the churches and made their offerings every day came together with their friends and drank in their company each evening while the young folk had full leave to play and dance all showed christen the greatest kindness and none seemed to mark how little glad she was 
of an evening when the light had been put out in the loft room and all had sought their beds simon was wont to get up and go to where the maidens lay he would sit a while on the edge of the bed his talk was mostly to his sisters but in the dark he would let his hand rest on christen's bosom while she lay there hot with wrath now that her sense of such things was keener she understood well that there were many things simon was both too proud and too shy to say to her since he saw she had no mind to such talk from him and she felt strangely bitter and angry with him for it seemed to her as though he would fain be a better man than he who had made her his own even though simon knew not there was such a one but one night when they had been dancing at another house astrid and sigrid were left behind there to sleep with a playmate when late at night the different folk had gone to rest in their loft room simon came to christen's bed and climbed up into it he laid himself down above the fur cover christen pulled the coverlid up to her chin and crossed her arms firmly upon her breast in a little simon tried to put his hand upon her bosom she felt the silk embroidery on his wristband and knew he had not taken off any of his clothes you are just as bashful in the dark as in the light christen said simon laughing a little surely you can at least let me have one hand to hold he said and christen gave him the tips of her fingers think you not we should have somewhat to talk of and when it so falls out that we can be alone a little while said he and christen thought now was the time for her to speak so she answered yes but after that she could not utter a word may i come under the fur he begged again tis cold in the room now and he slipped in between the fur coverlid and the woolen blanket she had next to her he bent one arm round the bed head but so that he did not touch her thus they lay a while you are not over easy to woo in faith said simon soon after with a resigned laugh ah, now i pledge you my word i will not so much as kiss you if you would not i should but surely you can speak to me at least christen wet her lips with the tip of her tongue but still she was silent nay if you are not lying there trembling went on simon surely it cannot be that you have aught against me christen she felt she could not lie to simon so she said no but nothing more simon lay a while longer he tried to get her into talk with him but at last he laughed again and said i see well you think i should be content with hearing that you have not against me for to-night and be glad to boot tis a parlous thing so proud as you are yet one kiss you must give me then will i go my way and not plague you any more he took the kiss then sat up and put his feet to the floor christen thought now must she say to him what she had to say but he was away already by his own bed and she heard him undress the day after lady ongard was not so friendly to christen as was her wont the girl saw that the lady must have heard somewhat the night before and that she deemed her son's betrothed had not borne her toward him as she held was fitting late that afternoon simon spoke of a friend's horse he was minded to take and barter for one of his own he asked christen if she would go with him to look at it she was nothing loath and they went out into the town together the weather was fresh and fair it had snowed a little overnight but now the sun was shining and it was freezing so that the snow crackled under their feet christen felt twas good to be out and walk in the cold air and when simon brought out the horse to show her she talked of it with him gaily enough she knew something of horses she had been so much with her father and this was a comely beast a mouse gray stallion with a black stripe down the back and a clipped mane well shapen and lively but something small and slightly built he would scarce hold out under a full armed man for long said christen indeed no nor did i mean him for such a rider said simon he led the horse out into the home field behind the house made it trot and walk mounted to try its paces and would have christen ride it too thus they stayed together a good while out on the snowy field 
at last as christen stood giving the horse bread out of her hand while simon leant with his arm over its back he said all at once methinks christen you and my mother are none too loving one with another i i have not meant to be unloving to your mother said she but i find not much to say to lady ongard nor seems it you find much to say to me either said simon i would not force myself upon you christen before the time comes but things cannot go on as now when i can never come to speech with you i have never been one for much speaking said christen i know it myself and i look not you should think it so great a loss if what is betwixt us two should come to naught you know well what my thoughts are in that matter said simon looking at her christen flushed red as blood and it gave her a pang that she could not mislike the fashion of simon Dari's wooing after a while he said is it arnie gertson christen you feel you cannot forget christen but gazed at him simon went on and his voice was gentle and kind never would i blame you for that you had grown up like brother and sister and scarce a year has gone by but be well assured for your comfort that i have your good at heart christen's face had grown deathly white neither of them spoke again as they went back through the town in the twilight at the end of the street in the blue-green sky rode the new moon's sickle with a bright star within its horn a year thought christen and she could not think when she had last given a thought to arni she grew afraid maybe she was a wanton wicked woman but one year since she had seen him on his bier in the wake-room and had thought she should never be glad again in this life she moaned within herself for terror of her own heart's inconstancy and of the fleeting changefulness of all things erlon could he forget her and yet it seemed to her twould be worse if at any time she should forget him sir andres went with his children to the great yuletide feast at the king's palace christen saw all the pomp and show of the festival they came too into the hall where sat king hawken and the lady isabel bruce king eirik's widow sir andres went forward and did homage to the king while his children and christen stood somewhat behind she thought of all lady oshild had told her she called to mind that the king was near of kin to erlon their father's mothers were sisters and she was erlon's light of love she had no right to stand here least of all amid these good and worthy folk sir andre's children then all at once she saw erlon nicholson he had stepped forward in front of queen isabel and stood with bowed head and with his hand upon his breast while she spoke a few words to him he had on the brown silk clothes that he had worn at the guild feast christen stepped behind sir andre's daughters when some time after lady ongird led her daughters up before the queen christen could not see him anywhere but indeed she dared not lift her eyes from the floor she wondered whether he was standing somewhere in the hall she thought she could feel his eyes upon her but she thought too that all folks looked at her as though they must know she was a liar standing there with the golden garland on her outspread hair he was not in the hall where the young folk were feasted and where they danced when the tables had been taken away this evening it was simon with whom christen must dance along one of the longer walls stood a fixed table and thither the king's men bore ale and mead and wine the whole night long once when simon drew her thither and drank to her she saw erlon standing near behind simon's back he looked at her and christen's hand shook when she took the beaker from simon's hand and set it to her lips erlon whispered vehemently to the man who was with him a tall comely man well on in years and somewhat stout who shook his head impatiently and looked as if he were vexed soon after simon led her back to the dance she knew not how long this dancing lasted the music seemed as though twould never end and each moment was long and evil to her with longing and unrest at last it was over and simon drew her to the drinking board again a friend came forward to speak to him and led him away a few steps to a group of young men 
and erlon stood before her i have so much i would fain say to you he whispered i know not what to say first in jesus name christen what ails you he asked quickly for he saw her face grow white as chalk she could not see him clearly it seemed as though there were running water between their two faces he took a goblet from the table drank from it and handed it to her Kristen felt as though twas all too heavy for her or as though her arm had been cut off at the shoulder do as she would she could not lift the cup to her mouth is it so then that you will drink with your betrothed but not with me asked erlon softly but Kristen dropped the goblet from her hand and sank forward into his arms when she awoke she was lying on a bench with her head in a strange maiden's lap someone was standing by her side striking the palms of her hands and she had water on her face she sat up somewhere in the ring about her she saw erlon's face white and drawn her own body felt weak as though all her bones had melted away and her head seemed as it were large and hollow but somewhere within it shone one clear desperate thought she must speak with erlon she said to simon dare he stood near by twas too hot for me i trow so many tapers are burning here and i am little used to drink so much wine are you well again now asked simon you frighten folks mayhap you would have me take you home now we must wait surely till your father and mother go said Kristen calmly but sit down here i can dance no more she touched the cushion at her side then she held out her other hand to erlon sit you here erlon nicholson i had no time to speak my greetings to an end twas but of late ingeborg said she deemed you had clean forgotten her she saw it was far harder for him to keep calm than for her and it was all she could do to keep back the little tender smile which would gather round her lips you you must bear the maid my thanks for thinking of me still he stammered almost i was afraid she had forgotten me Kristen paused a little she knew not what she should say which might seem to come from the flighty ingeborg and yet might tell erlon her meaning then there welled up in her the bitterest of all these months of helpless waiting and she said dear erlon can you think that we maidens could forget the man who defended our honour so gallantly she saw his face change as though she had struck him and at once she was sorry then simon asked what this was they spoke of Kristen told him of ingeborg's and her adventure in the eikeberg woods she marked that simon liked the tale but little then she begged him to go and ask of lady ongard whether they should not soon go home twas true that she was weary when he was gone she looked at erlon tis strange said he in a low voice you are so quick-witted i had scarce believed it of you think you not i have had to learn to hide and be secret said she gloomily erlon's breath came heavily he was still very pale tis so then he whispered yet did you promise me to turn to my friends if this should come to pass god knows i have thought of you each day in dread that the worst might have befallen i know well what you mean by the worst said Kristen shortly that you have no need to fear to me what seemed the worst was that you would not send me one word of greeting can you not understand that i am living there amongst the nuns like a stranger bird she stopped for she felt that the tears were coming is it therefore you are with the different folk now he asked then such grief came upon her that she could make no answer she saw lady ongard and simon come through the doorway erlon's hand lay upon his knee near her and she could not take it i must have speech with you said he eagerly we have not said a word to one another we should have said come to mass in the maria church at epiphany said Kristen quickly as she rose and went to meet the others 
lady ongard showed herself most loving and careful of christen on the way home and herself helped her to bed with simon she had no talk until the day after then he said how comes it that you bear messages betwixt this erlon and ingeborg philippus daughter tis not fit that you should meddle in the matter if there be hidden dealings between them most like there is naught in it said christen she is but a chatterer methinks too said simon you should have taken warning by what's past and not trusted yourself out in the wild wood paths alone with that magpie but christen reminded him hotly that it was not their fault they had strayed and lost themselves simon said no more the next day the different folk took her back to the convent before they themselves left for home erlon came to evensong in the convent church every evening for a week without christen getting a chance to change a word with him she felt as she thought a hawk must feel sitting chained to its perch with its hood over its eyes every word that had passed between them at their last meeting made her unhappy too it should never have been like that it was of no use to say to herself it had come upon them so suddenly they had hardly known what they said but one afternoon in the twilight there came to the parlor a comely woman who looked like a townsman's wife she asked for christen lavren's daughter and said she was the wife of a mercer and her husband had come from denmark of late with some fine cloaks osmond bjorgelson had a mind to give one to his brother's daughter and the maid was to go with her and choose for herself christen was given leave to go with the woman she thought it was unlike her uncle to wish to give her a costly gift and strange that he should send an unknown woman to fetch her the woman was sparing of her words at first and said little in answer to christen's questions but when they were come down to the town she said of a sudden i will not play you false fair child that you are i will tell you all this thing as it is and you must do as you deem best twas not your uncle who sent me but a man maybe you can guess his name and if you cannot then you shall not come with me i have no husband i make a living for myself and mine by keeping a house of call and selling beer for such a one it boots not to be too much afraid either of sin or of the watchman but i will not lend my house for you to be betrayed inside my doors christen stood still flushing red she was strangely sore and ashamed for erlon's sake the woman said i will go back with you to the convent christen but you must give me somewhat for my trouble the knight promised me a great reward but i too was fair once and i too was betrayed and twould not be amiss if you should name me in your prayers to-night they call me brynhild fluga christen drew a ring off her finger and gave it to the woman tis fairly done of you brynhild but if the man be my kinsman erlon nicholson then have i naught to fear he would have me to make peace betwixt him and my uncle you may set your mind at ease but i thank you none the less that you would have warned me brynhild fluga turned away to hide a smile she led christen by the alleys behind st clement's church northward toward the river here a few small dwelling-places stood by themselves along the river bank they went towards one of them along a path between fences and here erlon came to meet them he looked about him on all sides then took off his cloak wrapped it about christen and pulled the hood over her face what think you of this device he asked quickly and low think you tis a great wrong i do but yet needs must i speak with you it boots but little now i trow to think what is right and what is wrong said christen speak not so begged erlon i bear the blame christen every day and every night have i longed for you he whispered close to her a shudder passed through her as she met his eyes for a moment she felt it as guilt in her when he looked so at her that she had thought of anything but her love for him brunhild fluga had gone on before erlon asked when they were come into the courtyard would you that we should go into the living-room or shall we talk up in the loft-room as you will answered christen and they mounted to the loft-room 
the moment he had barred the door behind them she was in his arms she knew not how long she had lain folded thus in his arms when erlon said now must we say what has to be said my christen i scarce dare let you stay here longer i dare stay here all night long if you would have me stay she whispered erlon pressed his cheek to hers then were i not your friend tis bad enough as it is but you shall not lose your good name for my sake christen did not answer but a soreness stirred within her how could he speak thus he who had lured her here to brynhild fluga's house she knew not why but she felt it was no honest place and he had looked that all should go as it had gone of that she was sure i have thought at times said erlon again that if there be no other way i must bear you off by force into sweden lady ingeborg welcomed me kindly in the autumn and was mindful of our kinship but now do i suffer for my sins i have fled the land before as you know and i would not they should name you as the like of that other take me home with you to hussaby said christen low i cannot bear to be parted from you and to live on among the maids at the convent both your kin and mine would surely hearken to reason and let us come together and be reconciled with them erlon clasped her to him and groaned ah oh, i cannot bring you to us be christen why can you not she asked softly elena came thither in the autumn said he after a moment i cannot move her to leave the place he went on hotly not unless i bear her to the sledge by force and drive away with her and that methought i could not do she has brought both our children home with her tristan felt herself sinking sinking in a voice breaking with fear she said i deemed you were parted from her so deemed i too answered erlon shortly but she must have heard in Oosterdal where she was that i had thoughts of marriage you saw the man with me at the yuletide feast that was my foster father bard paterson of hesnes i went to him when i came from sweden i went to my kinsman haming alson in saltviken too i talked with both about my wish to wed and begged their help elena must have come to hear of it i bade her ask what she would for herself and the children but sigurd her husband they look not that he should live the winter out and then none could deny us if we would live together i lay in the stable with hafdor and ulf and elena lay in the hall in my bed i trow my men had a rare jest to laugh at behind my back christen could not say a word a little after erlon spoke again see you the day we pledge each other at our espousals she must understand that all is over between her and me she has no power over me any more but tis hard for the children i had not seen them for a year they are fair children and little can i do to give them a happy lot twould not have helped them greatly had i been able to wed their mother tears began to roll down over christen's cheeks then erlon said heard you what i said but now that i had talked with my kinsfolk ay they were glad enough that i was minded to wed then i said twas you i would have and none other and they liked not that asked christen at length forlornly see you not said erlon gloomily they could say but one thing they cannot and they will not ride with me to your father until this bargain twixt you and simon andresen is undone again it has made it none the easier for us christen that you have spent your yuletide with the different folk christen gave way altogether and wept noiselessly she had felt ever that there was something of wrong and dishonour in her love and now she knew the fault was hers she shook with the cold when she got up soon after and erlon wrapped her in both the cloaks it was quite dark now without and erlon went with her as far as st clement's church then brynhild brought her the rest of the way to nonaceter end of chapter six
Book Two, Chapter Seven of *The Bridal Wreath* by Sigrid Unset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. A week later, Brynhild Fluga came with the word that the cloak was ready, and Kristen went with her and met Erlon in the loft room as before. When they parted, he gave her a cloak, so that you may have something to show in the convent," said he. It was a blue velvet with red silk inwoven, and Erlon bade her mark that twas of the same hues as the dress she had worn that day in the woods. Kristen wondered it should make her so glad that he said this. She thought he had never given her greater happiness than when he had said these words. But now they could no longer make use of this way of meeting, and it was not easy to find a new one but Erlon came often to the vespers at the convent church, and sometimes Kristen would make herself an errand after the service up to the commoners' houses. And then they would snatch a few words together by stealth up by the fences in the murk of the winter evening. Then Kristen thought of asking leave of Sister Potentia to visit some old crippled women, almsfolk of the convent, who dwelt in a cottage standing in one of the fields. Behind the cottage was an outhouse where the women kept a cow. Kristen offered to tend it for them, and while she was there, Erlon would join her, and she would let him in. She wondered a little to mark that, glad as Erlon was to be with her, it seemed to rankle in his mind that she could devise such a plan. "'Twas no good day for you when you came to know me.' said he one evening now you have learnt to follow the ways of deceit you ought not to blame me answered kristen sadly tis not you i blame said erlon quickly with a shamed look i had not thought myself went on kristen that twould come so easy to me to lie but one can do what one must do nay tis not so at all times said erlon as before Mind you not last winter, when you could not bring yourself to tell your betrothed that you would not have him? To this Kristen answered not, but only stroked his face. She never felt so strongly how dear Erlon was to her, as when he said things like this that made her grieve or wonder. She was glad when she could take upon herself the blame for all that was shameful and wrong in their love. Had she found courage to speak to Simon as she should have done, they might have been a long way now on the road to have all put in order. Erlon had done all he could when he had spoken of their wedding to his kinsman. She said this to herself when the days in the convent grew long and evil. Erlon had wished to make all things right and good again. With little tender smiles she thought of him as he drew a picture of their wedding for her she should ride to church in silks and velvet she should be led to the bridal bed with the high golden crown on her flowing hair your lovely lovely hair he said drawing her plates through his hand yet can it never be the same to you as though i had never been yours said kristen musingly once when he talked thus then he clasped her to him wildly can i call to mind the first time i drank in yuletide think you or the first time I saw the hills at home turn green when winter was gone? I well do I mind the first time you were mine, and each time since. But to have you for my own is like keeping yule and hunting birds on green hillsides forever. Happily she nestled to him, not that she ever thought for a moment it would turn out as Erlon was so sure it would. Kristen felt that before long a day of judgment must come upon them. It could not be that things should go well for them in the end. But she was not so much afraid. She was much more afraid Erlon might have to go northward before it all came to light, and she, be left behind, parted from him. He was over at the castle at Akersness now. Moon and Bardson was posted there, while the bodyguard was at Tunsberg, where the king lay grievously sick. But sometime Erlon must go home and see to his possessions that she was afraid of his going home to Husseby, because Elena sat there awaiting for him. She would not own even to herself, and neither would she own that she was less afraid to be taken in sin along with Erlon than of standing forth alone and telling Simon and her father what was in her heart. Almost she would have wished for punishment to come upon her, and that soon, 
for now she had no other thought than of erlon she longed for him in the day and dreamed of him at night she could not feel remorse but she took comfort in thinking the day would come when she would have to pay dear for all they had snatched by stealth and in the short evening hours she could be with erlon in the almswomen's cowshed she threw herself into his arms with as much passion as if she knew she had paid with her soul already that she might be his but time went on and it seemed as though erlon might have the good fortune he had counted on Kristen never marked that any in the convent mistrusted her ingeborg indeed had found out that she met erlon but Kristen saw the other never dreamed twas aught else than a little passing sport that a maid of good kindred promised in marriage should dare wish to break the bargain her kinsfolk had made such a thought would never come to ingeborg Kristen saw and once more a pang of terror shot through her it might be twas a quite unheard-of thing this she had taken in hand and at this thought she wished again that discovery might come and all be at an end easter came Kristen knew not how the winter had gone every day she had not seen erlon had been long as an evil year and the long evil days had linked themselves together into weeks without end but now it was spring and easter was come she felt was no time since the yuletide feast she begged erlon not to seek her till the holy week was gone by and he yielded to her in this as he did to all her wishes thought Kristen. it was as much her own blame as his that they had sinned together in not keeping the lenten fast but easter she resolved they should keep yet it was misery not to see him maybe he would have to go soon he had said naught of it but she knew that now the king lay dying and mayhap this might bring some turn in erlon's fortunes she thought thus things stood with her when one of the first days after easter word was brought her to go down to the parlour to her betrothed as soon as he came toward her and held out his hand she felt there was somewhat amiss his face was not as it was wont to be his small grey eyes did not laugh they did not smile when he smiled and Kristen could not help seeing it became him well to be a little less merry he looked well too in a kind of travelling dress a long blue close-fitting outer garment men called cotehardie and a brown shoulder cape with a hood which was thrown back now the cold air had given his light brown hair a yet stronger curl they sat and talked for a while simon had been at formal through lent and had gone over to urengard almost daily they were well there ulfeld as well as they dared look that she should be aramborg was at home now she was a fair child and lively twill be over one of these days the year that you were to be here at nonaseter said simon by this the folks at your home will have begun to make ready for our betrothal feast yours and mine Kristen said not, and Simon went on. I said to Laverans, I would ride hither to Oslo and speak to you of this. Kristen looked down and said low, I too would fain speak with you of that matter, Simon. Alone? I saw well myself that we must speak of it alone, answered Simon, and I was about to ask even now that you would pray Lady Groa to let us go together into the garden for a little. Kristen rose quickly and slipped from the room without a sound. Soon after she came back, followed by one of the nuns, with a key. There was a door leading from the parlour out into an herb garden that lay behind the most westerly of the convent buildings. The nun unlocked the door, and they stepped out into a mist so thick they could see but a few paces in among the trees. The nearest stems were coal-black. The moisture stood in beads on every twig and bough a little fresh snow lay melting upon the wet mould but under the bushes some white and yellow lily plants were blooming already and a fresh cool smell rose from the violet leaves simon led her to the nearest bench he sat a little bent forward with his elbows resting upon his knees then he looked up at her with a strange little smile almost i think i know what you would say to me said he there is another man who is more to you than i it is so answered Kristen faintly methinks i know his name too 
said simon in a harder tone it is erlon nicholson of husseby after a while christen asked in a low voice it has come to your ears then simon was a little slow in answering you can scarce think i could be so dull as not to see somewhat when we were together at yule i could say naught then for my father and mother were with us but this it is that has brought me hither alone this time i know not whether it be wise of me to touch upon it but methought we must talk of these things before we are given to one another but so it is now that when i came hither yesterday i met my kinsman master oystein and he spoke of you he said you two had passed across the churchyard of st clement's one evening and with you was a woman they call brynhild fluga i swore a great oath that he must have seen amiss and if you say it is untrue i shall believe your word the priest saw aright answered christen defiantly you forswore yourself simon he sat a little ere he asked know you who this brynhild fluga is christen as she shook her head he said moon and bardson set her up in a house here in the town when he wedded she carries on unlawful dealings in wine and other things you know her asked christen mockingly i was never meant to be a monk or a priest said simon reddening but i can say at least that i have wronged no maid and no man's wedded wife see you not yourself that tis no honourable man's deed to bring you out to go about at night in such company erlon did not draw me on said christen red with anger nor has he promised me aught i set my heart on him without his doing aught to tempt me from the first time i saw him he was dearer to me than all other men simon sat playing with his dagger throwing it from one hand to the other these are strange words to hear from a man's betrothed maiden said he things promise well for us too now christen christen drew a deep breath you would be ill served should you take me for your wife now simon i god almighty knows that so it seems indeed said simon andresen then i dare hope said christen meekly and timidly that you will uphold me so that sir andres and my father may let this bargain about us be undone do you so said simon he was silent for a little god knows whether you rightly understand what you say that do i said christen i know the law is such that none may force a maid to marriage against her will else can she take her plea before the thing i trow tis before the bishop said simon with something of a grim smile true it is i have had no cause to search out how the law stands in such things and i wot well you believe not either that twill come to that pass you know well enough that i will not hold you to your word if your heart is too much set against it but can you not understand tis two years now since our marriage was agreed and you have said no word against it till now when all is ready for the betrothal and the wedding have you thought what it will mean if you come forth now and seek to break the bond christen but you want me not either said christen ay but i do answered simon curtly if you think otherwise you must even think better of it erlon nicholson and i have vowed to each other by our christian faith said she trembling that if we cannot come together in wedlock then neither of us will have wife or husband all our days simon was silent a good while then he said with effort then i know not christen what you meant when you said erlon had neither drawn you on nor promised you aught he has lured you to set yourself against the counsel of all your kin have you thought what kind of husband you will get if you wed a man who took another's wife to be his paramour and now would take for wife another man's betrothed maiden christen gulped down her tears she whispered thickly this you say but to hurt me think you i would wish to hurt you asked simon in a low voice 
"'Tis not as it would have been ha had you,' said Kristen falteringly. "'You were not asked either, Simon. "'Twas your father and my father who made the pact. "'It had been otherwise had you chosen me yourself.' "'Simon stuck his dagger into the bench so that it stood upright. "'A little after he drew it out again and tried to slip it back into its sheath, "'but it would not go down. The point was bent. "'Then he sat passing it from hand to hand as before. "'You know yourself.' said he in a low tone and with a shaking voice you know that you lie if you would have it that i did not you know well enough what i would have spoken of with you many times when you met me so that i had not been a man had i been able to say it after that not if they had tried to drag it out of me with red-hot pincers first i thought twas yonder dead lad i thought i must leave you in peace a while you knew me not i deemed twould have been a wrong to trouble you so soon after now i see you did not need so long a time to forget now 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 no said Kristen quietly i know it simon now i cannot look that you should be my friend any longer friend simon gave a short strange laugh <laughs> do you need my friendship now then Kristen grew red you are a man said she softly and old enough now you can choose yourself whom you will wed simon looked at her sharply then he laughed as before <laughs> i understand you would have me say tis i who i, I am to take the blame for the breaking of our bond if so be that your mind is fixed if you have the will and the boldness to try to carry through your purpose then i will do it he said low at home with all my own folks and before all your kin save one to your father you must tell the truth even as it is if you would have it so i will bear your message to him and spare you in giving it in so far as i can but Lavrens Bjorgelson shall know that never with my will would I go back from one word that I have spoken to him. Kristen clutched the edge of the bench with both hands. This was harder for her to bear than all else that Simon Dara had said. Pale and fearful, she stole a glance at him. Simon rose. Now must we go in, said he. Methinks we are nigh frozen, both of us and the sister is sitting waiting with the key. I will give you a week to think upon the matter. I have business in the town here. I shall come hither and speak with you when I am ready to go, but you will scarce care to see aught of me meanwhile. End of chapter 7